можно как раз передать, это не проблема. Да. Ну, а мне кажется, ну, о чем мы думаем? Ну, хотите, я... Я предлагаю красиво с петличками. А это...
Технологии меняют мир, и лаборатория Касперского готова к этим переменам. Наша экосистема решений для защиты бизнеса – это слаженный оркестр продуктов и технологий. Они постоянно обогащаются лучшей в мире аналитикой об угрозах и дополняют друг друга. С ними вы сохраните устойчивость бизнеса и стабильность ваших процессов. Лаборатория Касперского обеспечит защиту вашей компании в любых условиях. Касперский симфонии. Кибербезопасность в виртуозном исполнении. Доброе утро, уважаемые участники 12-го российского форума по управлению интернетом. Мы рады приветствовать вас из студии делового пространства РБК. Мы — это ведущая церемония открытия. Мой коллега Вадим Глущенко, Доброе утро. директор Центра глобальной IT-кооперации, и я, Андрей Воробьев, директор Координационного центра национальных доменов РУ и РФ. Ну, как обычно, несколько слов об истории форума. Это уже 12-й по счету форум. Мы пропустили... Форум только в 2020 году, когда была пандемия, поэтому он не состоялся. А вот второй раз он уже проходит в гибридном формате, когда спикеры, модераторы, партнеры конференции приезжают в нашу телестудию, а, соответственно, участники подключаются к мероприятию удаленно. Ну, немножко про то, как проходил первый форум по управлению интернетом. Было это в 2010 году, когда Российской Федерации был делегирован кириллический домен РФ, и, собственно, этому событию было приурочено проведение первого российского форума по управлению интернетом. Тогда же впервые был вручен орден в Вертуте Интернете. Это такая специализированная награда Координационного центра, которая вручается специалистам как раз в области интернет-гавенанс, в области управления интернетом, в области того процесса, который постоянно идет с 2005 года, с, даже с 2003 года, когда впервые об этом начали говорить на, мировой, на мировых площадках и подключились представители не только технического сообщества, но и представители национальных правительств и международных организаций, в частности ООН. Я думаю, что немножко еще про вот эту вот историю, что есть региональные форумы, глобальный форум, мы поговорим чуть позже, и Вадим наверняка об этом расскажет, как специалист, как раз уже в этой области. А, остановлюсь на таких ключевых, может быть, вехах. В 2012 году на третьем российском форуме а, он был посвящен теме информационной безопасности. И вот тогда а, был такой девиз, что регулирование — это в первую очередь стандарты интернета и обязанность всех следовать этим стандартам. Ну, в общем-то, тезис не теряет своей актуальности. А, в 2014 году Центральной темой форума стало обсуждение мнографии. Uh, uh, Moscow, but we went to Nepalis and uh, uh, the students and the um, uh, those who study at uh, Kazan universities and colleges welcomed the guests in 2018. The forum took place in St. Petersburg and it was focusing on cyber security. Годе проведения форума в 2019 тогда РИФ 
2019, uh, that was actually the last year when we held the forum in the old normal, so to say. This is when uh, RIGF uh, date coincided with the uh, national uh, domain anniversary, and the first deputy of the office of the Russian president, Sergei Kiryenko, read the presidential address to the forum. Last year, the forum was attended by the Minister of Digital Development, and he was awarding state awards to various participants of the market. For the first time in history, the Deputy Prime Minister of the Russian Federation, who uh, uh, supervises over the field for the first time, will open our forum. Please welcome. Uh, the Deputy uh, Prime Minister of the Russian Federation, Dmitry Chernyshenko. Dear colleagues, dear friends, welcome uh, everyone who is attending the 12th Russian Internet Governance Forum. This is an important annual event for the whole international Internet community, and the Russian Forum uh, which is a component of the global international, uh, internet governance um, uh, forum, uh, discusses uh, modern uh, trends, looks for solutions, and uh, is a wonderful place to uh, for cooperation to organize cooperation. Um, in order to quickly address the uh, challenges. According to the International Telecommunications Union data, there are more than 5 billion people around the world who use the Internet, which is about two-thirds of the total population of the world. I'm sure that the accessibility uh, of the Internet is one of the key uh, success factors to the growth of the national economies, and Russia is in the sixth place among uh, the world nations in terms of this metric. Right now, there are about 130 million Internet users in the country, which is roughly 90 percent of all of the Russian population. We continue focusing on um, addressing the digital divide. Uh, we ensure uh, that uh, various remote areas of the country are connected to the internet. About 76,000 very socially important facilities all have access to the internet. The Russian segment uh, of the internet is uh, developing at uh, a great pace. Last year, it contributed three nine point uh, half uh, trillion rubles to the national community uh, the national budget. We constantly monitor the needs of the IT community. We provide support measures to the community, and of course, we, uh, just like everybody else, faces uh, face uh, uh, cyber threats. So it's very important also to maintain high level of cyber security at the government facilities and uh, to ensure the protection of the personal data and to ensure the. Uh, 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 stability of the network. We should also counter the distribution of destabilizing content uh, through improvement of regulation, among other measures. Uh, there are no doubts that the Internet is a truly international network, and uh, it must be maintained through joint forces. And we must create new international uh, norms of regulating responsible behavior for all stakeholders, and Russia is uh, willing to uh, cooperate on building the uh, space of trust in the Internet. We are willing and ready to be a responsible partner. This year, the forum assembled key players of the Internet community from around the world and from various international organizations, and I'm sure that together we will be able to find solutions to the most urgent issues and to build a new vector for the dialogue and for the cooperation. I wish you all a very productive uh, forum. Dear colleagues, it's my great pleasure to give the floor to another uh, guest of this forum, Tatiana Matveeva, head of the Department of the Development of Information Communication Technologies and Communication Infrastructure from the Presidential Office. Uh, Tatiana will be joining us from her office.
Уважаемые коллеги, добрый день. Colleagues, uh, good morning and welcome to the annual Russian Internet Governance Forum. This year, the forum is taking place in the times of unprecedented challenge. Uh, uh, and uh, this challenge is um, uh, quite international in nature, despite massive cyber attacks and a lot of pressure put on Russia, the domestic IT industry proved to be a highly skilled and qualified force. Uh, the companies mobilized their capabilities and build up their potential quite quickly. Uh, the technological sovereignty is being reinforced. Uh, the new partnerships have been established, new products have been put to the market, and whole stacks of uh, domestic solutions. Uh, this happens because uh, national uh, measures are provided to the sector in terms of input replacement. Around the world, there is now a growing understanding for the need to establish universal rules of the game. And in this context, we keep monitoring uh, the development of the initiative of the UN Secretary General on the global uh, digital compact uh, that could become the first international body of uh, rules uh, for responsible behavior of all internet stakeholders. We hope that today's forum will contribute to the development of such a global digital compact and into the development of the into the development of the internet national regulation of the internet space. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Matveeva. I'm sure that our first plenary session uh, that is dedicated to the Global Digital Compact will draw a lot of interest from the participants. More than 500 people uh, have already registered uh, for the uh, Russian Internet Governance Forum. Actually, uh, RIGF is one of the oldest uh, conferences of its kind, and uh, it enjoys very high reputation in the international domain. Uh, for the first time, the RIGF uh, was organized back in 2010, and since that time, the number of internet users has grown considerably around the world from 2 billion to 4.5 billion. 60% uh, of the global population today uh, has daily access to the internet. And in Russia, uh, if at the end of 2010 we had 60 million users, today, uh, the monthly audience uh, has surpassed 100 million users, which is more than 80% of the country's population. Out of them, 90% uh, use the internet daily. And in the age group of 12 to 24, this indicator is reaching 95%. So all the topics that uh, were included into the agenda of the forum become more and more relevant as years go by. I have already said in the beginning that the national forum is part of the international process of internet governance and as to how it's developing and what our uh, colleagues from the uh, international competence centers play in the process. Well, uh, let's hear about it from Vadi, my colleague. Yes, indeed, uh, our center of competencies of uh, global internet uh, cooperation uh, for the first time has become a partner to the RIGF. For us, it's a great honor, and as Andre has already mentioned, the Russian Internet Governance Forum is the national format, the national initiative of the United Nations IGF, Internet Governance Forum, which is a global site which assembles experts from around the world on an annual basis. Last year, uh, they met in um, uh, Poland. Uh, this year, there will be a meeting in Addis Ababa in the end of November. And this is indeed a unique conference, because this is where people discuss the uh, uh, World Wide Web uh, governance with participation not only of the governments, per se, but also with the representatives of the uh, academia, uh, of the uh, uh, civil sector, uh, grassroots organizations, uh, the private sector, tech companies. And as uh, Ms. Matveeva has just said, the key topic of uh, 
uh, this uh, Russian forum will be the uh, Global Digital uh, Compact. Uh, very briefly, Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, uh, proposed this initiative in his uh, report, Our Common Agenda, and it uh, is basically a proposal to set up a, uh, a universal body of rules for behavior in the internet for all stakeholders, uh, the stakeholders that I have just identified. And uh, we have a unique opportunity to contribute to the drafting of this international treaty, of this international compact. So all matters related to the uh, this uh, subject matter, the Global Digital Compact, will be uh, uh, discussed uh, during the next two days of the forum. Uh, we will be, I'm sure, coming to this matter uh, in all of the sessions of the forum. Besides, there is also the Youth Internet Governance Forum, uh, which is a relatively new format for IGF, while in the international practice has been uh, existing since 2011. Yes, uh, indeed, uh, there are about 35, if I'm not mistaken, uh, national and regional internet governance forums forums with uh, an integrated youth track in them. And last year, for the first time, we organized the first forum of, of this uh, kind at Skoltek. And uh, this year, uh, we, were, uh, we have already organized the second youth IGF. Uh, and uh, we had even more participants than the first time around. Uh, the young people are very much interested in digital economy, e-commerce, I mean, all, all kinds of all aspects of the internet um, society internet economy, and we are doing our best to make sure that these uh, forums, these discussions uh, do not uh, resemble lectures, that these people, uh, young people, uh, usually attend at the universities and colleges. I think that our audience enjoys uh, their participation, their engagement, and we plan to proceed with this initiative. We are going to host many more youth forums in the future. In any case, at the global level, there is a youth track every year. And to go back to the uh, agenda of uh, RIGF today, Antonio Guterres, in his report that I have already uh, named, uh, said that we're all interested uh, to have an open, uh, free, and secure digital future for all. And this is the aim of the future uh, global digital compact. And as he emphasized uh, later on, it's difficult to argue that the digital environment, in addition to uh, its advantages, uh, is prone with certain threats um, that uh, may, under certain circumstances, outweigh the advantages. That's why IGF is called to ensure the security of the online sphere. Once again, I welcome all participants of the forum, and I ask everyone to take an active part in the discussion of this subject matter. Thank you very much. Uh, as to the youth track, there will be a separate session dedicated to the youth track, and that's where we will be discussing the output of the uh, last two youth forums. And we will be also presenting another initiative, the summer school for young specialists on matters of internet governance. But this uh, is the agenda for the second day of the forum. I also wanted to mention that in 20. 19. Russia also welcomed the Asia-Pacific Regional Forum in addition to the national uh, fora uh, and the global uh, fora. There is this intermediate, uh, so to say, form uh, of uh, regional fora. We assembled a record number of participants at the Far Eastern Russian University in Vladivostok and the representative of the uh, um, Secretariat of the UN Internet Governance Forum, Chenkita Masango attended the uh, uh, Far Eastern uh, Forum. And now let's give the floor to Chenkita Masango uh, and let's listen to his address. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the IGF Secretariat, thank you for inviting me to the 2022 edition of your national IGF. I have in the past had the opportunity to join in person your meetings. And I do not doubt that this one will follow the others as being a well-organized process. 
The work of the IGF initiatives has never been more important as now due to the growing use of the internet in everyday lives and the opportunities and challenges it brings to our societies and economies. For example, during the COVID-19 pandemic, research shows that internet penetration grew significantly yet unevenly amongst developed and developing countries. More intensive use of digital services due to mandatory confinement, increased numbers of data breaches, cyber attacks, online frauds, hate speech, and disinformation channeled online. All this exasperated the already existing inequalities. The good news is that more awareness has been raised on the importance of bringing access to all under equal terms, as well as on the necessity to step up efforts to bring skills to those in need and work collaboratively to advance and maintain an online space that is accessible, affordable, safe, secure, resilient, and sustainable. The internet has proven time and time again its potential to contribute to advancing sustainable development around the world. Whether and how we take advantage of this potential depends on all of us. Expanding internet access, empowering people with digital skills, ensuring opportunities in the digital economy are available to everyone, and building trust in the use of technology are just a few examples of actions in this regard. And IGF initiatives all over the world have an important role to play in fostering dialogue and cooperation towards defining and implementing policies and initiatives to guide such actions. The decentralized nature of the internet dictates the need for multi-stakeholder, open, inclusive, and transparent processes to govern it effectively. And this is what the IGF stands for. Multi-stakeholder organizing teams from over 155 countries and regions work hard on ensuring the discussions for the internet we want are action and result oriented. And consequently, that the decisions are guided by these discussions. Today, you are discussing important topics. From the value system proposed through the Secretary General's Global Digital Compact to regulation and responsibilities for combating harmful content and benefiting from safe artificial intelligence. Some of these topics will also be addressed at the 17th annual IGF meeting, which is scheduled to be hosted by the government of Ethiopia in Addis Ababa from 28th November until the 2nd of December this year. Thousands of stakeholders are expected to gather at the forum to exchange knowledge, experience, and ideas in over 300 different sessions nested under the main meetings theme resilient internet for a shared, sustainable, and common future. I hope that many of you will join us for the 17th IGF, on-site or online. Dear colleagues, I close my remarks by congratulating your Secretariat and the Multi-Stakeholder Organizing Committee for organizing this meeting, and I wish you successful deliberations. Thank you very much, Chen Getai. I have to say that we have long been participating in the global uh, internet governance forums, the uh, presidential office, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the um, Ministry of Digital Technologies. Uh, of course, they contribute a lot to these discussions on the government level, but also there is the NGO sector. And if any of the participants of the RIGF would like to be represented at the global level to um, 
discuss, uh, to take part in the discussions um, at the global level. Of course, it's too late now to submit your presentations because uh, the process of organizing the global IGF starts at the start of the year. And uh, again, it's a bit too late, but still uh, there is an opportunity uh, to join the discussions uh, that have already been planned. We are open and we are accumulating, we're assembling and accumulating and processing all expert proposals and then uh, we will be able to connect you with the organized various sessions or if it's a session that uh, we proposed and uh, we will be moderating, we will be able to um, introduce you into that particular uh, session. Anyway, please get in touch with us. We also hope that Alexander Hinstein will be joining us. Uh, Alexander uh, is uh, the uh, head uh, of the uh, State Democratic Committee on Information Policy, but Alexander Hinstein is uh, on uh, um, away on business in the Donetsk uh, region. Logistics is very difficult these days, as you will appreciate it, and he will not be able to join us personally, but we want to thank him for participating in our uh, previous forum for the past two years. He was the head of the delegation of uh, Russian uh, Parliament at the Global IGF, starting from 2018. Well, back in 2018, Mr. Levin, when he was the head of this uh, special uh, Parliament Committee. He was an active participant in this work, and our parliamentarians actually uh, suggested reviewing the mandate of the IGF itself to uh, make it not just a site for discussions and exchange of ideas, but uh, to um, make it a decision-making body uh, that would produce uh, perhaps some consultative decisions, but, or maybe even something uh, more than that, to go beyond than that. But the current mandate uh, expires in 2025, and I'm sure that there will be many more discussions about its future ahead of us. But uh, uh, our uh, proposals, the proposals of the Russian parliament have already been heard in last year, although there were no official decisions taken by the IGF. Still, there is a trend when uh, the um, forum would adopt a kind of a resolution identifying its main outputs uh, for future guidance. What else can I add? Well, um, to go back to the involvement of the young people into this work in Katowice and Poland last year, again, the proposals of the Youth Forum uh, were heard out at the plenary session of the IGF. Yes, indeed, our center organized two workshops, two sessions at the IGF uh, in Katowice, and one of them was uh, uh, for the youth track. Uh, we talked about how the young people are involved in internet governance processes. And that's why we presented our unique initiative to establish an institute of, uh, or rather institution of a youth internet ombudsman. Uh, an ombudsman is not just one person, it's a team of people, young people, who are uh, focusing on the protection of the rights of the, the youth and the children in the digital environment. And this initiative was introduced at Katowice, at the IGF, and uh, it was supported by the uh, attendees of that session and also by the general audience uh, because uh, it, it made it into the final document of the forum, the Katowice message. On the Katowice address. I hope that uh, the initiative will not be neglected. We will be reminding uh, the IGF uh, audience again this year because, uh, again, there will be a youth track there. Uh, as well, uh, in our country, that work uh, is already producing results. Uh, for instance, uh, there are lectures given on uh, cyberbullying uh, or countering destructive content so that people will not be drawn into the so-called information wells. There are so many problems today online, especially for children, teenagers, and so I'm sure that the Digital Youth Ombudsman uh, does an important uh, work. Uh, again, a special presentation will be made about this uh, tomorrow at the Youth Session. 
Russian. Yes, uh, we are giving you, uh, you know, insights into what's uh, coming next uh, in uh, our forum's agenda. Uh, we are about to close our um, uh, forum opening session, but uh, we first need to hear out from the business because business is an important stakeholder. Um, different companies represented business at the RIGF. Uh, we had people from the telecom companies, people responsible for the critical internet infrastructure. And this year, we invited to this forum opening Olga Uskova. Olga Uskova is a well-known uh, Russian personality in the field of artificial intelligence. And bios of all our speakers can be found at the forum's website. But uh, to introduce Olga, I need to say uh, that she uh, uh, is it tops the list of Russian women in robotics, according to Forbes for 2021, um, and uh, Olga contributed a lot into such projects as uh, 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 into such systems as, as introducing uh, artificial intelligence and agriculture, uh, or recently the group of companies initiated a special uh, a project to help the railway uh, drivers uh, navigate the tracks better using artificial intelligence. Olga? Uh, dear friends, in the digital world, cognitive pilot uh, and the whole team, we are operating in the niche of uh, artificial brains. We produce artificial intelligence for critically important technologies, for, for instance, uh, AI in uh, transport. We have been in uh, this job for many years. We build factories. Uh, we have operations around the world. And in the last five years, when the products started to be used by the uh, people, when uh, the products reached a certain technological level, uh, we uh, began to get invitations to different uh, roundtables and uh, forums, and people keep asking, uh, well, Olga, when will the robots take over the world? We are afraid that one day the artificial intelligence will revolt against the uh, natural uh, intelligence and silicon will take over biology. So at all these conferences and fora, I kept uh, telling people that today AI is our assistant. I think that the biggest threat today comes from biological intelligence rather than artificial intelligence. 2022 has been a very challenging year. And there have been so many troubles around the world uh, the whole world today is engaged in a pretty aggressive dialogue. And uh, this is yet another proof that uh, we need to deal with our biology first. We need to uh, first learn how to engage in constructive dialogue between ourselves uh, before we start discussing uh, potential problems uh, that perhaps might emerge from technology. We need to go back to ethics and moral and to the human values. We need to be able to solve all people's uh, problems through constructive negotiations. I welcome all the participants of the forum. I'm sure today we will learn about many new technologies and solutions and the role of uh, uh, technologies in Russia and in other countries. And I wish uh, to all of us that uh, we communicate uh, in a constructive and productive manner so that we can make progress to the, towards uh, well-being in the spirit of uh, uh, friendship and love.
форуме. Ольга will make another appearance in our forum. Uh, thank you very much, Olga. But now I think it's time that we give the floor to the moderator and the speakers of our panel discussion. Uh, during the opening ceremony, you have already learned that the first session is dedicated to the global digital companies. There are a chance for fair play. We will be starting in a couple of minutes. And uh, uh, first, uh, let's watch uh, a quick video from cctld.ru on the uh, safe, trusted space uh, for the Russian entrepreneurs. In a few minutes, we will be meeting the speakers of the first section of the day. Thank you.
Hello everyone, dear colleagues, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are at the moment. Thank you to all of my colleagues who were able to join me this morning in Moscow. And I also hope that our international uh, speakers have already managed uh, to uh, get the translation going. And um, the session will be in Russian with simultaneous translation into English. Uh, as you have already learned from the opening session, the uh, topic of this section, the first section of the day, is the global digital compact. Let me do the introductions of the speakers sitting next to me. Please welcome Ulyan Narfazudiv, Dean of uh, First Deputy, uh, General Director of Dialogue, uh, Vadim Glushenko, Director of the Center for Global IT Cooperation. We also have colleagues from uh, the High School of Economics, Andrei Kashanin, Deputy Head of the Institute of State Municipal Administration, and also Senior program expert from the office of the Secretary General's Envoy for Technology, uh, Yubin Chan, uh, who will uh, be joining us from Bucharest. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us from there. And also we expect you have Roberto Zambrana, the coordinator of the ISOC Bolivian chapter. And another a guest of today will be Harion uh, Banana, Andrea Mamunipiona from ERTL Madagascar. Well, I believe I did all of the introductions and I didn't miss anyone. Colleagues, first of all, I would like to give the floor to our colleagues from the United Nations because, the uh, again, the subject matter of this discussion is the Global Digital Compact. The UN Secretary General a year ago, uh, almost to the day during the week of the General Assembly, um, we released uh, a a report uh, which is called our common agenda and in his report the secretary general called upon the countries to enter into a global compact um, uh, which would uh, agree the rules of the uh, internet development. It's not the first document that the Secretary uh, General produces on the topic. Back in 2020, there was a uh, a roadmap that the Secretary General issued and uh, the envoy, the very position of the uh, Secretary General's Envoy for Technology uh, was established when the roadmap was released. Uh, Yubin Chen, our dear friend and the speaker, uh, today is from the office of uh, the Envoy for Technology. And could you please describe the process of uh, the Global Digital Compact? What are the deadlines? Uh, what is the process? Uh, what are your expectations, perhaps, of this very important international initiative? The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Roman, and um, thank you again, the organizers, for inviting my office to be here today. As Roman had mentioned, I'm actually joining you from the International Telecommunications Union's Plenipotentiary Conference in Bucharest. So um, it's a very exciting time, I think, for the international community to really consider what the future of the internet, what digital cooperation looks like. And as part of that discussion, this is why, as Roman has indicated, the Secretary General has proposed a global digital compact. So this was suggested in his Our Common Agenda report last year, where he lays out the key challenges for the global future, of which the online space is clearly one of them. Originally, the intention was to be for the Global Digital Compact to be agreed at the Summit of the Future for next September 2023. But the member states of the United Nations have just agreed that the Summit of the Future will now be held in September of 2024. So that gives us a little bit more time for the Global Digital Compact because the compact itself will be adopted at the Summit of the Future. So now we actually technically have two years to prepare for the Global Digital Compact. We see this as an opportunity to really bring the international community together to agree on the principles for the digital future that we want. And so this has to be an understanding that's not just among governments, but also among the private sector, civil society, academia, and stakeholders that are collectively part of that discussion around 
what kind of digital future that we, the citizens of the world need to have. And we see this as an open, free and secure internet, but also one that is inclusive, equitable, and for all people everywhere. And this is where I think the question that Roman asked, what are our expectations for the process and the compact are very important because we want this to not just be about the conventional issues, the issues that are being discussed here and the same players that are always here at the United Nations. We want diversity of voices, differences of opinion, not the usual traditional big players that technology companies that tend to be, for instance, from certain parts of the world or certain global institutions, but really having a diversity of private sector views, small and medium enterprises, civil society from developing countries, the coders, the innovators, the researchers that are present in developing countries and the global south. So this is a particular priority for the Office of the Tech Envoy. And you might know that the Secretary General actually has just appointed a new technology envoy, Mr. Amandi Singh Gill from India. And for the Secretary General's envoy, this point about diversity and representation and inclusion of the global south is particularly a priority. And this is where we look to different voices, including the Russian IGF, for instance, to contribute this difference of perspective so that the Global Digital Compact is truly global in nature and represents what we as a collective global community aspire to in terms of the internet. In terms of process, we are also quite determined that this needs to be a multi-stakeholder approach. So while even though the compact itself will be intergovernmentally negotiated and agreed by the governments, there needs to be engagements of different parts of the society. So the private sector, civil society, the internet governance forum, for instance, of which I believe Roman is a multi-advisory group member, is will play an important role. So for instance, these types of convenings the international processes of which the national IGS, the Russian IGF is an important part is part of bringing together all these different stakeholders to contribute their voices and their perspectives to the global digital contact. So this is where we see the process headed for the UN. I'm happy to talk about any particular areas or issues that might um, the audience might have questions on, but just also to highlight that we at the Office of the Tech Envoy have launched a public call for inputs where we really want to hear for anyone everywhere. And you can submit and make a contribution to the United Nations on what you want to see in the Global Digital Compact. So I encourage, for instance, the Russian IGF to think about contributing their views and perspectives to the United Nations through this public platform as well, and all stakeholders present here today to also think about what you might want to contribute. So I'll stop there and I look forward to more engagement. Now, this is very interesting, and I'm sure our uh, speakers uh, from Russia and from other uh, locations uh, will be sharing their ideas uh, or uh, initiatives that uh, they plan to uh, submit as part of this multi-stakeholder uh, process. So thank you very much, Yupin. Uh, if you can stay with us for another hour or so um, to answer um, potential questions or maybe to give us feedback um, as to what uh, other speakers are going to say during the section, we would be very grateful to you. Um, and now uh, let's turn to one of the uh, most active uh, Russian uh, NGOs in the area. Uh, let's hear from them uh, which uh, topics do you find to be most relevant for the development of the international community? Well, uh, I guess you will be starting with the protection of uh, user rights. Well, hello. And uh, good afternoon. It's a wonderful day in Moscow today. The weather is great. And thank you very much for organizing this forum. Uh, we, as the uh, uh, Center for Global IT uh, Cooperation, we uh, see ourselves as a platform where the regulators, where the governments can meet uh, regular users. It turns out that very often digital platforms conduct very non-transparent activities, uh, unpredictable activities. It's very difficult to negotiate in uh, the operations of major digital platforms. Uh, so we try to assist the regular users in understanding the rules of the game, so to say. Well, uh, let's start with, say, targeted ads. Uh, last week in Ireland, uh, Instagram was uh, fined uh, for hundred million dollars uh, for processing the data of minors.
years. Uh, the trial took about two years, and uh, the, uh, the court uh, ruled that the rules of uh, the Instagram violated the rights of children. In May this year, Twitter was also fined $150 million for um, a similar violation when they misprocessed, so to say, the personal data of the users uh, to target certain ads to them. Um, for two years, it, it took the court two years to take the decision. And uh, as you have already learned, the, uh, that decision was a major, major fine. What's important is not the fine, actually, but that this network, which has 140 million users, now needs to inform the users that the data is collected uh, for the purposes of uh, commercial use. In August this year, another important case uh, was happening to Oracle. Uh, the activists in the United States sued Oracle for collection and processing of 5 billion global internet users' data. So basically, we are talking about the data of every single person who is using today the internet and the world, what they are collecting, what are they doing with the data, how they are storing the data was not clear, was not transparent. And um, the United States is one of the more legally advanced uh, countries in terms of regulation of digital platforms. But even there, there is no common uh, regulation and the activists had to appeal to local courts, to local uh, regulation, local acts. Um, so, it, I mean, it, uh, you see that there is a great need uh, for regulation uh, both on the domestic and on the international levels. Another aspect that um, gives us a lot of trouble is the uh, various application uh, stores. Uh, Apple Store yesterday um, removed uh, VK, Vkontakte uh, applications, all of them, uh, the messenger, the, the everything. Vkontakte today has about 100 million users. This is the monthly audience. And it's not just uh, uh, residents of Russia, but also the residents of the CIS countries. App Store, from the beginning of the year, removed 7,000 applications from the Russian segment, 218 million downloads. Compared to uh, global statistics, this is 3%. Uh, 3% is not a negligible number. And what is being removed is, uh, you know, regular user applications, like banks, banks' applications that provide user services, different loyalty uh, programs were removed uh, last week. Uh, to GIS and Sberzvuk were removed, uh, a music app and a maps app, and they are you know, regular user apps. And we are concerned that laymen are not protected from such an action of the uh, global platforms. Thirdly, which is also quite relevant these days, is the dissemination of uh, uh, forged and fake information. A year ago, we signed a memorandum with major uh, information sites on countering the dissemination of uh, fake information. It's been a year, and we can um, and we can now uh, state that uh, it's. Uh, it's very relevant these days. We set up a group of fact checkers who are following the news and who are labeling a fake news, fake information as destructive or fake. And we are also uh, working with the uh, news providers uh, uh, on the basis of proof and evidence. Uh, it's not like we are, you know, labeling um, different pieces of information out of the blue, but we provide our evidence uh, for uh, the labels. 
one of the things that was uh, uh, spreading in uh, the West in the uh, news media and social media where you see Russian soldiers holding the uh, Mosin uh, rifle back uh, well this uh, rifle was uh, um, was um, uh, introduced into the Russian army back in the end of the 19th century. Uh, the uh, photograph was published at the Fontanka website. It was made uh, in St. Petersburg uh, uh, during the preparation to the uh, Victory Day parade, and the photograph was now used uh, as a fake to say that this, these are the uh, armaments that the uh, Russian uh, soldiers are using in the present conflict. Uh, we understand that the goal of uh, such uh, information attacks is uh, to destabilize the uh, situation and based on our practice of countering fake news based on the practice of other countries, we believe that the global digital compact should state quite clearly and unambiguously the rights of regular users. It's not enough to protect the rights of digital platforms whose activities these days are not clear, are not transparent, are not easy to understand understand and regular users have little um, ways, uh, li little means of recourse. Uh, so our objective is to protect the regular user. Thank you very much. So uh, on the one hand, we have the um, tech giants, the digital giants, we have the users, we have the governments, we have the civil society. Um, dialogue, your NGO. Uh, will you be uh, drafting some specific proposals? Well, of course, we, we can do it. We can do it. You still have two years. That's right. Um, yes, we are ready to draft our proposals on what can be included into this uh, compact in terms of protecting user rights and uh, countering fake news. We already have experience on which we can base our proposals. The other matter is whether our proposals will actually be he heeded to. We understand that there is huge economy backing the uh, di digital giants uh, and the, the needs of the global economy often dominates over the needs and rights of the regular users. Uh, this imbalances uh, exist, and we keep insisting that in uh, uh, diplomacy uh, as well, the focus should be shifting to digital diplomacy. One of the more uh, constructive tracks of the digital uh, diplomacy should be the regulation of the digital platforms operations with a focus on the protection of the rights of the user and the voice of everyone should be heard and the case of every single user should be considered and reviewed uh, because again usually uh, here we are dealing uh, or working against uh, very big and very powerful uh, structures. During COVID times uh, digital rights have to come to the forefront especially, I mean, ethics in technology, uh, in AI in particular uh, today, uh, I mean, is one of the key priorities and should be definitely reflected in the digital compact. We understand that uh, these days the world is changing so fast that in the next two years um, things may be changing dramatically. So on the one hand, we had the pandemic and we thought that was a dramatic change, but now we are seeing a completely new challenge, uh, a very dramatic uh, challenge when the whole world, uh, whole world, you know, relations and uh, connections are being disrupted. Uh, we are not getting anywhere closer to uh, some framework agreements even, but five years ago when uh, I for the first time participated in the global IGF, that was in Geneva and I attended as a representative of the civil society, it was very interesting to see that when I proposed that we have or develop some international regulation, the speakers in the audience, including some founding fathers of the internet, were looking at me uh, in surprise. And uh, last year, uh, when 
the uh, multi-stakeholder advisory group, which is kind of a program committee, really, when we worked last year, and we produced, and even I, mo I moderated uh, that discussion, the uh, IGF forum agenda, which included exactly uh, that topic. Uh, so uh, the original idea was uh, put forward four years ago. I mean, the idea of having some rules and norms, and then it's been just four years, and uh, the idea is in the agenda of the IGF. One of the key words of this year, I think, is fragmentation, and uh, Russia its international partners and not just partners um, interpret uh, the uh, notion of fragmentation quite differently, uh, which is an interesting thing in itself. I'm sure the international community will have a lot of discussions around this in Ethiopia. The conference will be taking place in the hybrid mode. Uh, so if you do not plan to be going to Ethiopia at the end of November this year, you can join all the sessions online and you can put your questions and participate so please um, uh, register at the IGF website I'm sure uh, it will be uh, quite um, an insightful uh, event and um, uh, disruptions uh, disruptions can be sometimes uh, useful that is to say they uh, often uh, some some disruptions lead to insights um, now let's turn to our online speakers thank you very much Linar. Andrei Kashanin if you are there Andrei uh, we'd like to ask you as a representative of the expert community of the academia, we'd like to ask you, uh, from your perspective, how can Russian initiatives be communicated to the stakeholders, to the decision makers? How can they be um, shared with the uh, global digital compact uh, process? What should be in the global uh, digital compact from your point of view? Hello, we can hear you. Please go on. Yes, hello, dear participants. First of all, I'd like to say that the Global Digital Compact is a, 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 a amazing and a very relevant initiative and can only be supported. Global IT technologies today is the basis of national and international infrastructure. They are the basis of human lives, and at the same time, there aren't any uh, and rules of the game. We believe that the process of coordinating even uh, general principles of a global digital compact will be quite uh, burdensome. And in, uh, from this perspective, uh, we think there will be a lot of clashes around the uh, content and also about the validity uh, of, uh, of or not the validity, but the enforceability of uh, uh, the provisions of such global digital compact. The United Nations has already made uh, proposals as to what can be included into the um, uh, uh, compact, like including um, avoiding data fragmentation, protection of data, protecting human rights, control over, uh, over the misleading content, uh, uh, AI. But is this enough? Is this an exhaustive list? This is what, uh, that's one of the questions that uh, concerns us. And besides, when you uh, propose a certain framework, you already uh, propose a structure of the discussion. Uh, you, you provide a point of view in a way. But uh, we keep insisting that the process should be involving all uh, stakeholders in order to ensure the completeness of the discussion. And at the higher school of economics, we monitor the activity of different 
different countries in how they regulate uh, the information technologies. And we can say that the national and the international agenda when it comes to uh, regulation uh, in the integration uh, communities is different from what the United Nations is proposing. So um, let me focus on three key points, perhaps. Well, first of all, um, what concerns national and uh, supranational uh, uh, current regulation is digital platforms and regulation of digital platforms. Linara has already talked extensively on this uh, topic, and we can only support him. The second one is data. This is what governments regulate, and especially transboundary movement of data. And another trend, the third trend that we see clearly is the increased role of the uh, governments in regulation and enforcement. 2020-2022, we've seen a kind of an explosion in terms of uh, uh, national and supranational regulation, especially of digital platforms. Well, you know that the uh, Digital Services Act, the Digital Market Act from the European Union is coming into effect these days. Uh, besides, there is the uh, law on the use of uh, uh, data from the public sector in the United States. Uh, the United States is quite reluctant to, to regulate that uh, both at the national and uh, regional level, but still they are adopting this act uh, to uh, prevent targeted ads and similar uh, uh, activities. Similar process is actually also taking place in Australia and the United uh, Kingdom online safety bill, for instance. So again, on the national and the international level, there are two main uh, topics of the discussion, user data, digital platforms. And on top of these two, there is the, um, under, well, an attempt to understand better the role of the governments in regulation. Another problem, another problem is um, uh, is management and control and uh, 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 governance of critical infrastructure. If you remember, ICANN for a long time talked about the role of ICANN in uh, domain names and uh, IP addresses. Uh, they, they discussed it until 2016, and then it kind of left the ICANN agenda. But uh, the problem was not solved in terms of that, well, yes, there is an international system, and yes, it works, and it works pretty well. And the stakeholders recognize ICANN as a coordinator for that infrastructure, but at the same time, considering the growing role of the digital infrastructure, considering the threats, considering potential problems, there is a need to review to review the uh, process and the practice of critical infrastructure management. Another item point here is uh, the role of the governments which should be taken together uh, with uh, multi-stakeholder governance. Historically, internet governance is based on the input uh, from all participants, uh, all stakeholders. We believe that the role of governments uh, is being um, intensified these days due to uh, a greater degree of regulation and uh, whatever we think of the states and their role, they still have jurisdiction over certain territories. Governments still control part of the digital infrastructure in that territory and the governments therefore can regulate it. And today the controlling function of the states is uh, becoming more active. It's something that we cannot deny. So um, neglecting the problem uh, doesn't help. It's counterproductive. The governments, their hands are untied. Uh, and therefore, we must try to agree on some you know, common principles of uh, the uh, government's uh, role in the uh, internet governance. One other thing. 
the legal force of the future uh, global digital compact. You know that uh, we are at the stage of an open call for proposals. The stage is quite um, transparent. But what happens next when the stakeholders have submitted their proposals? What happens next? How will these proposals be reviewed? How they will be conceptualized in a draft document? Here, we see that uh, most likely the process will not be very uh, clear. Uh, most likely, there will be um, office workers uh, drafting uh, the, the uh, document, uh, and then uh, it's proposed. Uh, it's proposed that the document is adopted by uh, a summit, an intergovernmental summit. But the document is quite quite politicized. It's very difficult to conceive now what the discussion may uh, turn out to be. Either the document uh, remains a declaration, a non-binding document, which doesn't regulate much, uh, or we have to face the risk of very politicized discussions, and uh, we face the risk of not having a binding document in the end. Because it will not we will not be able to agree one. So it's very difficult to predict the outcome of this process. I um, am concerned about uh, again, uh, given uh, our past experience with similar initiatives. But the stakeholders around the world and also in Russia should uh, anyway try to um, make a contribution into the process. We need to do our best. Yes, we understand that there may be difficulties in the future at the stage of adopting the document, but still we need to make progress towards one such document. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrei. Uh, you identified several interesting issues, but I'd like to uh, uh, turn now to Yubin Chan. Um, because uh, if there is one person who knows about the process, who understands the process, then she is that, that person. Yupin, are you still there? Are you with us? Can you give us feedback to what you've just heard? Yes, I'm still here, Roman, and I really apologize for a little bit of sound in the bilateral booth next door. Just to maybe answer some of the questions that were raised by Andrea and, and the other speaker. I mean, to be very frank, I think these are legitimate concerns, and these are issues that have actually been raised by other delegations as well. And I do not see, and this is me being quite candid, that it will be a legal document that is binding the United States. In fact, we've been told by quite a number of delegations that they do not see the compact itself as being of that nature. Because I do agree, you given the current geopolitical situation and the discussions that we've had around the cyber digital space at the UN, I think asking for something that's legally enforceable or legally binding would be very tricky. But what we do have an opportunity in the Global Digital Compact is to really look at principles that could then form the basis for these more technical discussions that would be of a stronger, perhaps, legal nature, right? The beginning of convenings and conversations around some of the more tricky issues based on the the compact's initial principles that are to be agreed on by all. And this is why I think um, what was said previously um, about making sure that it's really not just about regulation of um, or actions of governments, but also regulation and accountability of tech platforms and tech companies that is important. And this emphasis on the user experience and what it means for an individual to be online. I think because the Global Compact is multi-stakeholder, as the Secretary General has proposed, it is that opportunity to also call digital platforms and technology companies, particularly the big ones that operate globally now, to account and say that we have certain expectations of behavior. And these are shared expectations that the international community has of them. And then begin that process of keeping them accountable, or at least holding them to these types of commitments that they've made in terms of their behavior and how they operate globally. So this is why, I mean, I share some of what you're saying that at the end of the day, it is really hard to come up with a long detailed document that everyone is bound by. But this is the start of a process that we hope we initiate these types of conversations. And that's where your inputs and perhaps exactly what you've been sharing around the different levels, the importance of you know, data and these other aspects of management and the control of critical infrastructure. These are all key issues that stakeholders are welcome to bring to the Global Digital Compact and precisely to have this type of diversity of views and opinions for what you think is critical in any foundational 
consensus building architecture around digital cooperation is important. So I really do look forward to seeing the views from Russian stakeholders and all of you present today. And I encourage you to really do submit these input. I mean, I think that question was asked, will these proposals be listened to? I think this is also a question out for the member states because at the end of the day, even though it might be us office workers that draft the initial text, it will be an opportunity to build coalitions and constituencies of stakeholders, countries and people that believe in these ideas and principles, and then make sure that these are carried through the negotiations with the backing of member states as well. Thank you very much. Well, that, what you've just said is quite optimistic and encouraging. Um, Andre, um, I'm not sure if uh, you are satisfied with this answer, but if you would like to add anything. Uh, well, first of all, you think, well, um, yes, I appreciate everything that you say. And uh, yes, we understand that uh, um, it's up to us as well. It's part of our responsibility as well uh, to make this a working document, uh, whether it's binding or not. Colleagues, let's now turn uh, to one other guest and speaker of the conference, uh, uh, Roberto Zambrana. Uh, it's already past midnight, and we uh, appreciate him joining uh, the conference today. Roberto, if you are there, yeah, I can see you there. Hi. Uh, so can you share with us the approaches and the vision that you have as an expert who uh, for a long time have been uh, uh, cooperating uh, within the framework of the IGF, uh, so the, the process of collecting the proposals from the various communities, the civil society, uh, the private sector will be organized in your region in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Roman. Uh, Thank you uh, to, to have been invited to this fantastic session and event. I want to say hello to everyone that is participating, the, the, the people that uh, organize this event, because I, I know coming from, a, from a, a position that organizes our own IGF in Bolivia, so I know how hard it is to organize these kind of events, and I'm really glad that you are doing this in a very excellent way. Well, um, about this process, I would like to say that indeed it's um, from, from the first time that I've heard about this initiative back in 2018 to convene all these experts, all these, all these people in this high level digital DAO for digital cooperation and then going through the document that they produce at the, the roadmap for digital cooperation and uh, recently, the um, the other document, uh, the report that was issued by the Secretary General, the uh, Common Agenda, um, I think um, everything was intended to actually make a very, very broad and participatory, participatory process. I think um, the more healthy is to involve all the community regarding this kind of processes. I, I, I can see that there will be a lot of challenges in this way because um, all our regions have different perspectives and in some cases different priorities. Inside it, each region, actually, we can find that. In, in the case of Latin America, we know that we have uh, big countries such as Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, and we have very small countries that we uh, definitely have um, uh, different, as I said before, different priorities regarding what digital future should be for us. Um, I, I will say that some of these issues are so much important that um, are very, very in the top of our current dialogues. Um, I am talking about uh, universal access, universal and meaningful access. That's one of the major issues that we need to face and we need to solve in the close future. Uh, it's glad to know, I was hearing at the presentation, the initial the introduction, that you in Russia are near 80% of uh, 
internet penetration. That's something that it's even over the, the media. And that's not the case in our most of our ca uh, countries in our region. I will say that we are hardly reaching uh, half of the population, maybe maybe even 40% of the population in general, because to have internet not necessary, I mean, to have uh, the possibility to connect to internet, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that we can actually be connected all day in a meaningful way. So that's something that we uh, for sure need to need to face. In, in uh, Latin America, we have our regional IGF, which is uh, the Iraq IGF. It's uh, for this year, it's going to be uh, held in uh, virtual mode for October, in October, in October 24, 25 and 26. And uh, well, the thematic frame is actually regarding the global digital compact. The idea I am sure is to cover most of the issues that uh, were prioritized, that were identified by the uh, Secretary General, and I think um, are relevant for our region indeed. One of those, of course, is universal access, and I think is going to be one of the top issues. And the idea is to first to uh, confirm that indeed for most of our countries, that is one of the important issues that we need to face, as well as some others that emerged, which are certainly important to to face as well, like uh, internet fragmentation, like um, protecting data, of course, that it's not new, but it's all, it's continued to be important for, for all of us. Um, so I think one is, that's one of the objectives to identify these common issues regarding this thematic frame. It's, it will be important also to uh, come up with some policies to find uh, if there were some uh, creative policies that were issued, particularly during the pandemic, and that may directly contribute with the with the global dialogue regarding the issues on, in in the GD in the GDC, and um, I will say that uh, it's going to be successful in in that matter. We we are very um, very keen to. Uh, to get from this uh, result, from this dialogue, these this important conclusions. And hopefully um, our own perspective, our own conclusions regarding the region will be, will, we will try to expose them also in, in Addis Ababa when we have our global IGF. Um, I, I, will, I will think that there will be some, some uh, challenges. Uh, even for the for the GDC process itself, like uh, how um, this process is going to balance between these these different perspectives that some countries may have, uh, particularly countries in the global south regarding the countries in the in the global north. As uh, you remember, um, Roman, when we were discussing last year in Poland, uh, this. Uh, uh, role of, of, of governments in the regulation uh, um, scope regarding to the giants, the giant companies, and uh, the way that have different treatment for big countries regarding small countries, and that's something that uh, will constitute a challenge because these principles that need to be agreed when we have finally we have the this summit of the of the future uh will will need to have uh, uh some sort of consensus but i will think that for most of our small countries we will have very particular issues clear as priorities and hopefully to be agreed for with between everyone but perhaps for some other countries these big giants may try to provide this kind of uh, different influence in the decisions that they are going to to adopt. Because as we all know, and as we heard from UP and um, other colleagues, all this, this decision, all these debates will, uh, will be before and outside of the final uh, assembly, because the, the final decision will be taken by the um, um, state members. So 
Uh, I think that's one of the major challenges. And hopefully, uh, during these uh, months that we have ahead, and uh, again, you've been said, and, and that's correct, we will have more time to to get to provide from our side uh, in in an individual manner as entities as organizations or as countries to provide this kind of inputs uh, hopefully to be systematized in the way that we would like them to be uh, hopefully to have uh, in a very clear and transparent manner uh, not to find out that uh, this uh, document that will systematize all these inputs will appear just at, at the end and just as a particular input for the member states. But hopefully we will try to see this, this uh, document in progress, this evolving document all the way to the, to the summit of the future. So actually the people the, the, all the stakeholders will have the opportunity to see if our more recurrent uh, inputs, more recurrent recommendations uh, will actually be in, in this document. So that's what I will say so far. And uh, again, it's glad to be with all of you. Thank you very much, Roman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roberto. As always, uh, you have uh, talked straight to the point. Uh, I mean, you can tell that you have a lot of experience with uh, IGF discussions. You, uh, you have had a lot of practice. Um, Roberto, would it make you happy? Well, no, uh, let's let's put it differently. Um, what is the idea or what is the rule or what is the principle? Uh, if it makes into the uh, global digital compact, will make you happy. What, from your point of view, should definitely be present? Uh, which provision should definitely be present in the global digital compact? What will make you happy? Well, currently it is. It's one of, I, I will say that it's the very first item coming from the recommendations of the high level um, panel, as you remember, all the way through this process until now. The first issue is regarding connectivity, universal access, universal meaningful access, call it as you, uh, as you want, but that is the main issue. But it's not enough to agree on that principle and to agree that that's the future that we want. In uh, Hopefully that future comes very early, even earlier than 2030. Uh, the key is to actually come up with real policies that affect with effective policies that actually will show us will show the humanity that we are really going to achieve this in a very close future. That's what I will say. I mean, uh, uh, it's already present, but the idea will be that when we find when we get this compact, we actually have some actions that uh, the all the global community is for in each individual country to act to to do better to improve our policies and hopefully to achieve that what we need to get thank you very much well, I guess uh, we could ask the same question uh, to all of our speakers, uh, maybe a bit later. I would personally be very happy if this compact becomes um, a kind of a, um, well, a document that spells out clearly uh, who is responsible for what, that will spell out the responsibility of the government, of the uh, technical community, of the entrepreneurial community, of the, all other various communities in the stakeholder process. So just like uh, uh, this forum, I'm sure, uh, the Summit for the Future and the whole process as well will be in the hybrid mode. And it's wonderful that now we have two years uh, in this uh, uh, fast changing world to uh, discuss different scenarios. Uh, let me put a quick question to Lenar, by the way. It just occurred to me. The cancel culture, to which we are all witnesses today, is an example of uh, the negative 
impact uh, of the internet. I don't know, a uh, school student or uh, an employee in, a, in an office of whole countries. Do you think uh, the global digital contact can somehow influence the behavior in the internet and cancel the cancel culture? Well, to me, this sounds like a matter of, of on what you focus. Microsoft has just prevented Russian users to update the operating system uh, from version 10 to version 11. So please explain to me, how does this work? If the global digital compact does not protect the rights of uh, um, mundane people, regular users outside of the political process. So the very existence of this agreement and uh, the uh, communication between states and nations doesn't make much sense. All states, Russia included, will have to uh, will have to um, uh, prioritize uh, domestic law over international law in order to protect the national interests. And one of the speakers. Uh, tell us, please propose your uh, initiatives, your ideas. Well, it's, it's a, um, a good message, but uh, currently our country is protecting the national interests and the experience that we are getting today in our relations with the digital platforms does not uh, require any proactive message. You can just take this experience and study it, how uh, transactions of regular users are being uh, terminated, uh, how Digital platforms just turn around and leave. Uh, Microsoft for many years uh, were protecting uh, their interests, uh, and uh, the government helped uh, helped them in um, in um, in their fight uh, with uh, piracy. Uh, the government stimulated the you know and encouraged the installation of uh, the legal legally acquired software copies. But, uh, but now uh, Microsoft uh, prevents us from upgrading uh, the software. The user paid the money, and uh, the user is already part of the ecosystem. So we believe that the users have certain rights with respect to these transnational companies. So the digital compact, what stands higher, the interests of the global economy, of the digital economy, or the interests of uh, regular internet users? User. That is the big question. I think it's one of the uh, pivotal points of this compact. And if the agreement uh, doesn't take into account the case of Russia and what Russia is going through right now, and if the compact uh, doesn't uh, care for the discomfort that uh, Russian users are experiencing today, then the value of the document will be undermined. Well, as you can see, Russia, Russia uh, is quite a technologically advanced country, but we only notice this these days uh, in view of the political conflict. But uh, many countries have been under this discrimination for many years, and it is probably to our shame that we did not pay enough attention to other countries' cases in the past. But when I studied at the Faculty of International Relations, I remember and we used international textbooks, foreign textbooks, and we uh, studied uh, such notions as failed state, and it was declared that those countries, certain countries, and you can name them yourselves, it's okay that these countries are excluded from the process of international cooperation. We can see now this attempt, even at the level of technological platforms, to make certain steps towards uh, Russia uh, that uh, uh, no country and no people uh, deserve. Digital platforms in the last several years uh, emerged as political subjects. And the regulation that is taking place and that is to take place will be uh, tied to uh, uh, political needs just because they stopped being economic entities and they became political entities. And probably this compact uh, 
uh, will lead to the need of a different compact to discuss not just technical issues, but uh, to somehow govern the political uh, aspects of this coexistence of different entities. Exactly, just like you said, uh, entity, an entity, an agent, uh, an actor, a subject, uh, new political relations uh, create changes in the uh, relations between different entities. Microsoft today is playing, is becoming an actor in its own right, a big company that doesn't want to, or an airline that doesn't want to fly over some country's um, airspace. Well, it's pretty much the same as Microsoft uh, rejecting uh, the opportunity to upgrade the software to the users of some country. Five years ago, when we, I, myself and my colleagues, well, of course, Russia has been part of the process from the very beginning, but when I joined the process of the IGF, say, five years ago, we see that the, uh, say, uh, the airspace or uh, fisheries, uh, seabed, all of this is regulated already, but the Internet is yet another medium in which we all exist at the moment uh, doesn't have its regulation. Do I believe that the Global Digital Compact will, will um, set the rules once and for all? No, of course I don't believe in this. But if the compact contains a provision calling the signatories to agree an international convention uh, to become binding upon all the parties, well, I would be happy if we had such a provision in the document. Okay, as a bottom line to this discussion, well, first of all, we need to recognize perhaps digital platforms as entities of international law. Uh, and it's also very important to recognize that regular users too have their own uh, entity, if you will, in international digital law, with, um, I don't know how, how the, this can be done. I mean, uh, a voice, uh, you have to be quite radical or you have to be quite passionate uh, to raise your voice. Regular users do not even send uh, complaints often. They don't complain often. Uh, and of course, the regular users uh, are not very likely to send their proposals to the United Nations. They are not very likely to even hear about the process of uh, the uh, global digital compact drafting. So, again, if we talk about equality, we must uh, really focus on equality, and uh, perhaps a standalone user will not be able to protect his or her rights in uh, the opposition uh, with uh, with a global platform. We, we, had, we had these cases, multiple cases this year, when accounts would be removed from YouTube YouTube, Facebook, etc. As soon as you become slightly more active, you are uh, coming under the attention of uh, uh, the platform uh, administration. Uh, you work for years to, um, you know, expand the audience of the platform. But then, uh, well, I understand if you violated the rules. But when you do not violate any rules, and yet your account is removed in Poland, there is this uh, interesting case. They they have this company that is a contracted to Google that moderates uh, YouTube comments. In uh, April, this spring, they updated their rules. And, uh, of course, this is done with a view to Russia. They updated their rules as to which comments are permitted and which are not. Uh, Pro-Russian comments are not permitted. They are removed, and anti-Russian comments, uh, they are welcome. And one of the moderators of this company, for Photographed, photographed the new version of the rules and posted them online. And this uh, manager, this person, this moderator, was fired the next day. There is the right of this moderator to make the rules public, right? Because uh, they concern uh, and, uh, uh, millions of users, really, an unknown number of users. Uh, you said 90% of uh, Russians are online, like, uh, right? Uh, did, did I hear this, this correctly? Um, I mean, 
uh, I think that if uh, you know, those aspects are not covered by the digital compact, this uh, will make the legitimacy of the compact itself doubtful. Well, the legitimacy of the document can be content, con contested even at the stage of its adoption. Oh, well, yeah, I understand that. But um, I think that really if we make an effort, if we are really interested in hearing each other out, if we are interested in finding a compromise and bringing different visions together, there is a chance for the global uh, digital compact process to succeed. We still have two years ahead of us. Um, there will be many more discussions and roundtables and panel, panel discussions, and there will be many more experts and active internet users and active lobbyists and representatives of the companies and governments and uh, international uh, public and non-public organizations uh, to join the process. I think that every one, every country now has the right of voice and something will be born out of it. The, the big question mark, of course, is what the world will look like in two years' time. It's difficult to predict, but now I'd like to go back to our international colleagues and um, we have a representative of uh, Madagascar. Um, are, you, are you there? Харин Ванана. Харин Ион Банана. A question. Uh, to you, um, we, uh, we noticed that there is an inflow of proposals from the African countries uh, to uh, at the website of the Global uh, Digital Compact. Uh, so what is the vision of uh, your region, of your continent, of your country? What are your interests? Uh, what interests you in the, this area? And which provision will make you happy is the same question that I asked uh, Roberto. Uh, we can hear you, but the sound is not very good and we can't see you. If you can turn on the camera. I want to start by introducing myself. I am Julian Adinochi. I'm from my team, Madagascar, also my member, and uh, professionally practicing a senior presentation. I'm really honored to have been invited to this event, and I hope my small contribution will help you to reflect on the future of internet and to reach your profession idea of the field. That's great. Um, for the first moment, I think it's not confusing that we can work together to begin the studies of the forum because we are so excellent. We are all aware of the fact that uh, digital technology has taken you know, sexy dangerous. Our AV team is uh, telling us that we cannot we cannot hear our colleague from Madagascar. Uh, we lost the connection for some reason. Uh, very well. Hopefully, uh, Arion Banana will be joining us very soon. And the question to Vadim uh, while we are reconnecting. Any ideas that you have since your organization is the uh, Russian representative in MAG, uh, what's, what's your perspective? Uh, well, very well. Good afternoon, uh, colleagues, once again. Я думаю, что после выступления и наших экспертов и представителей This is a very important section. I'm glad that you decided to include it into the agenda. Uh, we've listened to our colleagues and to the representative from the office of the Envoy on Technologies. Now we have a better picture of what the the, the um, initiative is all about and I would like to thank Chen Yubin who found time to join us from Bucharest uh, and uh, who provided us with answers to many questions.
Также очень ценно было послушать и... It was also invaluable to listen to Roberto's perspective from a different continent. Now we have a better understanding of uh, how the initiative of the uh, global digital contact is perceived in a different part of the world. Uh, hopefully, uh, Harion Banana will be rejoining us soon. It's, it's important that we get it out of the you know, horse's mouth. Uh, the Russian expert community, uh, too, has its own experience and its own view on the document. For me, it will be quite difficult to add anything more to Lenar's uh, speech. Uh, he described the um, practices of the digital platforms in great detail, and yes, there is a disappearance of Russian apps from App Store is absolutely atrocious. Просто, как говорится, ниже в Этерлинии. Да, и в этой связи возникает... And in this regard, the question arises, what comes next, what we should be doing next. We know that whenever a new international document is prepared, the countries do not act on their own. Instead, they enter into alliances or they create coalitions to promote joint agenda, to uh, agree on the common position. And one such example is the Declaration for the Future of the Internet. It's the document that was signed by 61 countries in April this year under the aegis of the United States. The document records the high goals and principles, um, everything good against everything bad, democracy versus authoritarian uh, governance. The declaration sets out the principles. One of such principles is, to give you one example, is that user access should not be uh, blocked it should not be it should not be um, disrupted but again the yesterday's case it just keeps uh, prolonging on my mind. Uh, it cancels out the principles that were um, spelled out in this declaration. In the global compact, nothing of the kind should uh, appear. You know that you can submit your proposal on the website of the Office of the Envoy, and there is uh, uh, there are rules of how you can submit uh, the documents. First of all, uh, please submit your criteria on the principles to be included into the contract, uh, into the uh, agreement, the principles that will apply to all stakeholders, the governments, the businesses, the technical community, the civil society. And the second rule of the proposal to be submitted is please also write how uh, the the um, obligations, how the rules will uh, be enforced or how they should be complied with. And if all the proposals indeed follow uh, that guidance, if they comply with these rules, I think that there is a good chance that we get ourselves a working document. It's high time we consolidated our position, at least at the national level first. And yes, there are still two years to go till the summit for the future. Currently, the deadline to submit the proposals is end of this year. So we shouldn't let the grass grow out under our feet, and we should start working as soon as possible. Next year, in September, a ministerial meeting is to be convened to discuss the general uh, framework of this uh, global compact. And by that time, our expert community uh, will have to come up with a, 
uh, its, its um, position. As to alliances and coalitions, I believe other colleagues also mentioned them. Probably we can contact friendly countries who are also interested in promoting a shared position. Perhaps we can use the uh, platform of the regional uh, conference uh, on telecom. In Samarkand, November this year, there will be uh, a, a meeting of the heads of uh, telecom services, telecom ministries from the region. And this is a good opportunity for us to discuss the cooperation between the countries and the region. Uh, in the context of the uh, uh, GDC, and we, uh, the Russian expert community, can act as a coordinator, uh, say, for the process for the region. If anyone is interested in having our voice heard, in uh, making sure that our proposals are heeded to in the GDC, uh, please join the process. We are currently drafting the roadmap and the format of proposals collection, and in the next couple of weeks, um, we will be releasing the news. And as we heard today from Ms. Yupin, it would be very interesting to hear the opinion of the Russian IGF on the GDC. This can be our contribution into this international initiative. It's a unique chance that we should not miss. Thank you. Thank you. I totally agree with Vadim, and I invite uh, the experts in Russia and in other countries to take active part. Uh, in the procedure, the more data we collect, the more proposals we have, the, the better can be the output to be prepared by the United Nations. We need to throw in as many ideas as we can. надеемся, конечно, что Ленар, would you like to add anything? Well, I think that it makes sense to study also the impact of the digital environment on the tragedies in our lives. Recently, a couple of days ago, in Izhevsk, there was a school shooting, and uh, we would like to uh, sympathize with Udmurtia, uh, with the uh, relatives of uh, those who lost their lives in the school shooting, or last year, for instance. I don't know how to call this person. I mean, uh, the, uh, there was another school shooting, that is to say, so, someone who comes to school and uh, to a school and uh, shoots people. It's inconceivable. Where is the digital environment at this point? That person was definitely part of the digital environment. Uh, but what was, uh, what was the role of the digital environment in that person's behavior? Uh, was that person taken into account the digital environment to spread the information about his or her actions? Uh, what is the response of the digital environment? I'm not talking about people's comments under the uh, piece of news, right? We need to proactive actively study uh, the information uh, uh, information that is produced out of such events and the impact uh, that uh, it has on the mental health of our children. Today in TikTok, uh, there is uh, this trend which is called uh, the grave needle. Uh, it's uh, it's been inflated these days. It's uh, it's uh, a prejudice. I mean, it's uh, you can make this. Um, Mm. Well, what you call it, it's, uh, I mean, people are, are sharing uh, a jinx, uh, really, uh, that claims to send people to graves, uh, really. But this has an impact on our children. What are the mechanisms of protecting, digital mechanisms of protecting the mental health of the younger ones? Let's, in addition to discussing how big corporations are moving money and uh, goods, uh, I mean, of course, 
course, we need to discuss that, but let's uh, do not forget about our children behind all these discussions. Let's think how we uh, protect our children and their lives from the impact of the digital environment. It's also very important. And the digital community uh, and the businessmen, of course, should be involved. But uh, uh, it should it should also the pro this work should also involve the parent community and the law enforcement authorities and the psychologists. Well, yeah. Uh, thank you for this remark. Uh, the internet environment is creating uh, or is is is. Uh, I don't know how to call it, is stimulating deviant behavior uh, to some extent. And the professionals who work with us as speakers and experts at this forum uh, hopefully will be able to resist or to counter uh, the threats generated by the general community. Colleagues, European Roberto, Andre, if any of you would like to say anything um, as your feedback to this discussion, uh, European, would you like to say anything? Wait, wait, wait for it. Roberto? Roberto? Roberto, would you like to add anything to this discussion? Commentary. Any comments? Looks like not. Um, Andre? Соответственно, да, раз пока okay. наши коллеги с телефона, господи, с телефона. Our colleagues uh, uh, online. I'm, I'm reading comments from uh, the organizers telling me that Harim uh, Banana has rejoined the session. Let's see if the connection is better this time. Yes. Okay, I hope I still have a few minutes to to provide uh, uh, other views. Um, first, I think the the, pro the the preparatory process is important. It must be open and inclusive. I will put more emphasis on the on the opportunity this time to all communities and uh, stakeholders that um, uh, and even individuals to share their inputs and views. Uh, with the international community in this consultation. Realities may vary from one community to another, from one country to another. Um, I want to take the example of Madagascar, the same time zone of Russia, but in the in the sovereign hemisphere in the Indian, Indian Ocean. Madagascar is one of the least developed countries in the world, but last decade demonstrate that uh, Regardless of the issues we have with the infrastructure, with the internet connection, uh, the digital economy holds the most promises uh, in our fight against poverty. Yet the digital divide remains stark, but few people ha still have uh, access to broadband connectivity. Internet penetration is still low. In my work environment, how many times I've seen some villagers that just ask for network coverage, but are refused because the return on investment is considered low, and the population's income is not sufficient to cover the cost. Um, another example is that uh, one in four people in Madagascar has no identity, and without identity, there is no access to basic services, education, health, social protection, justice. People do not have access to civil status because the cost is too high, including the time spent to obtain papers, traveling. Uh, <laughs> they do not always have all the required papers, hence the birth of a program launched by the government in 2099. But with the objective of increasing inclusive access to the legal identity for all citizens by the digitalization of uh, the service. And ahead of that, 
how to secure those data. Madagascar has been working with the ITU to establish a stash, uh, institutional structure at the national level to deal with uh, cyber freight and incidents, but so far not yet completed. So the political will is there. Initiatives are emerging but expected not only to set out rights, but also duties and the reciprocity of commitments between the government and the citizens, between the state members in the, in the respect of sovereignty of each nation. To date, most uh, African digital infrastructure uh, have been uh, funded through equity investments rather than debt financing. And this is likely to continue. Of course, investment in digital uh, infrastructure without complementary investment in other hard infrastructures such as power generation that will use um, the distribution and will not lead to the desired connectivity we want. And uh, part of that, Africa was warned of threats to Africa's digital sovereignty because. Um, some commentators have faced the dangers uh, of surveillance capitalism by foreign companies that we will use the, Africa, the data of Africa citizens without respect for their privacy. And this is some commentators calling that digital colonialism. But we are expecting partnership based on the principles of equity, transparency, and a good institutional framework for data and digital assets. And this is personally what I'm expecting from PDC. I hope I will leave it for now, but I would be happy to engage more discussions on that. Over to you, Homo. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. I thank you very much, Helen Bonana, that the internet connection didn't fail us. Uh, eventually, which once again emphasizes the importance of uh, uh, improving the infrastructure. Of course, we must have rules and there must be regulation and it's all very important, but uh, the uh, new basic stuff is also extremely important. We must have a, a real a reliable and an unfailing uh, internet connection. When I asked uh, the question to Roberto, actually, uh, people uh, here let me uh, know that uh, Roberto started answering the question, but we couldn't hear him, and that's why I uh, switched to another speaker. So if Roberto, if you're still there and you would like to give us some final remarks, uh, we are willing to give the floor to you. Sure, sure. Roman, I hope you can hear me now. I, I think you can hear me. Yes, right? yes, yes, we can hear you very well, loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you again. Well, thank you very much, uh, Roma. I think for my com final comments, I would like to um, say that it's a great opportunity for for all of us in our different regions to contribute to this. Uh, and as we heard before, we only have until the end of the year. So no matter if it's an individual contribution or it's an organizational or as an entity or as a country, it's important for us to provide this kind of, of uh, contributions because the more of the contributions we have regarding particular aspects that we need to be there in the, in the compact, the better and hopefully we may be sure that those are going to be there. And uh, it, there is still um, some months to go and uh, a lot, a big process uh, ahead. Uh, we need to be close to this process, hopefully when it's actually uh, near the summit and hopefully we, we will continue um, being or witnessing this this uh, process in these other stages. That's the, the last thing I, I would like to say. Thank you very much again, Roman, for the invitation and all the organizers. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Roberto. Uh, thank you for uh, staying with us uh, at such a late hour uh, in your part of the world. Yupin, would you also like to share some final remarks with the audience? Thank you so much. Just again to thank the Russian IGF for inviting us here. 
I'm really glad to see the enthusiasm, the engagement with the United Nations, and to say that really the points that were raised from Roberto, Lene, Haramono about how at the very heart of it is the impact on individuals, people, communities is really important. And that's something that I think the UN needs to keep in mind. And I really look forward to receiving all your inputs and continuing this conversation and making sure that all voices are heard in the consultation on the and uh, thank you very much. And again, uh, Yupin, uh, special thank, uh, thank, uh, thanks to you um, because we um, understand how busy your agenda must be uh, at this uh, ICU conference. Thank you very much for allocating the whole an hour and a half uh, for this uh, session with us. It's wonderful that uh, the audience here could uh, get us straight uh, to get the information straight from you from the United Nations. Thank you so much. Colleagues in the studio, uh, Vadim, Lenar, any closing remarks? Well, may I answer this this question that you, you kept addressing to other speakers here as to which provision in the Global Compact would make me happy? Well, uh, all the six items that were mentioned on one of the slides here, of course, I would welcome them in the uh, compact. Uh, but I think, well, to me, the most one of the most important provisions is the liability uh, for spreading the destructive content, the content content that can produce damage, that can be harmful to the audience, to the children, to the future generations. So a liability, responsibility accountability should be something in uh, definitely should be in the compact Lenar, those countries who are under pressure from digital platforms should cooperate and come together and unite and protect their sovereign interests together online sovereignty exactly Andrei, anything to add on your side Anything that you would like to see in the compact? Well, I would add, and maybe uh, again uh, to go back to uh, Russia, the format of contributing the proposals is defined by the United Nations. But before we uh, make a proposal to the United Nations, maybe uh, we should consolidate our position here, at least uh, on the side of the uh, academic and uh, the civil sector and the business community, perhaps. Uh, if we first coordinated our position here, um, if, if, well, we need to, to let people uh, or to encourage people to uh, think what their position is, uh, really, because I don't think that actually many people are thinking about it. And they will also help us overcome the fragmentation of the discourses, the uh, political, the diplomatic, the technical, etc. It will help us, uh, uh, you know, um, it will help us uh, coordinate uh, our views. Again, thank you very much for having this session. And I believe that the GDC is a, a crucial initiative for the whole world. Well, at this point, I like to thank the Center for Global IT Cooperation and the CCTLD to RU as organizers for this session, for assembling here the brilliant experts, speakers from around the world and representing different stakeholders. We had people, well, I think we had people from, you know, all strata. We have people from the civil society, from the business, from the government experts, uh, from the United Nations. And this is exactly the approach that should uh, be the foundation of uh, uh, the drafting of the global compact, an objective process, a non-prejudiced process. We are doing it for ourselves, we are doing it for the future generations. This is the premise of the General uh, Secretary General 
And uh, in his uh, reports and his speeches, he keeps uh, returning to the idea of a safe future for the future generations. Uh, so hopefully, uh, this process uh, turns out to be efficient and produces the benefit for the future generations. Again, thank you everyone who joined us online for being with us. We hope it was interesting. And we'd like to thank everyone in the studio and all colleagues who helped us in man managing the broadcast. Thank you for listening and watching. Uh, please stay tuned for more. I'm sure that there will be many more lively discussions during the day. Thank you and see you later. Технологии меняют мир, и лаборатория Касперского готова к этим переменам. Наша экосистема решений для защиты бизнеса – это слаженный оркестр продуктов и технологий. Они постоянно обогащаются лучшей в мире аналитикой об угрозах и дополняют друг друга. С ними вы сохраните устойчивость бизнеса и стабильность ваших процессов. Лаборатория Касперского обеспечит защиту вашей компании в любых условиях. Касперский симфонии. Кибербезопасность в виртуозном исполнении. Технологии меняют мир, и лаборатория Касперского готова к этим переменам. Наша экосистема решений для защиты бизнеса – это слаженный оркестр продуктов и технологий. Они постоянно обогащаются лучшей в мире аналитикой об угрозах и дополняют друг друга. С ними вы сохраните устойчивость бизнеса и стабильность ваших процессов. Лаборатория Касперского обеспечит защиту вашей компании в любых условиях. Касперский симфонии. Кибербезопасность в виртуозном исполнении.
технологии меняют мир, и лаборатория Касперского готова к этим переменам. Наша экосистема решений для защиты бизнеса – это слаженный оркестр продуктов и технологий. Они постоянно обогащаются лучшей в мире аналитикой об угрозах и дополняют друг друга. С ними вы сохраните устойчивость бизнеса и стабильность ваших процессов. Лаборатория Касперского обеспечит защиту вашей компании в любых условиях. Касперский симфонии. Кибербезопасность в виртуозном исполнении. Технологии меняют мир, и лаборатория Касперского готова к этим переменам. Наша экосистема решений для защиты бизнеса – это слаженный оркестр продуктов и технологий. Они постоянно обогащаются лучшей в мире аналитикой об угрозах и дополняют друг друга. С ними вы сохраните устойчивость бизнеса и стабильность ваших процессов. Лаборатория Касперского обеспечит защиту вашей компании в любых условиях. Касперский симфонии. Кибербезопасность в виртуозном исполнении. Технологии меняют мир, и лаборатория Касперского готова к этим переменам. Наша экосистема решений для защиты бизнеса – это слаженный оркестр продуктов и технологий. Они постоянно обогащаются лучшей в мире аналитикой об угрозах и дополняют друг друга. С ними вы сохраните устойчивость бизнеса и стабильность ваших процессов. Лаборатория Касперского обеспечит защиту вашей компании в любых условиях. Касперский симфонии. Кибербезопасность в виртуозном исполнении.
Технологии меняют мир, и лаборатория Касперского готова к этим переменам. Наша экосистема решений для защиты бизнеса – это слаженный оркестр продуктов и технологий. Они постоянно обогащаются лучшей в мире аналитикой об угрозах и дополняют друг друга. С ними вы сохраните устойчивость бизнеса и стабильность ваших процессов. Лаборатория Касперского обеспечит защиту вашей компании в любых условиях. Касперский симфонии. Кибербезопасность в виртуозном исполнении. Технологии меняют мир, и лаборатория Касперского готова к этим переменам. Наша экосистема решений для защиты бизнеса – это слаженный оркестр продуктов и технологий. Они постоянно обогащаются лучшей в мире аналитикой об угрозах и дополняют друг друга. С ними вы сохраните устойчивость бизнеса и стабильность ваших процессов. Лаборатория Касперского обеспечит защиту вашей компании в любых условиях. Касперский симфонии. Кибербезопасность в виртуозном исполнении. Технологии меняют мир, и лаборатория Касперского готова к этим переменам. Наша экосистема решений для защиты бизнеса – это слаженный оркестр продуктов и технологий. Они постоянно обогащаются лучшей в мире аналитикой об угрозах и дополняют друг друга. С ними вы сохраните устойчивость бизнеса и стабильность ваших процессов. Лаборатория Касперского обеспечит защиту вашей компании в любых условиях. Касперский симфонии. Кибербезопасность в виртуозном исполнении.
технологии меняют мир, и лаборатория Касперского готова к этим переменам. Наша экосистема решений для защиты бизнеса – это слаженный оркестр продуктов и технологий. Они постоянно обогащаются лучшей в мире аналитикой об угрозах и дополняют друг друга. С ними вы сохраните устойчивость бизнеса и стабильность ваших процессов. Лаборатория Касперского обеспечит защиту вашей компании в любых условиях. Касперский симфонии. Кибербезопасность в виртуозном исполнении. Технологии меняют мир, и лаборатория Касперского готова к этим переменам. Наша экосистема решений для защиты бизнеса – это слаженный оркестр продуктов и технологий. Они постоянно обогащаются лучшей в мире аналитикой об угрозах и дополняют друг друга. С ними вы сохраните устойчивость бизнеса и стабильность ваших процессов. Лаборатория Касперского обеспечит защиту вашей компании в любых условиях. Касперский симфонии. Кибербезопасность в виртуозном исполнении.
Здравствуйте. Мы продолжаем программу 12-го российского форума. Hello, and we continue with the program of the 12th uh, RIGF. My name is Karen Kazarian. I'm director of the Institute of Internet Studies. And we stand the... С нами сегодня panel dedicated to ecosystems regulation. Today with us we have Damir Salihov uh, from MTS, and online we have uh, Sergei Plugatarenko, who will be my co-moderator of the session. He is the general director of uh, RAEC. Uh, Dmitry Terstepanov, acting general director of digital economy. Uh, and Mikhail Voronin, a lawyer with Yandex and High School of Economics, Irina Zaeva from the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service, and Irina Левова from the um, Russian Big Data Association. Hello, colleagues. Are you online? Действительно. Uh, testing, testing. Uh, well, yes. Um, I'm sending you the rays of my support um, at the RIGF. I think it's very important uh, that we discuss these uh, topics at the international level. I did not immerse myself into the previous session, but I did get a glimpse of it, and I was very happy to see the many foreign speakers. So on the one hand, uh, Russia is doing great in terms of uh, its own ecosystems and uh, uh, internet players. So on the other hand, we are all uh, together uh, today at this session without any uh, foreign uh, participants playing in the sandbox, but uh, things uh, as uh, they are as they are and today we'll talk about our current um, challenge challenges and opportunities I am going to share my presentation now um, so that you will be looking not just at the talking head uh, but also at some pictures um, I'm the head of Russian Association of Electronic uh, communications several years ago, we came up with this notion of the so called digital uh, counter or framework. It has several clusters or segments, uh, call it whatever you like. Uh, all of this um, boils down to an idea of commercial companies that make money with uh, the digital technologies uh, uh, together with the t digital technologies. Uh, 2022. Uh, was the year when uh, our view of the world uh, it turned upside uh, down. Many international players left the country and cut uh, the Russian companies off international markets. But uh, at the end of 2021, in the stable times when we were growing, this digital counter uh, made almost 10 trillion rubles and grew by um, 42% on 2020. That was the highest growth rate rate only once in our past history. We had a rate of growth of 46%, and at the end of last year, we were so happy and glad to say that actually we overcame all the crisis phenomena resulting out of the pandemic, and we reached the uh, rate of growth that we had before the crisis time. And then 2022, according to our estimates, we talked to the experts at the Russian Internet Forum in May. We tried to collect the data, and it probably ruined will grow also in 2022, but only by 11%, which is the lowest uh, rate of growth uh, throughout our history. But every day, every month, um, the um, forecasts are being reviewed, and only in December we will know what will uh, be the actual rate of change in the market for the year. Um, E-commerce is an important component of RUNET, or the Russian digital co counter. According to RAC data, at the end of last year, e-commerce segment uh, in this big pie uh, counted to uh, 87 trillion rubles. Uh, it grew up uh, uh, at a great rate uh, due to the development of uh, digital ecosystems. We also 
need to understand what the users are doing in the internet. Uh, there are several ways to measure that activity. Dmitry Chernyshenko recently posted data that uh, at the moment Runa has 130 million users, but uh, together with Metascope in May this year, we agreed on almost 100 million users, and this is the data to which we stick. Uh, many people use uh, mobile internet. There are many mo more mobile users than there are desktop users, and they're all regular users. They all go online every single day, and they are the audience with which we work. What do the users do online, we also have a pretty good picture of it. If you look at the diagram on the left, social media, messengers, news, media content, online shopping, recreation, if any of the players can merge several of these um, uh, segments into a consortium, uh, that player will get itself a uh, consortium and um, a multiplier effect. Uh, the, there will be uh, several fold growth uh, through this uh, merger. Uh, the Russian users at the end of 21 were developing subscriptions to ecosystem. They were actively subscribing. There is data that at the end of 2021, about 20 million people were involved uh, or subscribed to ecosystems. On average, there are one and a half subscriptions per person. According to the forecast, at the end of 22, the number of uh, the subscribers would have grown to 35 million, and uh, uh, half of the Russian audience would have been covered by the ecosystems by the end of 2022, if not for the current events. And uh, Russian ecosystems systems were competing very uh, successfully with foreign ecosystems. Actually, uh, foreign foreigners didn't even have to leave the country. Uh, normal competition made Russian products quite competitive, and the uh, Russian ecosystems provide a complete set of services and products to the Russian users. Uh, currently, in the Russian market, there are about 10 ecosystems, Spir, Yandex, VK, there is also Ozon uh, and MTS and several others. In the digital uh, markets, niche services are also developing, like Headhunter or Sian. Uh, what's the idea behind the ecosystems? They provide vast opportunities for the development of small and medium businesses, and they also provide uh, satisfaction to the regular user in an ecosystem. Every user can find everything they need. Uh, they also provide uh, access um, uh, to new markets and to audiences for the businesses. Yandex Market, Ozone, and other players uh, demonstrate uh, remarkable figures. The number of vendors coming to the platforms, we understand there may be SMBs, even self employed. There, the growth is 214%. Uh, for instance, in case of Yandex Market at the end of last year, and the share in the sales channel of uh, outside vendors on the Yandex market was 82%. So basically, it was approaching the maximum. The model is very popular and efficient for the business and for the user. It enables risk diversification, and uh, you can offer a different services and products to your clients. Today, ecosystems and platforms, we believe, uh, are becoming the driver of economic growth and the main platform for the economy to find its standing and new models of development in the difficult times. Today, ecosystems are the basis for platform economy in Russia. We believe that we should be considering ecosystems as one of the fundamental elements of the digital economy. It's clear that this attention to the ecosystems from the business and the users would not have been left unnoticed by the state. And the regulators have to think about competition and protection of the user in the digital markets. And Russia has made certain steps in this direction as part of the fifth anti-monopoly um, package uh, prepared by the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service uh, to improve anti-monopoly uh, regulation uh, in uh, digital economy. But at the same time, a week ago, there was the specialized forum at the Russian Forum everywhere. We talked to the market participants, and we have discussions. As far as I understand, the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service agrees with us that uh, excessive regulation of the state may have a negative impact on the dynamics of digital markets. And uh, strict uh, provisions may slow down the development of the ecosystems and uh, damage the competition. That's why self-regulation is becoming more popular in Russia. Uh, 
as an example, there are the principles of communication of the participants of the digital markets that the FAS developed together with the market participants and many of the ecosystems joined them. They uh, assume voluntary obligations um, to be guided by the principles of this document, not to engage in malify the uh, practices with respect to competitors and users. So that was a very quick uh, overview of what uh, RIAEC sees uh, through its analysis and participation in different events and talking to the market uh, users and experts. I'd like to hear now from the stakeholders of the platform economy of Russia, representative of the state and professional associations. We have all of them present here and I'd like to give the floor now to uh, Dmitry Terstepanov uh, from the Digital Economy NGO. We know that your organization organized uh, polling of the businesses. Uh, you asked them about what they think about, uh, about uh, regulation. So what are your conclusions and forecasts? Yes, thank you very much. I'll um, be sharing uh, the several slides that I prepared with you while we are setting it up. Uh, Sergei, uh, can you see the slides, by the way? <coughs> we can see it. So Sergey has uh, just explained why ecosystems are important. Ecosystems are a new means of organizing economic activity. It's a step in the development. It's a step forward. The first step was the platforms. Now at the next level, we see a different uh, level in the development of the platforms. The platforms was a, a means of structuring. Uh, basically, uh, the e e economy of the traditional organization ecosystem is a different means of organizing the economic activity per se for a certain group of actors. I'll talk about it later, but first let me uh, tell you what we've done. Uh, uh, second half of last year was devoted to coming to an agreement about the definition of an ecosystem and to uh, the scope of its regulation, which aspects of regulation really matter. We did not talk about economic means of regulation, but instead uh, legal regulation. Of course, inside legal regulation, you always find the co economy, and uh, it is important, but the focus of our discussions during panel discussions was legal regulation of ecosystems activities. And we tried to a large extent to assume all the best practices uh, from the Russian Union of Entrepreneurs and Industrialists and other associations. We spent more than 500 uh, uh, man hours. We organized several uh, roundtables. And we collected the vision that we think gives a detail, detailed view, uh, detail, it reflects in detail uh, the vision of all the stakeholders. Uh, you can see here the list of participants, and we try to organize the discussion not uh, in your traditional way when uh, you bring together people who in any case understand each other without the need to say anything. No, the focus of our discussion was to, of course, come to a consolidated position, but the most important element uh, of the result that we achieved was not the report that we produced at the end of the round tables. It was quite uh, uh, heavy. Uh, so you can find all the details with references to international experience, to the opinion of the market experts. There are various um, authored publications. All of this is very important. I'll give you a link to this report at the end of my uh, presentation. But what's important is we got together people from the government, from different businesses. We put them uh, around the same table and they talked to each other and they exchanged opinions to develop a new means of regulation. The discussions were very open around the negative and the positive effects that might be caused by this or that piece of regulation. And then together, they decided which of these measures should be adopted. It was curious, actually. Some measures that everyone believed 
to be a priority having been discussed uh, in detail all the panelists uh, uh, agreed that these measures be not taken so once again these are the main uh, themes that we talked about, we tried to uh, produce a definition of an ecosystem and uh, why they're different from platforms. And then we organized four roundtables, thematic roundtables. And uh, 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 there we talked about data regulation, competition, advertisement, government regulation and development stimulation, and also uh, protection of consumer rights. And at the last stage, we uh, assessed the effect of the um, proposed measures in order to understand which ones should be kept and which ones should be discarded. To go back to the first question, what is an ecosystem? Here is the methodology that we followed. Every participant could uh, uh, score uh, the questions. Well, actually, uh, you can read the report, and it's a mathematical methodology. You can find all the details of it in the report. But the results um, were quite interesting. Yeah, there are some uh, indicators of a digital platform and the indicators of an ecosystem. So if you look at these indicators, you compare them, you will see that a digital platform is something that uses IT and uh, something that that uh, provides some internal structure to an organization. And the ecosystem is a set of relations between uh, a number of uh, entities, and primarily economic relations. Another important conclusion is that an ecosystem is an economic notion, a notion of uh, e economic financial law, anti-monopoly law, perhaps, while a digital platform is a category of uh, digital law, information law, uh, it's a matter of data, and therefore uh, regulation measures should be separated. Another conclusion that we made, and it is not shown here on the slide, is that in order to introduce a new definition into the legislation, we need to understand clearly why we need the definition. We see, say, that some measures are aimed at digital platforms and they have a positive effect. Uh, they uh, uh, are beneficial for the users, then that makes sense. And if we see that there is no need to introduce a definition because uh, there aren't any relevant measures. So, I mean, uh, maybe you don't need to have a definition if you do not intend to take any relevant measures. And in closing, uh, this is our approach to uh, scoring. You see that it's a statistical technique, a quite mechanic. Um, the uh, government participants, business participants, anyone can uh, discuss these measures. And this is exactly what was done during this roundtable discussions. Uh, we uh, generated a consolidated assessment. It's very interesting to review because some things that are being actively discussed uh, that look um, efficient on the surface, then uh, during thorough discussions, they end up in this red uh, zone. And this tells us that sometimes we think that we can do something good, but we do not uh, envision all of the negative effects. But when we talk to each other openly and we see that the negative effects will outweigh all the positive ones, now we must uh, say no to such measures. You will be able to see this only in a dialogue. And the measures that at the first glance may uh, look not very popular, in fact, will produce most of the positive effects and all of our efforts should be put into them. Them. And there is um, a certain number of measures that need to be fine-tuned. It's clear that uh, even if you assemble the best of experts, they will not be able to agree upon certain aspects at first go. And we know that the devil is in the detail, so the measures that are here in the middle they will have to be fine-tuned. So here is a QR code that will take you to the report 
опубликован по результатам регулирования этой системы. Мне очень приятно, что практически все вот участники нашей сегодняшней дискуссии, которые почти все участники дискуссии также контрибировали к разработке рапорта. И большое спасибо всем участникам, вот, несмотря на то, что у нас есть перечень авторов. И, конечно, yes, рапорт имеет лист авторов. Всех участников круглого стола. Но мы также отмечаем всех других участников рабочей группы, потому что мы считаем, что input всех этих был ценным. Это мысль для всех участников таким образом носить. Спасибо большое, Сергей. Дмитрий, спасибо большое. Дмитрий, спасибо. Yes, that was a lot of work, and thank you for describing the process, and thank you for posting the report online the, for everyone to download. I also wanted to mention uh, that out of the remaining speakers, uh, well, the, all of them will have 10 to 12 minutes for the presentation, and Dmitry did wonderfully with the timing. Studio, um, people in the studio, do you have anything to add or shall we pass the floor to our next speaker? Well, thank you, Sergey, and thank you, Dmitry, for this major uh, endeavor. We think that Russia needs its own approach to managing the ecosystems, and of course we study international experience, but we shouldn't copy-paste the European initiatives on regulation of digital platforms and ecosystems. And I would like to invite Mikhail Voronin. Uh, to speak about Russian ecosystems and uh, co communication between different participants of the digital markets. Uh, Mikhail. Yes, thanks, colleagues. Uh, Karen. Я бы хотел сделать такое краткое overview. Right. So I wanted to give a brief overview of the basic principles that uh, basically you've uh, you've covered, and um, uh, try to explain why this is such a, a special experience uh, of the Russian market. Very uh, briefly. The Russian anti-monopoly service has a series of round tables um, to which uh, the market participants are invited. And uh, Fedor anti-monopoly anti service uh, developed uh, a set of rules that we call the uh, principles of bona fide behavior, good faith behavior in the digital markets. It was yet another fundamental report, just like the one that was presented uh, before me. And we sat together at the round table, and we sometimes couldn't come to an agreement uh, in the office of the anti-monopoly service. And people that would lock us in the room and wouldn't let us out uh, before we came to an agreement or a consensus. Because if this, if they wouldn't have done that, probably we would still be without any shared principles. The principles apply to the partners and the users of digital platforms. And uh, they are, you know, the basic, they, they're quite banalities. Uh, do not discriminate, do not manipulate data. Uh, terms and conditions should be transparent. Uh, I mean, no, I mean, it's a, it's a basic set uh, of principles that was already prescribed by the anti-monopoly uh, regulation. But in anti-monopoly regulation, uh, th those principles applied only to dominating uh, entities or uh, I I they, they featured in the provisions on uh, uh, bad faith competition. Our market uh, has a combined uh, means of regulation where uh, government control is combined with self-regulation. If you adhere to the principles, well, well first of all, you do it voluntarily, uh, but uh, by adhering to the principles, you demonstrate your intention that as a digital platform, you intend to follow transparent rules in the market uh, for the partners and for the users. Our market uh, has 
uh, certain special features. It doesn't have many barriers. It's quite competitive. Uh, in almost every area where uh, digital platforms are present, there is competition. That's why the platforms want to compete for partners and for the users. And this can be done only on the basic principles of non-prejudice and uh, openness. In Europe, in almost every sector, you will find one big player. And even if there were, or there would be other competitors, they would be dying out or they would have already died out or something. So in Europe, I think it's not a viable uh, option. You'll be waiting for the anti-monopoly service to come to you and uh, uh, to check you whether you are compliant or not. While here, practice shows the regulation, the current regulation is quite enough. Anti-monopoly service does a good job in re reviewing uh, various complaints and cases. There was the Yandex case, there was the Google case. And regulation, excessive regulation, uh, well, rather, uh, 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 no more regulation is required. Additional regulation, in my opinion, uh, would harm uh, the market by creating additional barriers for the companies. Existing players may start leaving the market if they would be over-regulated. The uh, motivation to innovate in the industry would be undermined. The user experience would be uh, discriminated uh, and uh, well, no one will benefit, uh, to cut the long story short. The very initiative out of which these principles uh, were born uh, was aimed at uh, legal regulation of digital platforms. And in the dialogue with the anti-monopoly service and the market participants, it was decided that additional regulation was not required. At that point, uh, it would be best to just uh, follow the self-regulation in the market um, uh, based on certain rules. Uh, net neutrality uh, was a precedent in this respect. Uh, FAS, FAS, uh, Federal Anti-Monopoly Service, uh, considered that case a success. So we decided to give digital platforms a chance and see how they would behave under these circumstances. It's been six months since the adoption of uh, uh, these principles. It's interesting that everyone is following them quite nicely. People are sharing their own principles and agreements and memos, and they are uh, aligning existing documents with these principles if they were out of alignment or they are adopting new ones. Uh, to make their internal operations more transparent. Another interesting uh, thing that hasn't yet been covered, but hopefully the time will come when together with the FAS we will have done it. What we should follow um, the violation of these principles. So uh, what's the uh, stick that uh, accompanies the carrot? The anti-monopoly service proposed case studies, case reviews at an expert council, and um, based on the learnings to draft lists of good and bad practices. So if there is one platform complaining uh, about the other platform, then these complaints can be reviewed at uh, a case review um, a meeting. And uh, if the practice is found to be a bad one, a detrimental one, then the practice should be uh, dropped. Uh, of course, there is the Institute of Reputation as well, the company that adheres to the principles and uh, declares that is co it's compliant, and then uh, the, the same very company uh, violates it, then the PR risks are also uh, not negligible. Of course, it doesn't mean any, you know, financial liability, but still, it's not very 
Besides, uh, you know, complaints uh, are never nice. Uh, if your complaint is taken up by the anti-monopoly service, it's not nice. It will be known in the market. If the company um, violates the principles, uh, of course, they are not principles of anti-monopoly rules. And of course, the FAS will not treat it as a uh, uh, violation of the anti-monopoly uh, service. Uh, anti-monopoly uh, rules. And there are big companies and small companies uh, who, who subscribe to the principles. We lost connection to the speaker in the studio. It's back. The market uh, without any external influence is uh, designing new tools, the tools to protect the consumers. There are also standards of the marketplaces. Marketplaces adopted the standards and they followed them. This is yet another step towards self-regulation. Today at the Aikido platform, the marketplaces are developing standards to fight counterfeited products. All of them are uh, indicators of self-regulation, which once again confirmed that uh, there is no need for excessive regulation. I mean, you can always regulate at any point. It's never too late to regulate. Uh, but uh, now the market needs to have a chance of self-regulation. So there is no rush. There is no need to hurry with uh, adoption of new regulation. Well, hopefully. Uh, the legislators are of the same opinion because uh, sometimes, uh, I mean, the actions of one big player may lead to the regulation uh, for all. Yeah, it's true, it's true, Karen. Mikhail provided a very detailed analysis of what the ecosystem thinks about regulation and self-regulation. I think that we should judge not by the words, but by the deeds. And in Russia, there are more than one police. We could, I mean, in many uh, countries, you only have American companies, but in Russia, we have national leaders, and many of them become ecosystems. Many uh, decide to to remain digital players, I think we are fine in terms of actual competition. But the numbers that I show, the number of users, the number, uh, the level of uh, involvement, and the money generated by the uh, digital counter, uh, show that the government cannot stay outside of this process. But uh, fortunately, there is the anti-monopoly service, and there is an established dialogue with them. There are rules for communication with the market participants uh, and uh, the players players are in generally in agreement with these rules. I'd like to ask now Yelena Zayeva, head of the Department of Regulation of Communication and IT uh, companies in the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service uh, to provide her comments. Yelena, what do you think? How can we ensure the efficiency of self-regulation mechanisms? What are the sticks and carrots that the governments use? And which do they use more fondly? Good afternoon, colleagues. Thank you very much for your invitation to speak here. It's a pleasure to see all of you, and it's wonderful to listen to all the speakers. As Mikhail has rightfully pointed out, we went um, along with the president of uh, uh, president of uh, net neutrality, we follow the same uh, um, president at uh, uh, regulation.gov.ru. Uh, we place the draft law, we collect the opinions of the market, and then we uh, uh, decided against uh, further development of this law. We 
uh, we had only one meeting uh, about uh, non-compliance with the net neutrality principles, and we were all already ready, actually, to uh, launch a case, an investigation into this. So if you remember, Vimpecom, uh, uh, several other companies were banning each other uh, for... Uh, uh, for uh, targeting uh, the other company's subscriber with their own uh, services. But uh, then, in just three days, we managed to settle this dispute. We managed to stop this competitive war. And it was a wonderful, um, wonderful uh, case, a wonderful principle. So we follow the same principles in case of the digital markets. The uh, participants of the digital markets developed the rules themselves, and now they are monitoring the compliance with the rules themselves. Mikhail has already explained that they are some you know, basic stuff, you call them banalities, and you can't really uh, disagree with the principles. If only you could see how the principles were discussed and adopted, half of the room was against uh, coma in this place, the other half of the room wanted to have a full stop in that place. For some reason, the uh, market participants are still uh, reluctant to discuss any uh, problems or hindrances in the process. We got together in August, we thanked each other for the job well done, we know that there are nuances, so to say, that not everyone have already implemented these principles in full, but we give people an opportunity, we give them time. We understand it's not a fast process, it doesn't happen fast. Uh, why are we different, we think, from other markets and why uh, in the digital uh, markets, uh, from our perspective, it's best uh, to uh, go the soft uh, way? Uh, compared to other industries, that are subject to our regulation. The digital uh, markets are ruled by consumers. Consumers use digital services as part of the ecosystem or outside of ecosystems. But in any case, consumers have enough freedom to use or not to use the service. You can't have a user that comes to the energy supplier and say, I don't like what you do and I'm going to a different energy uh, supplier. You, you can't do that really, but it's something that yes, you can do with digital services. If someone who is shopping on a marketplace can go to an actual uh, brick and mortar shop. Uh, someone who is using a food delivery can also go to a restaurant on foot. You can start reading actual books and uh, talk to your friends in person instead of using messengers or readers. All these digital services can be substituted, can be satisfied by other means. So we think here the uh, pressure put on the services by consumers is a mighty force that reasonable digital services and ecosystems and uh, all reasonables will not be able to ignore. So we see our role in creating the environment and setting the clear-cut rules in identifying the uh, available space, so to say. We want our services uh, not to be threatened by the gatekeepers. When I uh, mentioned natural monopolies, I mean, people talk a lot about ecosystems. Dmitry um, talked about ecosystems, and there were a lot of discussions whether an ecosystem uh, should be providing cross-subsidies to its services. Is it okay if an ecosystem promotes its services uh, or advertises the services or would pu be pushing the uh, customers to use certain services. Well, you know that cross-subsidies uh, are prohibited by the legislation in case of natural monopolies. There were some exceptions. There were some deadlines, for instance, in certain uh, industries. There were some deadlines. 
until which cross-subsidies could be provided and after that uh, they had to be stopped. It is believed that a natural monopoly dominates the market well, this follows out of the definition of a natural monopoly. But since a digital service, from our point of view, is uh, never a natural monopoly, we haven't had at least cases when uh, such a digital service would become a natural monopoly, then cross-subsidizing for us can be uh, treated as costs if the service is developed inside the ecosystem, not outside of it. You can compare it with a long-term loan, right? You can take a, a long-term loan, loan from a bank or you can get the money from inside the ecosystem. In both cases, you, have, you will have to pay it back. Cross-subsidy is not possible if uh, the entity is uh, a, has a dominant position, like a telecom operator. If it's a dominant position in the telecom market, for instance, then you cannot abuse your position to develop adjacent services in other industries, competitive industries. Because this way you have you are getting an unjustified competitive advantage. Otherwise, if such a cross subsidy will ensure in a competitive environment a better customer experience and a faster development of digital services, then we don't see any harm in the development of ecosystems per se. And if we do not see any harm in the development of ecosystems as such, we are inclined more towards self-regulation and the role of the government is to set the direction, to set the goal for the market. Often we hear the question, why don't you follow the European practice? Well, uh, when uh, anything good comes out of European regulation, uh, we will learn from their practice. Of course, we study, study their experience, but we haven't seen any, any uh, major good that would be a better good than what we can achieve with our means here. If the government um, it, uh, if the if the government uh, expresses its attitude to the ecosystem in one way or another, then this say definition, um, well, it would not interfere with anything, but probably it would be a good sign for the market, by which the market would be able to understand how the government is treating the ecosystems. If uh, a legal definition of an ecosystem would uh, exist. But um, uh, to give you an example of real life uh, practice, there was the case uh, back in 2015 when Yandex filed a complaint against Google. We analyzed the market and we stated that Google is the rights owner for Android that is being distributed uh, on licensed terms, not the empty one, but the one uh, that's distributed on licensed terms. And since Google owns this operating system, this uh, reinforces its position, dominating position in the apps market, and it prevents other players from entering the market. So that was our uh, treatment of the case. The barriers are higher because there is a dominating player. The fifth anti-monopoly package was heard by the parliament last week. We were recommended to improve the procedure for assessment of the digital markets. But the broader is the definition, but well, this is my personal opinion only, the broader is the definition, the less 
uh, legal fight that will be in courts. И потом начнется упражнение, а кто быстрее, умнее и красивее обойдет это определение данной закона. When you have a definition that's set in stone, there are, uh, I mean, the, you, you, you get engaged in a new race of um, looking for uh, uh, back doors in, the, in this definition. Yes, thank you very much, Elena, for your um, systemic overview of uh, the system and for, for the perspective of the Russian anti-monopoly service. I'm sure that speakers uh, here will all agree that FAS in Russia plays a balancing role in the market and they take an objective stance on monopolies and they encourage self-regulation. So thank you again. And now I'd like to give the floor to the representative of yet another ecosystem, which is called Azon. Ecosystem became an ecosystem later than others. So let's welcome Alexei Minayev, Deputy Managing Director of Internet Решения, uh, which is the uh, legal name of uh, the Ozone Holding. Алексей has extensive back an extensive background. He used to hold a job in the Ministry of Economic Development in the Digital Economy NGO. He was in charge of developing the digital uh, markets, and now he works for a business for Ozon. Alexei, what are the problems that you see in terms of regulation? Where should the balance lie in the market so that new ecosystems can emerge and so that they can compete with each other? Hello, Sergei. Thank you for your introduction. No, I have not worked with digital economy uh, NGO, but maybe it's something to consider in the future. I'm glad to see all of you, all the friendly faces. I always enjoy participating in discussions that you moderate. I hope that there is a discussion towards the end of the session, given especially that Yelena Zaiva is with us. I was thinking that uh, this will be, you know, your traditional uh, uh, traditional discu uh, discussion in, a, in an audience like this. Uh, the government will be uh, insisting on more regulation. The business will be uh, calling for less regulation. But after hearing Ms. Zayeva, I can see that we take the same perspective on the development of the market. And I wanted to um, stress that uh, uh, Ms. Zayeva demonstrated uh, a profound understanding of the uh, uh, fundamentals uh, in market functioning, um, which is extremely uh, encouraging. We saw the figures in one of the earlier presentations that demonstrate that the consumers, the ecosystem partners, either like or they do not like the service. But we see that uh, ecosystems as a service, uh, they are very much liked. Yandex is not the only company that's growing. Ozone has also been growing for the past several years. Uh, uh, by triple digits, actually. We are not a startup. We employ 45,000 people, but we are still growing by more than 100% a year. It means that this uh, institution, the ecosystems, is in demand uh, by the consumer and by the partners. In our case, when I say partners, I mean sellers, vendors, those who place their products uh, on our marketplace and that can use, they don't have to, but they can use our services such as storage, delivery, advertisement, financial services. Seventy percent of uh, the products that we sell are not ours. They are products of the sellers. Uh, 
свои of some self-employed people handmade вещи может быть крупная какая-то платформа you know selling handmade goods or some of the sellers are quite big in fact in Kazan recently I met a director of a small plant that produce um, chemical products and he says that we have a planning department uh, and since they started selling via Ozone the planning department is at a loss they uh, never knew that they could sell at such a rate uh, what the market what marketplace uh, gives to uh, sellers the sandless shelf which is not fixed or not attached to a particular location you can deliver the product uh, anywhere well if not in the world these days but uh, anywhere in Russia so in uh, that context the regulation should not harm that is the main principle services can be improved and consumers can be protected best by severe competition between the services fortunately uh, we do not have a problem when we do not have any our own services and we only have to use foreign services and we uh, give our money to foreign services and we can't uh, really um, put pressure on them. Fortunately, in e-commerce, there is tremendous competition in Russia. There is not a single player with a share of more than 10%. We see competition between marketplaces Omnichannel retailers are also competing with marketplaces, even if in their niches they are stakeholders and they are selling great quantities so that they can compete with marketplaces. We see that this harsh competition about which Ms. Zaiva spoke when uh, people can vote with their feet and they can vote with their wallets, this competition works much more efficient than regulation that can be avoided that is usually blanket massive uh, and cannot be fine-tuned. So I can only agree with what was said by the representative of the anti-monopoly service. We believe that the market is doing great. Our obligations go beyond uh, what was agreed by the industry, actually. We know that... Uh, even the position of the information uh, intermediary that is part of the law doesn't create as many obligations as we assumed upon ourselves voluntarily. And we did it because we know if that if we didn't do it, we would be losing our consumers. Counterfeited products, for instance. Recently, we joined forces with the biggest marketplaces in order to protect the consumers jointly from counterfeited products. And of course, we will cooperate also with anti-monopoly service. We see that there is demand, and I think that it's not critical, but there is demand for the so-called non-discriminatory access to the platform on the part of certain sellers. So in this respect, we also assume the obligations together with other participants of the market to regulate ourselves, to establish standards of communication with the suppliers. In summary, I think that our perspective on things is very close 
and we are glad that uh, we are supported by the regulators. We'll continue doing an excellent job in providing the services. And once again, thank you, everyone. Glad to see all of you. Yes, thank you, Alexei. Well, this dichotomy that you mentioned, when one, uh, one, one uh, party says we need to have more regulation, others say we don't have we need regulation. Well, uh, that phase was over back in 2019 after the pandemic. We are all rowing in the same boat and supporting each other, and especially uh, given the experience of 2022, we understand that our uh, ecosystems are our national treasure. Of course, we should be mindful of the consumer rights and anti-monopoly laws and competition and everything, but we hope very much that uh, uh, they will be uh, developing. RUNET is getting stronger crisis after crisis. Uh, for us, a crisis is a kind of an inoculation. It's painful at the time of the crisis, but then we get stronger. We are reinforced. And now let's go back to the uh, RIGF studio. Andrei Vorobyov has just sent me some backstage photos. Karen, как у вас там дела? And I am I, 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 really sorry that I can't be there with you today. I wish I was there. Yes, thank you. Um, let's now uh, talk to Demir Salihov sitting next to me. MTS is perhaps one of the best-known Russian telecom operators that is transforming its business into a digital ecosystem. So what is your position and uh, do you have any views that are different from the views of other players? Well, thank you for the question and thank you for inviting me here as a follow-up to the previous presentations. Let me just say that uh, it's wonderful that uh, the regulators, the market participants, the consumers, uh, they fought a lot in the past, but now we all speak the same language and we understand each other uh, clearly. We are an ecosystem, and we have to follow rules that uh, Mr. Tashtipanov and Ms. Saev and Mr. Minayev spoke about. But I wanted to say a couple of words about uh, uh, data and uh, data processing inside an ecosystem. It goes without saying that for any digital platform or an ecosystem, data is its blood. The so-called net effects that ensure the functioning of modern ecosystems and digital platforms cannot be achieved without an efficient flow of data. We talk about consumer data and about consumer data for consumer uh, data for consumers, uh, data about suppliers and for suppliers, data about partners and for partners, and uh, data about the system itself and any other data that can be useful for various business processes. And in this uh, sense, just like other speakers, I can confirm that it's very important to fine-tune all the uh, um, uh, aspects in your operations that uh, perhaps are still uh, rough, and I believe that the market is quite capable of uh, uh, dealing with these issues itself. Um, I mean, uh, all these uh, uh, rougher points, they require a customized approach. In this respect, we can talk about uh, fine-tuning of uh, personal data legislation. Uh, modern legislation on personal data 
не вполне учитывает специфику функционирования экосистемы цифровых платформ. Doesn't take full account of the specificity of digital platforms and ecosystems. There are different mechanisms for identification of customers and uh, collecting their consent. The general logic is that there are several uh, consents. I mean, every time you have to consent to something, you have to give a specific consent. It's very difficult to withdraw your consent. Uh, the uh, whole process of withdrawing your consent for the consumer is not uh, transparent or clear. This creates risks for the good faith participants, and it creates discomfort for the consumer, and it also creates difficulties for the state in terms of government control. The market had lengthy discussions around this matter, and it agreed that there is a need for a shared mechanism uh, for processing of consents, and there is a need for additional seamlessness on these consents between various spheres, including regulated ones. There is another initiative uh, that is interconnected with the earlier one, like the uh, consumer ID, to again um, support easy navigation for the consumer, uh, seamless identification, and easier control for the state. So the, basically the idea is that of a one-stop shop. With ecosystems, the one-stop shops uh, cut the second breath. Uh, when an ecosystem enters an ecosystem without uh, being tied to a specific service or a specific uh, legal entity, and then uh, the uh, consumer uh, enters the ecosystem for a different service uh, that is provided by a different legal entity and, the ecos and tells the ecosystem that uh, that consumer wants to withdraw their data from the ecosystem. The ecosystem knows the consumer and knows which consent uh, is meant. We believe that it's something that will um, incentivize the development of the ecosystems and improve the relations between the ecosystems, the consumers, and the state. Another matter that we think requires additional fine-tuning is uh, data access, personal data. Everything that's digital is, well, say, uh, AI or uh, similar technologies of big data, data sets, I mean, it, it's labeled data. We talk about labeled data. In this respect, there is a need for measures that have an impact not only on uh, the ecosystems and digital platforms, but also on the market as such. But uh, they have the measures will have the greatest practical impact on the ecosystems and the digital uh, platforms. So again, legislation must be improved in terms of access to data sets, both commercial and government. And this whole, um, uh, this whole uh, need splits down into two more um, items. Uh, regulatory and technical. And besides, one cannot exist without the other. And the same goes for access to government data. Ecosystems develop in various directions, and as previous speakers mentioned, ecosystems enable consumers to get a wide range of services and products. Ecosystems compete against each other. They constantly improve the quality of a service and ease of use. And access to government data is an important component of this game. There, are, uh, there is already regulation that uh, enables such an access to some degree, but what is important is that this interaction, well, uh, it, it happens uh, seamlessly uh, from the technological point of view. Uh, data should be uh, received with minimal latency. Data should be relevant. They should be up to date. 
and as a result, all of this effort should lead to more comfort for the consumer. Также хотелось бы об одной важной инициативе под настройки регулирования. Наверное, one other uh, legislation fine-tuning initiative, and probably uh, the speaker after me will focus on it in greater detail, but I will still allow myself a couple of words on it. We are talking about um, sanitized data, impersonal data. Uh, there have been, again, a lot of uh, discussions in the past years as to how sanitized data or impersonal data should be uh, processed. Platforms do accumulate a lot of data of this kind. We have to understand that the positive effects on the economy and for the consumer are related uh, to uh, big data sets processing, including impersonal data. This initiative, again, um, uh, applies to all of the market, but to the greatest extent it will apply to ecosystems. If impersonal data becomes part of legislation, if technical and other standards are uh, adopted for impersonalizing the data, if the legislation resolves this matter, it will also uh, provide great incentives for the ecosystem's development. In conclusion, I wanted to say thank you to all participants of the discussions, especially the Ministry of Economic Development, the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service, and other uh, executive bodies that have always been quite open to the dialogue with us. And it's, uh, we all speak the same language, I can only confirm that. And the role of uh, NGOs and various associations, associations is uh, indispensable. I wanted to thank Digital Economy and uh, Russian Association of uh, Electronic communications, uh, they are both playing a great role in the process. These discussions will uh, continue to Thank you. Yes, thank you. Can I, can I ask a quick follow-up question? Uh, speaking about uh, depersonalization or anonymization of data, this is an important initiative. Uh, however, the subscriber data and ecosystems, I mean, uh, do you know what I mean, what I'm trying to ask you? Well, my answer to this will be quite straightforward. Our objective is to find the best possible solution that would uh, take into account the interests of all stakeholders, and in particular those of the consumers. We understand that telecom data, uh, telecom operators' data, is subject to special uh, protection. Uh, telecom operators are trusted providers, and uh, if a website uses cookies or uh, tracking in, uh, tools, the uh, users have to agree to the use of those uh, tools, and they are not uh, uh, setting, you know, the, their expectations are not very high. But um, if they become subscribers of a telecom operator, they trust that this telecom operator will protect the private data, the personal data of the customer. So that's why we need to start working with impersonalized uh, or depersonalized data uh, of the category that is not subject to special regulation to special protection. We know the position of regulators and legislators, and their position is quite um, 
Это не значит, что мы не можем увеличить данные так, чтобы... Это не значит, что мы не можем увеличить данные так, чтобы 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 мы не можем увеличить
and the mechanisms of data processing or you know the data sets that the ecosystems have in their possession these mechanisms must be implemented at the regulatory level to let ecosystems operate the data that they have um, to a great extent it's very difficult to add anything to the proposals that have already been uh, voiced by the mir the mir was an active participant of the task force uh, at the Russian Union of Entrepreneurs and Industrialists. This work continues, actually, uh, and these uh, task for, uh, forces are still discussing um, the amendments to the laws on personal data, for instance, uh, and uh, similar uh, pieces of uh, legislation free flow of anonymized data and anonymization without separate consent uh, inside an ecosystem. Uh, these initiatives, I mean, uh, you must take them uh, in a broader sense. There are certain depersonalization uh, mechanisms that have been studied by the Big Data Association together with the Russian Encryption Academy. We are uh, considering them in line with the risk-based model, and it seems that um, depersonalized data can be treated as information that can be included into this category of information to enable the uh, free flow, because we still believe that uh, anonymized data with personalized data is uh, a new um, uh, source for the market growth. As to uh, a single consent, again, uh, if you sign an agreement to communicate with an ecosystem and if you have to give just one consent, this will ensure uh, better uh, user friendliness and uh, uh, seamlessness of all the transactions. Probably it will provide for high quality of service and market growth as well. Uh, the developers of artificial intelligence and data-based solutions, access to government data, public data, well, um, there is an attempt now to agree amendments uh, with the Ministry of Economic Development together with uh, the uh, Ministry of uh, Digital Technologies. We are working hard uh, on these amendments, and we hope that the draft law uh, uh, will appear uh, for, will be presented for public discussions uh, shortly, uh, sometime in October. Another interesting question under discussion is the so-called trusted intermediary. This is how uh, work can be uh, organized with impersonalized data so that new services uh, can emerge at the crossroads. Well, actually, uh, here we are thinking already about the future of how different players can um, can interact, how they can uh, perhaps exchange uh, data. For some reason, uh, this is one topic that hasn't yet been mentioned, but it's uh, an important and a relevant issue. We see that around the world there are many projects under development that is are based uh, on regulatory uh, opportunities uh, provided to telecom operators and banks to exchange data between themselves. In our association, we have as members big telecom operators and big banks as well. And it would be interesting to see the products that could come out of the merger of the data between different, uh, uh, different data operators. At the moment, unfortunately, there are no regulatory mechanisms. The businesses are very low uh, abiding and they do not want to uh, go against uh, current regulations, so they are not exchanging the data at the moment, but we would like to look into this possibility and to perhaps agree on the mechanism that would enable these systems and big players to exchange data to, you know, for the benefit of the consumer, for the benefit of, for the, uh, of the state and of the society. 
And at our association, we are discussing this idea of a trusted intermediary that will comply um, with certain requirements in terms of uh, security uh, that could uh, uh, merge the data and provide the services on the basis of contracts with big platforms and ecosystems. Um, so that's these are the areas in which we are working. So uh, to summarize it, uh, I, I believe that today's discussion confirmed the uh, conclusions that were drawn in several reports on ecosystems that were prepared or released in the last couple of years. Excessive regulation is detrimental, but fine-tuning and giving key domestic players an opportunity to uh, develop and design new services and to provide uh, high quality of services to the consumers at the same time, creating additional uh, GDP and making uh, their contribution into the development of the national economy, I think it would be a good idea. It would be quite useful in something on which we focus today. Thank you. Thank you. A quick question to you, uh, Irina. Last year, there were many discussions uh, of data portability, whether data portability should be somehow uh, prescribed in the law, it should be just uh, somewhere in the white books or best practices, something like this. What's the position of your association on data portability? Well, just like in case of ecosystems, the term doesn't need to be uh, entered into a law. I mean, we do not need a definition. Actually, um, like you say, we talk here about big data, right? Uh, how big? And what we must understand that is uh, there is data, the data exists. The legislation recognizes several categories of data, personal data, secret data, uh, government secrets, I don't know. Uh, there are some framework mechanisms already. It's just that we, we need to um, identify uh, the modes of access uh, to this data and the modes of the different categories of data processing. Otherwise, we may be running into some uh, collisions of the law. How much time is left? Uh, about 10 minutes? Okay. Um, in the remaining time, uh, let's uh, try to summarize the discussion. And all the speakers will have about one minute to give their answers. Um, it will be one question to all of you. Um, can you name, say, two initiatives that we can uh, assume next year in the field of ecosystems that we can start, you know, drafting or developing next year in the field of ecosystems? Well, this is uh, mission impossible. Your question is all of the initiatives that we talked about today um, if you look at the results of our research, well, 
you see, uh, most of uh, today's uh, session, we, we talked about data. Data is uh, the key to higher performance, higher efficiency of our operations. Uh, there is a mechanism in Russia which is known as the test uh, legal regimes, and we plan to test uh, several legal regimes here together with the business, with uh, the, the government, like the, these uh, trusted intermediaries and the co consents, we, we plan to have uh, um, experimental projects pretty soon. We, we have planned to have pilot projects with them. Um, OK, what else can I name? Um, we need to facilitate uh, the ecosystem's entry to new markets, uh, including international uh, markets. There are special agreements for the uh, industrial development. Digital, in digital, we do not have any uh, such special arrangements. We must think about it. Uh, there are some unfriendly actions from foreign infrastructures. Many of the domestic companies were using foreign infrastructure. We need to help colleagues to uh, restructure their operations. Some of them are self-sufficient, but others are not, and we need to assist them in uh, uh, countering uh, those negative uh, effects uh, of the uh, current uh, policies. So I, I think that maybe and we should. it's something that we should be doing this year, not, not next year. Very well. Um, Mikhail Voronin is next. Uh, okay, Mikhail is no longer uh, in the session. Elena? Uh, yes, I'm here because this is a lovely discussion. Uh, well, our main focus is competition, therefore, for the digital markets, uh, I'd say uh, one good uh, stimulus will be educating the consumer. We think that uh, extra effort should be uh, spent on uh, uh, improving uh, the uh, consumption awareness. Uh, we need to teach people to be responsible consumers, uh, starting from the kindergarten. So when you um, read the consent form and you see that uh, you are, uh, you agree to share your data with this and that, and. Uh, uh, you are agreeing to almost everything. Very often you do not read the uh, consent uh, agreements, the agreements uh, by, by which you consent to join a certain ecosystem. So when people learn to read the, these agreements uh, of joining a service, uh, I think things will improve. Very well, Narixey Minayev. Yes, thank you. Uh, Demir raised several interesting issues. I agree that uh, even if new regulation is adopted, it should not be restricting. Instead, it should be uh, stimulating. It should be stimulating data exchange, for instance, out of our research. Uh, we know, and this is something that we put into our practice, we, we see that our ecosystem has a great impact on small and medium business. We're collecting their feedback. The small and medium businesses are telling us that we help them develop. We, for many of them, become the only channel of communication with the outer world, with the big world. So it would be very interesting to see how small businesses are using the services provided by ecosystems. You know that there are joint programs today uh, with different government authorities uh, to support SMBs in their presence on marketplaces and how to use uh, different uh, advertising tools like VK, etc. It would be very interesting to analyze that experience. And we'd like to thank you again for such a wonderful discussion.
Карен, я бы Карен, I don't want to repeat what other people have said before me. Все важные вещи скажут со своей, наверное, колокольни. Наверное, ко всему сказанному хотелось бы добавить, что I can only add во всей этой истории очень важен системный комплексный подход. That you need to take a holistic approach to that particular task. We need to understand the impact of different measures on the market. And today, I agree with colleagues that the best thing that can be do can be done is to stimulate the market. If any measures, new measures are adopted, they need to be incentivizing. They need to be providing stimuli. Если Михаил Воронин переподключился. Михаил Воронин, maybe he's reconnected. Yes. Oh, good. Yeah, colleagues, I too do not want to repeat what other people said, but probably I will be repeating them because I I got disconnected at the start of this discussion. Well, anyway, I will be repeating myself, I guess. The most important thing is not to harm today the development of the industry. So we we should aspire to avoid the adoption of any regulation that will damage the industry, and also together with the colleagues from digital economy, we need probably to agree on the definition of a digital platform. Given that during parliamentary hearings around the fifth package, it was said uh, that the fifth package should be uh, extended to non-transactional platforms. So in any case, we are looking at the adoption of uh, a definition for a digital platform. So it's best if we agreed it uh, beforehand. And also, uh, the market analysis uh, uh, should be constantly performed. Irina? Well, um, I think that uh, the priority should be given to impersonalized data or depersonalized data and the consent forms and the national system of data management also as well as access to government data for data analytics and to develop projects in the field of artificial intelligence. And I agree with uh, Dmitry Terstepanov. We are indeed uh, in the process of preparing all the documentation for the pilot project a pilot project uh, for depersonalized data using industrial uh, data in a sandbox. And we hope that the results of this uh, pilot will enable us to prepare the uh, requirements to anonymization of the data for the government. Thank you. Sergey, will you recap? Yeah, sure. Yes, we have, I don't know, one minute left. I'll, I'll try not to take longer than, longer than that. I try to put the discussion together. So please bear with me. First of all, there are more than 10 ecosystems currently developing in the Russian market, which is a lot. Russian digital markets are very competitive. Uh, ecosystems and platforms compete between themselves. Uh, markets are developing new services are entering. It means that the barriers, entry barriers, are uh, next to absent, and it's easy for the consumers to switch between ecosystems and platforms. Users do love ecosystems and platforms at the same time. They are still young, they are in their nascency, and it's very important to regulate their relations. Now the Russian ecosystems and platforms, just like all of the economy, is facing incredible challenges, and they are focusing on the stability of their business non-stop operations, but it's important that in the current circumstances the company should not uh, reject the ecosystem model uh, as, as such, even if it's not profitable presently, because ecosystem 
ecosystem model is for the long run. Ecosystems are, and platforms are important because they create additional opportunities to earn money for the consumers as part of the platform economy. There is data showing that 2 to 5 million people are already employed online. That is to say, they, they are part of the platform economy. This is 3 to 6 percent of the economically active population. And the forecast of growth uh, uh, show numbers up to, of up to 15 million people. Analysts have already um, stated that in Russia there uh, is um, a special regulation of ecosystems. And there is no need for a special regulation, that is to say, and excessive regulation can do more harm than benefit. Self-regulation is preferable. Excessive regulation may lead to slowdown of the development or avoidance of regulation. And analysts also believe that uh, in the current circumstances, one of the focuses of regulation should be support of national players and uh, creating conditions for new uh, stable ecosystems and platforms, again, stimulating, encouraging regulation, not prohibitive. Unlike European countries, Russia has some special features. Uh, uh, because of that, uh, it's important to learn from them, but not to copy-paste. Uh, it's important to take into account competitive practices here and to support uh, Russian companies to also uh, help uh, consumers understand um, ecosystems better, uh, raising their awareness, improving their literacy. Today, more than 2 million people are already employed by the platform economy. Uh, the uh, platform economy contributes to the national GDP. We hope that together the business, the consumer communities, and the government will make the right choice to support the economy with innovations and new business models. Uh, thank you very much. I think it was indeed a wonderful discussion. We spent uh, an amazing hour and a half together. And now uh, back to real life. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, colleagues. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Yes, indeed, it's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. So uh, at this point, we conclude the session. And the next session will be dedicated to content in the Internet. Технологии меняют мир, и лаборатория Касперского готова к этим переменам. Наша экосистема решений для защиты бизнеса – это слаженный оркестр продуктов и технологий. Они постоянно обогащаются лучшей в мире аналитикой об угрозах и дополняют друг друга. С ними вы сохраните устойчивость бизнеса и стабильность ваших процессов. Лаборатория Касперского обеспечит защиту вашей компании в любых условиях. Касперский симфонии. Кибербезопасность в виртуозном исполнении.
Технологии меняют мир, и лаборатория Касперского готова к этим переменам. Наша экосистема решений для защиты бизнеса – это слаженный оркестр продуктов и технологий. Они постоянно обогащаются лучшей в мире аналитикой об угрозах и дополняют друг друга. С ними вы сохраните устойчивость бизнеса и стабильность ваших процессов. Лаборатория Касперского обеспечит защиту вашей компании в любых условиях. Касперский симфонии. Кибербезопасность в виртуозном исполнении. Технологии меняют мир, и лаборатория Касперского готова к этим переменам. Наша экосистема решений для защиты бизнеса – это слаженный оркестр продуктов и технологий. Они постоянно обогащаются лучшей в мире аналитикой об угрозах и дополняют друг друга. С ними вы сохраните устойчивость бизнеса и стабильность ваших процессов. Лаборатория Касперского обеспечит защиту вашей компании в любых условиях. Касперский симфонии. Кибербезопасность в виртуозном исполнении. Технологии меняют мир, и лаборатория Касперского готова к этим переменам. Наша экосистема решений для защиты бизнеса – это слаженный оркестр продуктов и технологий. Они постоянно обогащаются лучшей в мире аналитикой об угрозах и дополняют друг друга. С ними вы сохраните устойчивость бизнеса и стабильность ваших процессов. Лаборатория Касперского обеспечит защиту вашей компании в любых условиях. Касперский симфонии. Кибербезопасность в виртуозном исполнении.
технологии меняют мир, и лаборатория Касперского готова к этим переменам. Наша экосистема решений для защиты бизнеса – это слаженный оркестр продуктов и технологий. Они постоянно обогащаются лучшей в мире аналитикой об угрозах и дополняют друг друга. С ними вы сохраните устойчивость бизнеса и стабильность ваших процессов. Лаборатория Касперского обеспечит защиту вашей компании в любых условиях. Касперские симфонии. Кибербезопасность в виртуозном исполнении. Технологии меняют мир, и лаборатория Касперского готова к этим переменам. Наша экосистема решений для защиты бизнеса – это слаженный оркестр продуктов и технологий. Они постоянно обогащаются лучшей в мире аналитикой об угрозах и дополняют друг друга. С ними вы сохраните устойчивость бизнеса и стабильность ваших процессов. Лаборатория Касперского обеспечит защиту вашей компании в любых условиях. Касперские симфонии. Кибербезопасность в виртуозном исполнении. Технологии меняют мир, и лаборатория Касперского готова к этим переменам. Наша экосистема решений для защиты бизнеса – это слаженный оркестр продуктов и технологий. Они постоянно обогащаются лучшей в мире аналитикой об угрозах и дополняют друг друга. С ними вы сохраните устойчивость бизнеса и стабильность ваших процессов. Лаборатория Касперского обеспечит защиту вашей компании в любых условиях. Касперские симфонии. Кибербезопасность в виртуозном исполнении.
технологии меняют мир, и лаборатория Касперского готова к этим переменам. Наша экосистема решений для защиты бизнеса – это слаженный оркестр продуктов и технологий. Они постоянно обогащаются лучшей в мире аналитикой об угрозах и дополняют друг друга. С ними вы сохраните устойчивость бизнеса и стабильность ваших процессов. Лаборатория Касперского обеспечит защиту вашей компании в любых условиях. Касперский симфонии. Кибербезопасность в виртуозном исполнении. Технологии меняют мир, и лаборатория Касперского готова к этим переменам. Наша экосистема решений для защиты бизнеса – это слаженный оркестр продуктов и технологий. Они постоянно обогащаются лучшей в мире аналитикой об угрозах и дополняют друг друга. С ними вы сохраните устойчивость бизнеса и стабильность ваших процессов. Лаборатория Касперского обеспечит защиту вашей компании в любых условиях. Касперский симфонии. Кибербезопасность в виртуозном исполнении. Технологии меняют мир, и лаборатория Касперского готова к этим переменам. Наша экосистема решений для защиты бизнеса – это слаженный оркестр продуктов и технологий. Они постоянно обогащаются лучшей в мире аналитикой об угрозах и дополняют друг друга. С ними вы сохраните устойчивость бизнеса и стабильность ваших процессов. Лаборатория Касперского обеспечит защиту вашей компании в любых условиях. Касперский симфонии. Кибербезопасность в виртуозном исполнении.
технологии меняют мир, и лаборатория Касперского готова к этим переменам. Наша экосистема решений для защиты бизнеса – это слаженный оркестр продуктов и технологий. Они постоянно обогащаются лучшей в мире аналитикой об угрозах и дополняют друг друга. С ними вы сохраните устойчивость бизнеса и стабильность ваших процессов. Лаборатория Касперского обеспечит защиту вашей компании в любых условиях. Касперский симфонии. Кибербезопасность в виртуозном исполнении. Технологии меняют мир, и лаборатория Касперского готова к этим переменам. Наша экосистема решений для защиты бизнеса – это слаженный оркестр продуктов и технологий. Они постоянно обогащаются лучшей в мире аналитикой об угрозах и дополняют друг друга. С ними вы сохраните устойчивость бизнеса и стабильность ваших процессов. Лаборатория Касперского обеспечит защиту вашей компании в любых условиях. Касперский симфонии. Кибербезопасность в виртуозном исполнении.
Здравствуйте, Good afternoon to you, colleagues, everyone who is joining us online. As you can tell from the title of this section, Russian and World Experience in the Field of Competent Destructive Content. In the next an hour and a half, we will be discussing one of the more controversial topics related to internet regulation, which is content. Internet platforms, platforms today is the biggest news media, although uh, virtually no country in the world recognizes them as such. The biggest shops, the biggest employment agencies, um, the biggest many other things. Uh, what makes uh, platforms uh, different is that they operate content, different content, all kinds of content, and pl uh, platforms can also commit uh, breaches and violations, and mostly these breaches are related to content. Uh, here we are looking at uh, violations of uh, trademarks, uh, for instance, or uh, cyberbullying or destructive content placement, but in any case, the, there are certain expectations that the governments and the societies have of the platforms, namely that the platforms should fight illegal and destructive content. That is why today, during this section, we would like to first uh, try to uh, somehow define a destructive content. Um, we want to see whether there are any universal criteria of destructive content or content uh, can be uh, labeled as destructive only ad hoc, that is to say, under specific uh, circumstances, uh, given the context, and only the audience uh, that is receiving the context can decide whether it's destructive or not. We will also talk about the role of platforms in the fight uh, against destructive content, the role of the government as well, and whether there are any universal uh, approaches and principles with respect to destru destructive content. These questions and several more questions that I hope our participants will be um, uh, asking um, will be answered by Vadim Mampilonsky, deputy head, um, uh, deputy chairman of Rosset, Vladimir Todorov, editor-in-chief of Lenta.ru, Konstantin Golub, uh, GR director of Mail.ru, Diana Akremova, uh, lawyer, uh, I'm sorry, uh, journalist uh, uh, working at the Legal Media Center Republic of Kazakhstan, Geni Zaitsev from Roskomnadzor, Boris Yedidin, deputy general director for uh, legal matters of the Internet Development Institute, and Rifat Sabitov, uh, head of the commission of the uh, Russian public chamber and also deputy uh, general director of VGTRK, uh, the Russian TV channel. So we have a very varied panel of speakers representing internet platforms, civil society, the state, and also um, NGOs from uh, a friendly country of uh, Kazakhstan. Uh, let's start the slides, please. Because um, in the next several minutes, I would like to um, try to demonstrate that uh, since the Internet is a universal uh, phenomenon, uh, the problem of destructive content affects many countries. And for a long time, destructive content meant, in fact, information that was prohibited by the law. Next slide, please. In the European Union, there are guidelines or recommendations on the uh, fight against destructive content, and the definition that is contained therein is the, uh, that destructive content, or illegal rather, content is any information that doesn't comply with the legislation of the Union or the legislation of any member state. But recently, um, the definition has become broader, at least in uh, terms of how it is interpreted, and now it includes 
includes not, not just the legal content, the content that is contrary to the law, but any other harmful or damaging or um, high risk content. There are many different uh, terms that are used which uh, is not prohibited by the law, but they can incur or inflict damage on the interests and rights protected by the state. So when it comes to harmful but legal content, this is where the definition becomes even more vague and practical experience of foreign nations provides us with general definitions such as uh, considerable uh, negative physical or psychological impact produced by the destructive content or information provided uh, by can create this uh, negative impact. But um, who, uh, who is the judge, actually? Uh, who decides uh, whether information can inflict significant negative physical or psychological damage? Uh, we can refer to the experience of the United Kingdom and we'll see that uh, they do not have any specific category of destructive content. That is to say, uh, they've agreed that the um, authorized entity of the UK is going to develop uh, general guidelines identifying um, categories of destructive content, but uh, as of now, uh, destructive content is any content that damages children and adults, and in any case, uh, the uh, matter whether uh, the content is destructive or not uh, must be settled by the service provider. So uh, the United Kingdom says that it's up to the platforms to resolve all matters related to destructive content. Next slide, please. In Singapore, uh, they take a different stance on the problem. Again, we're talking about destructive content, something that is legal but still harmful, and they identified several easy-to-understand categories, and in the future they plan to issue some methodological guidelines that will help qualify content related to violent content, sexual violence-related content, etc., etc. In all cases, in all categories that I'm uh, mentioning, uh, we are talking about content that cannot be banned on the basis of existing laws. So the question arises, what can be done? Again, the experience of other countries, if we turn to the experience of the United uh, States or Canada, tells us that, again, the main role in um, regulating such uh, destructive content is attributed to platforms while the society still has a role to play because it's the society, the civil society must in some way uh, decide on where they stand with respect to destructive, destructive content and um, articulate their ideas of what should be included into destructive content. I know that Rosset recently carried out a research uh, studying the attitude of the Russian society to destructive content, and there was also a research of the international experience. Uh, let's uh, give the floor to Vadim Ampilonsky. Vadim? Uh, yes, my sound was off, sorry. Thank you, Anna. Probably you know, or probably you do not know. If you don't know, I'm going to tell you. Rosit as an, as an NGO, uh, not-for-profit organization, I received this year a grant, a government grant, to uh, research uh, disrupt, disruptive, uh, destructive uh, content. And we are uh, working under this grant to produce analytics that will help us perhaps define uh, disruptive or destructive content. Uh, it will help us uh, understand whether or how much the Russian audience um, understands and what it understands about uh, destructive content and what is its attitude towards destructive content. Not long ago, Rosset performed a sociological study, a poll. Let me share the slides with you. In July 2022, 
We uh, did research, uh, we did real sampling of users of, of Kontakti and Odnaklasniki. It was a quoted sample of 1,218 respondents, out of them 46% were men, 54% were women, and here you can see the distribution of this sample by age groups uh, and also by federal districts. 68% uh, of our respondents were from VK and 32% were from Adnaklasniki. What did the results show? The majority of the respondents um, had experience of destructive content in the Internet. 75% uh, said yes, uh, they uh, encountered destructive content uh, online. And we also asked questions about regulation of destructive content, uh, something that is not illegal, but something that is high risk. 82% of the respondents said that such uh, legal but destructive content should be banned or access should be restricted. 70% said that uh, there is a need for a scientific classification that will help us differentiate between destructive and non-destructive content. 52% said that destructive content should, uh, should be uh, shown to the uh, uh, minors uh, for education purposes. So this is an interesting figure. Uh, you may think that it's uh, pretty controversial, but still uh, you can see that many users believe that more than half of the users actually think that destructive content can be shown to the uh, minors uh, in the process of education. But obviously uh, it, it shouldn't be shown you know, on its own, but it should be uh, applied with commentary from the adults uh, explaining uh, what's destructive about this content. As to the uh, knowledge around destructive content, 39% said that they know what destructive content is, 61% said that they never um, came, uh, that they have never come across uh, the notion of a destructive content. Well, probably it's this phrase that uh, among specialists has already become a commonplace destructive content, I mean, for the greater audience is still, is still, is still not familiar. And the users also provided uh, the uh, interpretation of destructive content. 25% uh, said that it's content that's antisocial, something that's destroying the personality. 21% said it's misinformation or fake news. 18% negative content. 11% propaganda of aggression and uh, hate speech. 5% amoral. 5% harmful. 5% illegal. 4% useless. 4% manipulation, provocation. 2% political content. 18% uh, of the respondents uh, meant something else by destructive content. At the same time, a considerable number of users said that the following categories fall uh, within the notion of a destructive content, like um, animal violence, 75%, LGBT, BT propaganda, 70%. I hate to uh, families, 68%. Um, child porn, 68%. 53%. Radical feminism, self harm, 52%. Uh, romanticizing violence, 47%. Child free, 46%. Shock content, 36%. Ultra, uh, ultras, uh, very movements like um, uh, football fan uh, ultra movements 25 percent and again eight percent uh, further eight percent said that they did not uh, or oh, they uh, meant something else under destructive uh, content as to uh, their own experience with destructive content, 34% uh, say that they I see this kind of content every day, 24% uh, uh, say that they see it every day, 14% uh, several times a week, 9% several times a month. Those 
who uh, meet such a content on a regular basis, uh, uh, they accounted for 75 percent of our respondents, 14 percent of uh, the users never, never had any experience with destructive content. What um, uh, is uh, what is actually um, uh, good is that uh, Many users complain about destructive content. 41% uh, of the respondents of those who uh, have experience with destructive content uh, sent complaints to the platform, 2% complained to Roskomnadzor, and 51% never complained. Uh, so um, the source of the response to the res uh, destructive content in their minds is uh, the administrators of the platforms. 29% of the respondents note that after the complaint, the destructive content was blocked. One quarter did not get any response. And many users say that uh, this response is not efficient, uh, especially uh, men who live in the northern Caucasus and in the Far East. But in any case, uh, there is dynamics there and it's positive. That is to say, if if you look at the uh, findings of the previous studies, uh, well, I'm not going to sh share it with you at the moment, but uh, just take it from me that the number of content blocked after the user's complaint is growing year on year. 73% of the respondents believe that uh, the spread of destructive content should be restricted. Uh, it should be restricted uh, by the legislation, that's 52%, uh, without censorship, another 21%. So uh, generally 73% believe that this content uh, must be barred from the audiences uh, by means of legislation. And only 5% said that, from their viewpoint, there is no need to block any content online, including uh, the socially destructive content. And as I have said while commenting the previous slide, most of the respondents think that the response should be coming from the website moderators or uh, the moderators of the resources where the content is uh, distributed. 49% at the same time believe that uh, the regulator and the censor should be the state. At the same time, like I said, 21% said that uh, there should be restricted access to destructive content, but without censorship. In any case, 49% of our respondents think that it should be banned by the government. 82% said non-banned destructive content should also have restricted access. 43% say that it should be um, restricted for all users, and 39% say that it should be restricted only uh, for minors. As to regulatory measures that can be uh, used to stop the spreading of this content, the users uh, say uh, ban and blocking can be used, 44%, 21%, uh, it should not be recommended to the users, 16% labeling, again, uh, blocking is seen as the best means of regulation. As to prevention, uh, the users say that uh, there is a need for scientific classification. 70% say that there is a need to have a scientific classification of destructive content. And 10% said that examples of destructive content should be shown to children with a commentary from adults while 
просмотра. А, 38% say that miners should never see destructive content. I don't want to uh, stop, I mean, I don't want to dwell now on uh, this uh, piece of the presentation uh, about how uh, much the content is, is spread on the platforms, so um, how much it's present on the different platforms. I just wanted to uh, say that these, uh, uh, this research uh, uh, cover not only Russian platforms, and it's something that we intend to do for us to understand how content is disseminated, the content of various um, categories is disseminated uh, on different platforms. Together with the expert community, we are going to build a classification. Uh, we need to further study Yandex 10 and YouTube that is still not blocked. So the uh, picture uh, that we see uh, from this last research shows that most of the Russian users accumulate on uh, the platforms that were included into this research. Vadim, uh, the results, the findings are very interesting, uh, especially I was surprised by the categories of destructive content. I never thought that, for instance, child-free is uh, destructive content, uh, because for many people uh, it, it is indeed uh, destructive content. Even those categories, uh, again, uh, that were shown on one of your slides, uh, pose uh, the question as to who is going to um, be the judge of destructive content. And another uh, item of your research is that uh, many people believe it's the, that it's the platforms that should uh, take action against um, the destructive content. So I would be very happy if you could stay with us for the subsequent discussion and talk about these things. But now I'd like to pass the floor to mail.ru, Konstantin Golub. Uh, so what is uh, mail.ru's uh, practice of uh, countering or moderating uh, or restricting destructive content? What are your proposals, uh, how we can combat destructive content? Uh, blocking, yes, I mean, everyone understands that. But what about downgrading and rating or something, uh, labeling uh, the content? Uh, what else? What is it that you do? Yes, hi, uh, thank you, Anna. Hello, colleagues. After Vadim's presentation, I wanted to add uh, a few positive words to this discussion. From our perspective, things are not as bad as uh, you may conclude from these numbers. Uh, VK, uh, which includes Vkontakte, Adnaklasniki, social media, and even Zen now, uh, we take our role very seriously. We uh, care about protecting our users from um, from uh, uh, criminals, and we ensure fair moderation of content. Our objective is to create the environment that will be safe for, for the users and the environment where they can get uh, accurate information. In our social media, there is um, zero tolerance uh, for violence, propaganda of uh, child porn, um, drugs, uh, violence, uh, everything that goes uh, against the law. And you have to understand that we function not only in Russia, our social media are available in many countries of the world, and of course we comply with the legislation of uh, our countries of presence, and we block the materials that either violate the rules of the platform, or if there is a, a decision of an authorized body or of the court. And this allows us to uh, stay um, objective in terms of content moderation. But to go back, on to your uh, introduction um, of this topic. Uh, it is quite controversial, I agree. For instance, we um, inside the company, we're not ready to talk about destructive content. Statistically, it is not an accurate term because not all content can be um, characterized uh, as such if it does not violate the law. Our audience are dozens of millions of users
users and the content that they place reflects the social processes that are most relevant in the present times. Um, uh, social media is a mirror to the society. Uh, there are hundreds plus a million users of the internet in Russia, and of course everything that happens in real life ends up on social media. So for your understanding, what Dim's sample, if I understood it correctly, was to um, poll 1.2 thousand uh, users, while in Vkontakte more than 6 billion units of content were published in Vkontakte and most of the materials that were uh, violating the rules of the platform or of the legislation were blocked before any of the users could see them. So in relative terms that's just 1 percent, but we are talking about hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, units of content, of uh, doubtful content. Russian legislation um, prohibits many categories of content. It doesn't have many uh, um, many uh, blind spots, really. Uh, I mean, it, it's quite, it's quite uh, comprehensive in this respect. And, uh, from our point of view, uh, additional regulation is uh, not necessarily necessary, because uh, otherwise we may be facing very subjective criteria what destructive content is or is not. So we would prefer to talk about uh, contestable content, perhaps. Uh, for us, this is a, a term that is easier to understand. If illegal content never reaches the user, uh, the content that remains online uh, stays there because there is a request. It means that there is some request, a demand coming from a particular group uh, for it to be there. Child free is destructive be for a certain group of users, but for another group of users, it's not. It means it, it doesn't mean that it's good or it's bad. It means that there is demand for this kind of content from a particular part of the society, from a particular uh, group. So a banning a particular content does not eradicate this phenomenon from the society and doesn't uh, prevent spreading of the content. People will find a way to discuss it, will find a platform most likely will be a different platform in the internet, period. So um, in this respect, uh, in terms of terminology and uh, our specific actions, we try not to block the content, but rather to restrict access to this content. We think and again, you can tell this from Vadim's numbers, uh, about 20 percent uh, are against censorship. Uh, this is a, a principal point, really. Uh, we uh, we believe that we should not uh, um, prevent the users from uh, deciding on the information consumption. We should decide for them uh, as to which information that they, they, they should uh, consume. But again, all illegal content is definitely out of the question. Of course, it, it is banned. Um, we are experimenting with various user mechanics, and in this respect, we can identify perhaps three main approaches. We work with technologies, we work with users and their complaints, and we also work with the means of uh, entry or access. We call it hybrid moderation. We think that organizationally and technologically, this is quite an efficient uh, uh, method that together with uh, the user complaints and fine-tuning of our information systems enables us to quickly uh, remove uh, all unwanted, uh, all controversial content from uh, the site. We use proactive monitoring of uh, harmful content, and this happens 24-7. Uh, we also have the technology of digital prints or fingerprinting. Uh, if uh, the pre-moderated content and uh, removed content uh, people try to publish again, uh, then this content uh, this content will be quickly uh, removed. Uh, it can also be uh, not just destructive content, but content that violates uh, 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 copyright. 
Волсен в контакте и в Одноклассники. Мы экспериментируем с алгоритмами, которые идентифицируют calls to cause death or violence, and such messages are removed automatically from the communities. We have 12 million uh, communities that are testing uh, or that tested this function. Only less than 2% of these communities decided against using this or keeping this function after the pilot test. So that happened in uh, Vkontakte. While in Adnaklasniki, the neural networks are also identifying messages of hate speech in public comments and uh, but uh, those messages well, well that, that information the findings of the neural networks help moderators take uh, human decisions uh, well, the decisions are taken by the humans to go back to Vadim's presentation 41 percent if I am I took it correctly, um, took it down correctly, 41% um, of the respondents, uh, they uh, use complaints mechanisms integrated in the platforms. Um, it's not that the users uh, see us as a source of managing the content. They see us as a mechanism of action, rather, because it works, and moderators respond very quickly. Given 6 billion units of content a year, uh, we respond at a, a rate of one to two minutes uh, after the complaint is filed. Uh, so you may think that moderators are not doing a great job because they're not uh, deleting all of the content, but to go back again to the start of this conversation, we cannot remove all of the borderline content, you know, but I'm not going to give you any examples right now, but if you take the uh, whole uh, universe of uh, illegal information and the universe of uh, Mooted information, then it means that this questionable information is uh, is necessary to someone. And if people in the uh, Northern Caucasus do not like the child-free philosophy, it doesn't mean that the moderators must heed to that complaint immediately and remove it, because there is another category of people living elsewhere that need this information. And that's why in 2021 we also redesigned the complaints function. We tried to make it more user-friendly. The categories. Um, of uh, applications, they were reshuffled uh, and uh, redesigned. Uh, we are now offering uh, templates, uh, really, and categories of complaints. And now uh, also there are references to particular questions uh, we are explaining uh, to the people in frequently asked questions uh, what, uh, how the um, moderation service works and uh, which complaints can be filed, cannot be filed. Then. Um, in general, we see uh, quite a good response from our users. And last thing, perhaps, that I need to bring up at this point, since we are talking here about some arguable content, we are um, trying to experiment with uh, limiting access to this content. For instance, uh, during the pandemic, you could see it quite visibly when many communities emerged uh, around COVID-19 and uh, particular information could not be verified quickly. Uh, therefore, we introduced labels containing alerts, an alert label. I mean, um, you could read a pop-up label uh, that uh, referred the users uh, to the information that was already verified by the WHO and other authorities. So we saw a good response to this practice, and we spread it out to vaccine negators and uh, to uh, HIV um, uh, groups. Um, so now you can see you can see these uh, these pop-up windows uh, with uh, an alert message. We never welcome any um, evil content. You, you may think that I'm uh, trying to justify it. Well, of course not. Uh, we are trying to implement the techniques that will inform uh, the user um, as to what he or she can expect. For instance, in Vkontakte, there is a special uh, there is uh, um, uh, 
в Одноклассниках появился... Это плаг, или блур, который дает warning to the users. If um, uh, neural networks uh, determine that, say, there is an 18-plus content there, um, the images will be blurred, uh, the initial images. Uh, so, it, I mean, you cannot restrict all processes in the society. And yes, information today can be easily spread. Uh, therefore, we believe that we need to be introducing um, tailored approaches to different types of content, and uh, we should be working with information as if it were information, not anything else. I'm a parent myself, and I think it's not just the platforms that are responsible, should be held responsible for the uh, perceptions of the children. It's also a matter of parent control. There are many different uh, technologies today available that give uh, various tools in the hands of the parents. Thank you very much, colleagues. Um, Thank you very much. I have a question uh, to you. Algorithmic literature, uh, well, uh, sorry, algorithmic audience is uh, a term that you find often in specialized literature. Um, so uh, what matters is not what is placed, but who sees what is being placed. And it's not a secret that it's the platforms who decide uh, who is going to see this or that information. Um, so uh, what do you do about algorithms, algorithmic audiences? Uh, for instance, uh, so that a category of, say, children never comes across a particular piece of information. Of course, sure. And uh, many people tend to forget about this positive side of algorithms. The algorithms can be used not to display particular content to particular groups of, um, of uh, users, of viewers. Uh, and I never came across a complaint uh, against destructive content uh, that was shown to someone who never subscribed or consented to seeing that content. Well, thank you very much for giving us this information. It's interesting to hear directly from the platform as to how they um, deal with this uh, um, contentious content, if you will. It would be also very interesting to hear how this content is regulated in Kazakhstan. Because the freedom of speech versus protection against uh, destructive content is uh, relevant and an urgent matter. So uh, please um, welcome Diana Kremova from the Legal Media Center in Kazakhstan. Hello, colleagues. I hope you can hear me. If you can't hear me, please let me know because um, my internet here is not very stable. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you. I know some people personally, uh, others are new new people to me uh, just two hours ago uh, Central Asian I, uh, IGF uh, opened in Kazakhstan we are going to be meeting for the next couple of days and I decided um, well I tried to feed both forums into my schedule I am not sure I'm going to give you any new information today I want to um, pre-warn you that uh, I am um, uh, employed uh, by a um, a human uh, rights uh, organization, so I'm always on the side of the society and of individuals and against uh, unjustified uh, restrictions in the Internet. Just like in many ex-Soviet Union countries, the Internet here is regulated by the state. Uh, the state often acts in the paternalistic fashion. The state sense to think that it knows best uh, what's good for the people and what's not and they're trying to regulate everything that can that they can regulate uh, it's very difficult of course to uh, be an efficient regulator in the internet given the uh, pace of development of technologies and the spread of information of course there is a long list of illegal content uh, in the country which covers everything that probably is covered by the legislation in uh, Russia like terrorist and extremist information 
Commission uh, calls to uh, coup d'etat and uh, things like that. And then there is also this uh, wonderful provision in the law on telecom that in case of some emergency allows the government to restrict access to the internet and to block content. And this shutdown, this is exactly the shutdown that happened in the country in January this year during the well-known uh, gas uh, uh, protests uh, in the country well when the government shut down the internet in all of the country for several days. And besides, there are those uh, blockings uh, uh, for which no one is held responsible when we talk about destructive content. Usually, uh, political information is blocked. That is to say, no one... Uh, um, no one uh, admits uh, to performing the actual uh, uh, which is um, uh, the, the information uh, that, that is blocked, no one admits uh, as to who is blocking this information. Um, now, there is this the law uh, on protecting children against cyberbullying. Last year, the lower chamber of the parliament initiated the adoption of this law, and when they published their ideas, the civil society was shocked because they uh, offered radical measures. The Ministry of Telecom was to get extensive authority on uh, blocking the content if there are uh, any uh, signs of cyberbullying, then the ministry would be able to block the whole social media in the uh, territory of Kazakhstan. They also wanted uh, to make social media to open uh, official offices, rep offices in Kazakhstan uh, to be headed by a Kazakhstan national. When uh, this draft law was published, uh, the this caused a surge of um, indignation in the country and a uh, public campaign, uh, civil society campaign started. There were publications in the media which said that uh, this, these proposals were in breach of international principles. They were in violation of the various uh, human rights and freedoms. There were several rallies in uh, Almaty and Astana. There were several uh, well, publications, like I said, criticizing this idea, and eventually the higher chamber of the parliament rejected these, uh, this uh, draft law. Uh, they introduced amendments, rather, into the draft law, and they um, restricted the authorities of the Ministry of Telecom and introduced a commission that it was to be attached or is to be attached to the ministry uh, and that will uh, consider uh, complaints of cyberbullying. The commission is to be composed of the representatives of the civil society and one other uh, people. And if the commission decides that indeed there is uh, cyberbullying and it can be dangerous to children, then this information will have to be uh, blocked uh, or uh, removed. Now, um, when it comes to uh, social media and platforms, our ministry announced that there was um, a, an agreement reached with the social media uh, that uh, the media did not have to open the rep office in Kazakhstan, but instead uh, there should be a representative. So uh, as of now, there should be a representative of every social media in Kazakhstan that uh, if uh, there are any problems, that person will have to uh, liaise with uh, 
the Kazakhstan authorities and solve the matter. And another interesting uh, part of the story, when our parliament wanted to adopt uh, the law, they claimed that there were many complaints uh, to Google in particular, or about Google when we analyzed the nature of these complaints, it turned out that 41% were the complaints of the government of Kazakhstan uh, against the uh, um, criticism of the um, uh, government. Uh, and only 4 or 3% of all the complaints have actually uh, pertained to cyberbullying. In addition to blocking, what, what are other means uh, to restrict access uh, to the information? Well, um, the General Prosecutor's Office uh, regularly uh, reminds uh, the uh, Kazakhstan presidents about the uh, liability uh, that is contained in the criminal code of Kazakhstan for the spreading of fake news, for instance. Another thing. Anonymity. Anonymity uh, sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. In case of uh, political uh, commentary, people tend to leave their comments in an anonymous fashion. And websites switch off. Uh, comments altogether when anonymity was prohibited on the website. But now uh, people are commenting on the social media today. Every news uh, uh, agency has uh, uh, a presence uh, on Facebook, and all the comments are now uh, on Facebook. So all the commenting now happens in uh, Facebook while websites are losing the eyeballs. People prefer now to give get uh, content from social media rather than directly from the news websites. Uh, destructive content. Uh, I um, try to um, re refresh my memory uh, about uh, what caused uh, uh, most of the discussions in Kazakhstan recently. For instance, there was the anti-vaccine uh, 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 movement uh, healers, healers as well, um, like folk practices. Uh, I don't know whether this can be called uh, destructive content. In uh, the Kazakhstan laws, there are no uh, definitions of uh, destructive content or disruptive content. Um, and I'm not sure whether, say, uh, advertising of healing services can be called destructive content. Well, in any case, I'm sure that punishment alone never works. I think what works much better is improving media literacy and uh, digital hygiene and critical thinking and uh, teaching people to be more selective active in a way in terms of what information they consume. Uh, for instance, child-free. Child-free is it's just a matter of uh, people's ability to analyze information and the ability of people to find uh, good sources, reliable sources of information, uh, synthesizing uh, the information uh, out of uh, different sources. Uh, I think that's the only way not to be led astray by destructive information or content. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to this forum. Thank you, Diana. That was very interesting. And thank you for sharing with us uh, your vision of alternative measures, because the um, in, in Russia, blocking uh, or, well, yeah, well, basically, blockings are the main tool of dealing with uh, uh, unwanted uh, information. Please stay with us till the end of the session, because we'd love to have you during the discussion. You uh, said something 
something that Constantin also mentions. Uh, you, uh, just like him, uh, are saying basically that if the information is not illegal and if there is demand for this information, then for those who are looking for this information, we cannot uh, ban access to it if we are talking obviously about uh, adults, about uh, people who are of age and know what they are doing. But about children, you have to ask yourselves why children want to find information that is not suitable for, for their age. Why are they interested in destructive uh, information? And here I want to pass the floor to Vladimir Todorov because they did an interesting reporter study uh, wanting to find out the reasons uh, of the uh, attractiveness of the destructive content. Yes, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Hello, everyone. And thank you. Well, we as journalists, we have to uh, come across destructive content every day. Or oh, maybe it's not destructive content, but it's destructive for some uh, categories of people. I personally have a lot of experience of uh, communicating with destructive content because in 2016, I uh, organized a big research of of um, a teenager's suicide. If you remember, uh, there was this big uh, scandal, uh, the blue whale, and as a result uh, of this uh, research, uh, we found a person who studied this community. Uh, uh, later, I will tell you, I'll give you more deta de details. Uh, we also did research of the drugs uh, sale on Darknet. We had two big journalists uh, uh, investigations of how this is done uh, in Russia and uh, how uh, in in uh, uh, Russia one of the major uh, marketplaces for drugs uh, emerged, which was recently uh, closed down, not by Russian law enforcement authorities, but by the German ones. And in Russia there are two uh, main uh, approaches, like my colleagues have already uh, said, in terms of uh, uh, destructive content. Well, first, for the first one is self-regulation of the social media. This is what Constantine was describing when social media themselves are monitoring uh, the content using algorithms, and as a result, the content is either um, removed or uh, the content is somehow downgraded. Um, world practice shows that uh, this approach alone is not enough. Why? Because the audiences are very wide. There is a lot of content as well. There is content that can be destructive potentially, and it's not subject to current legislation. There is much more content of this kind, and it's very difficult to interpret such content and uh, assess it within a short period of time. If you look at Instagram or Facebook, um, which are blocked in the Russian Federation and because they belong to the Meta Corporation. Uh, usually they use the method uh, where first the algorithm kicks into action and then the uh, contented content is submitted to a moderator's review. Based on the available data sets and the algorithm's decisions, well, the, the idea is that it will learn in the future, but um, and there are few moderators, so they're acting in this two-step process. Uh, there aren't enough human uh, moderators, never have enough time to take high-quality decisions, and Instagram, Facebook probably will have to hire 10 or 20 times more moderators uh, to uh, review all of the content by hand, and of course the companies just can't afford it. And another um, option is government monitoring or public monitoring, uh, and if the platform doesn't respond to their urges to downgrade the content, to block the whole platform, just like it happened with
with Facebook and Instagram. Unfortunately, this approach alone, too, does not work, because uh, if there are people who have uh, a demand for destructive content, they will find it elsewhere, they will find it in a different service. When this uh, destructive content, even you don't need to even uh, block the whole service itself, you just need to downgrade the um, content. Uh, for instance, in China, porn is a band. Uh, you can't watch porn in China. Porn, uh, according to the Chinese government, uh, corrupts the population. Does it mean that the Chinese have never seen a porn video in their life? No, they are using a file exchanger. Um, it's one of the biggest apps everywhere in the world uh, where people are sharing their porn videos. Or VPNs. Five, seven years ago, a VPN was the technology for crypto anarchists and punks who were afraid that the government uh, uh, carrying out surveillance over them, they are these fans of uh, Julian Assange and uh, Edward Snowden. But now VPN is every man's friend uh, when we are trying to access websites or apps that are uh, restricted in Russia. Uh, what I'm trying to say, if there is demand for destructive content and the government is trying to restrict it by blocking it or downgrading it as a result, the uh, those who uh, want destructive content will be able to find it, but they will be using marginal methods. What I mean to, uh, to say is they're using special means that the government will be um, not able to control, and they will be atomizing as well, and they will be in the smaller, they will be present in smaller communities that you can't control, I mean, all of them, like Darknet, for instance. If you think that there are people who are uh, there just um, to stash drugs somewhere. Well, no, Darknet is a big culture. They have their own memes. They have their own uh, uh, chats, calls chats in uh, Telegram or in um, uh, Jabber. Jabber is a special uh, messenger, encrypted messenger. So this is a culture, and this is a very strong culture with strong ties. If you download Jabber and you talk to someone on Jabber, it means that uh, you you are part of this community, you are part of this culture, and it creates those ties, uh, horizontal ties, between people which are much more dangerous because people will be able to coordinate themselves outside of the more conventional means of communication, and the government will never be able to stop that. Here is a key question. Since I'm a reporter, and one of the key objectives of reporters is to put awkward questions to the society, uh, the questions that the society uh, will have to answer, one way or another because the questions are too awkward not to be answered. So my awkward question to you is, where does this demand come from? And Konstantin also mentioned it. Where is this demand coming from? Um, people are looking the, uh, for the destructive content. Whether you like it or not, in Russia the anti-drug laws are very strict then why you get the biggest marketplace for drugs here in Russia? It operated in thousands of cities in Russia. Columbine is banned in Russia, the that movement, but just a couple of days ago there was this tra tragedy in Izhevsk. This, this person shot children and people at school. The person never could have gotten access to the uh, guns. He should not have had access to the guns, and yet he had guns, he had uh, ammo, and he came and he shot those people. So suicidal culture, dark nets, child-free, I mean, everything that Vadim mentioned in his research. In fact, if you look at it uh, from uh, a long distance, they are teenager subcultures of a new level, in a way. Zoomers, the Z generation, who were born with smartphones in their hands, Basically, their communication is very radicalized. Their, their um, 
entertainment is also quite radical. And in those subcultures, the teenagers are drawn out of solitude and um, of, out of not being understood. They are not being understood by their parents at home. Uh, you come to uh, you come to your parent and say, uh, I, I got a wonderful help in the book. What, what are you talking about? It, people, I mean, people speak different languages. They are not understood at schools because uh, teachers belong to a different generation. They do not understand what younger people live uh, in. Basically, they can't even establish tr uh, trustful relations between each other. You can't create trust if you do not understand what the other person is saying, right? You don't speak the language. Besides, many of these teenagers are bullied at school. They are bullied in person, they are bullied online, and teenagers, when they grow up, they don't quite understand what to do with their lives. So I go to the university, but what's next? Where are those social elevators, as they are known? And those teenagers who are weaker, well, no, not weaker, bad word, um, more vulnerable in terms of their education and upbringing and uh, nature, character, they can't get qualified uh, psychologists help because in Russia even today you do not get proper school psychologists every time there is a school shooting case people talk about school uh, psychologists but instead of focusing on developing that institution uh, the uh, uh, guns restrictions are are adopted so that's why uh, children go into those groups to find like-minded people and they support them with the advice the best advice that they can, like uh, a suicide or a school shooting or um, ultra soccer fans, because we will be fighting everyone you will learn to fight with us. The same PPMA. Uh, uh, out, out of, I mean, you, you go fight uh, in a fight club and you make money, you, you get fans as well. Darknet, the same. Quick money and respect from uh, your classmates. So I think that we need to establish better work with the younger generation. I'm not talking about values now, you know, some ephemeral things, but I'm talking about more tangible things, like teaching teachers, explaining to them what interests the younger generation, working with parents in a systemic fashion, explaining to them how children should be brought up in the 21st century, the institution of school psychologists and trust. Well, until we have all of that, nothing is going to change, and destructive communities and destructive content will continue to emerge in large quantities because people who are aged 14 or 16 today, they will grow up, they are already producing content, and they are replicating this model. And the positive uh, agenda and the positive content will never be able to break the trend. So if the social media are going to block the destructive content, the only result, the only outcome of this practice will be further atomization and further marginalization of these practices. I hope you all understand the problem. And I hope that it's up to us to find the solution. Thank you very much, Vladimir. Um, now, Vladimir, you raised a very interesting topic. Of course, destructive content and fighting it uh, should be uh, done, you know, for the sake of the younger generation, for them not to see those negative examples. I mean, everything you say is absolutely true, but um, this uh, then uh, requires a certain action on our side. I'm a mother and I understand that, yes, I need to talk more to my children and I need to offer to them um, new ways of spending their free time, for instance, uh, in addition to computers. Well, I shouldn't be just reproaching them. Oh, you are at your computer again. Go read a book. I understand that that uh, is wrong, but uh, children and parents, they need to understand what other options are available. And here, I'd like to 
to uh, to uh, ask Konstantin whether he knows, and I know that platforms can categorize teenagers as a user, so if a teenager is searching for strange information, but uh, the platform would propose something different. Uh, uh, if the, uh, say, a teenager is um, searching for school shooting information, uh, what uh, the platform uh, is suggesting instead is, uh, I don't know, asking the question, are you feeling bad? Do you want to talk to someone? I, I don't know if you understand the question. Yes, I believe, uh, I believe I do, and I think that uh, this is how the platform is evolving, in fact, because uh, everything that I have uh, already talked about, like uh, here is the contact number of the uh, law enforcement agency, or here is information from the WHO, or here is a warning, please be careful if you want to proceed with your request. I mean, uh, we are already doing that. Whether we can also add uh, a hotline for a psychologist, I guess, yes, sooner or later, uh, platforms will get there. And the question to Vadim, if he's with us, when we were discussing how this uh, destructive content can be identified. And of course, there is a lot of content uh, that is um, doubtful, uh, like uh, uh, obviously um, a woman's chest on the website uh, dedicated to uh, um, breastfeeding uh, will be quite appropriate, uh, but a woman's chest uh, on a school website perhaps will not be uh, a good idea. So, uh, Vadim, uh, how would you comment all this? The government, you, you know that for a long time I worked in the uh, press service of Roskomnadzor, and we were uh, receiving a lot of uh, complaints uh, from uh, the uh, residents about the content that was not directly uh, illegal, but that caused concerns. And of course, the government, if it's not in touch with the uh, public organizations, with the businesses, with specific people, or we, we can't do our work properly. We uh, analyzed the incoming complaints, and yet, uh, even among them, there were some complaints that stood aside. And I mean, for instance, the uh, story uh, of the um, uh, people who, uh, you know, tra train hoppers, uh, train surfers, uh, it's something that was uh, spreading uh, several years ago. So a uh, business contacted us. Uh, it was the uh, local trains company, and they had this huge problem with train uh, hoppers. Uh, they they uh, posed a lot of danger to the uh, local train's uh, infrastructure. There were several deaths of those train hoppers a month. So uh, for this uh, company of local trains, this created reputational risks and also caused damages because they had to stop movement, uh, they had to stop the traffic of trains, and they had to change the schedule, etc. So this created both tangible and in intangible uh, damages uh, for the company. They were thinking about what to do with this problem for a while, and eventually uh, they came to Roskomnadzor. Their lawyers analyzed the situation. They realized that there is no direct uh, uh, prohibition of such a content. So we uh, carefully uh, reviewed that. Um, application. I remember that we uh, invited experts um, uh, to uh, propose uh, a course of cause of action. We talked to Rospotrebnadzor, uh, to another authorized agency that was uh, um, uh, responsible uh, for uh, analyzing 
the information on uh, potential means of suicide. So yes, they uh, told us that uh, train uh, hopper content can be construed as uh, demonstrating the means of suicide, uh, which is information that is banned in Russia. So uh, upon the conclusion, upon the opinion of uh, the experts from the uh, service that protects the rights of the consumers, Roskomnadzor acted, and we included this uh, information to the list of prohibited uh, information. And since there were cases of death, it was not just uh, some deadly entertainment, it was deadly in every sense of the word. We were um, working with the uh, trains company that uh, identified those pieces of information. We also worked with the uh, digital platforms, the social media, like Vkontakte. They um, responded quite positively um, to the initiative, uh, although Again, uh, regulation-wise, uh, it was uh, a borderline matter, so Vkontakte was very constructive about that, um, and uh, they cooperated. So, uh, yes, this information uh, should still be on the register, so to say, it should still be banned. I don't know, maybe the platforms are self-regulating uh, in terms of this information, but several years ago we set up this tripartite um, cooperation. And uh, as a result, uh, well, in, in the year when we received this uh, complaint from the trains company, they had 18 deaths a year, and now uh, there is only one death a year. Now, th that's very interesting. Vadim, thank you very much. So basically, there was an uh, evolution, the destructive content that was not uh, illegal, but the government interpreted the uh, content, decided that, that it was uh, illegal, uh, basically, and not destructive, and included it on the register of illegal content. Our next speaker is uh, Boris Yedidin, Deputy General Director of the Internet Development Institute, and they study content regulation. Boris, maybe we forgot some entities that should be involved in regulation of destructive content, or maybe some processes were left outside of our attention. Boris, over to you. Hello, colleagues, and thank you very much. And uh, all the presentations were very informative, very interesting. I'm going to uh, perhaps focus on the proposals, on the suggestions, because since this is an Internet Governance Forum, probably you will want to recap the uh, what you do to summarize the uh, experience and uh, to convert it into some uh, a practical uh, proposals. Uh, before we proceed to takeaways, I suggest that we uh, look back at uh, 2012. That was 10 years ago. The year was remarkable because the uh, Mayan calendar predicted the end of the world in 2012, but at the same time, in that year, the law was adopted that restricted access to illegal information. And at that time, the legislator identified three categories of information that was subject to blocking. The first one is child porn, which is absolute evil, everyone agrees, then drugs, so any information about the uh, distribution of drugs and the means of taking drugs, and also propaganda of suicide. These three categories of information affect the health of teenagers, they affect the uh, growing up, and at that time, 
wasn't it? Uh, I mean, uh, everyone it? agreed mm. that uh, well, that's how uh, it should be done. And then what happened next? Uh, already next year, the legislation was amended. Our colleagues mentioned that as well, because there was a lot of violence on the social media. The law was amended, and the new category of information was introduced into the law. In 2014, materials about casinos were also banned because uh, generally new legislation with respect to casinos was adopted in that year in Russia. In 2016, they also added a new category related to psychotropic substances, not drugs specifically, but not the chemicals, chemical compounds. That could affect the mental state of people, teenagers. Then again, in 2017, they also added blocking of uh, information on the sale of alcohol. In 2018, information was blocked that was aimed at involving uh, minors into uh, illegal activities, for instance, and train hopping. Then, out of court blocking was added for the illegal distribution of uh, medicines and veterinary drugs. So, by 2020, 10 extra types of uh, uh, banned information were added to the list. At the same time, the General Prosecutor's Office could now block 15 different types of information without a court order. All of these pieces of information are related to the security of the state or uh, protection of the health, of uh, life, uh, of uh, the residents, or the protection of the constitutional regime. So from a clear-cut list of illegal information that everyone agrees is illegal. And I mean, when I say everyone, I mean everyone in the world agrees it's illegal. Uh, we ended up with uh, a, uh, a patchwork of uh, pieces of information that could uh, be related uh, to uh, economic activity, like the sale of medicines, or the production of the state, or the uh, health and life of humans. And Constantine has already explained that these uh, uh, sites, the um, social media themselves, they uh, are developing their own moderation techniques, and they can block additional information that, according to the rules of that platform, uh, uh, is, uh, is um, undesirable. So in this environment, we can conclude that the current mechanism that is part of the law the mechanism that the government uses to counter illegal content. And by this I mean that there should be a law which uh, describes the type of illegal information that uh, prescribes a particular body that is responsible for monitoring this information, that prescribes a 
uh, process of decision making on uh, how to ban this information. We understand that it takes time, it's a lengthy uh, and a burdensome administrative process, which is quite costly um, at the stage of adopting the law and at the stage of its implementation. So information about involving minors into illegal activity that poses threat to their life and health it was not you know uh, it's not like it, it just emerged in 2018 it wasn't like uh, there was this year in which this information uh, emerged. Of course, it existed before that, and this information uh, was somehow countered either by the government or by the platforms. The initial mechanism of combating illegal content was established six years prior to introducing that type of information into this mechanism, into this law. Or, for instance, spreading the information about the manufacture of uh, uh, guns and uh, armament. Again, it took nine years uh, since the establishment of the mechanism itself. To introduce that particular piece of information into the law, for nine years the information was in some gray area. The platforms will be saying that the information is not legally prohibited, therefore we are not obliged to block it, and the government cannot decide under which criteria to take the decision to uh, make uh, relevant amendments to the law, in addition to the 13 types of uh, illegal information which is contained in Article 15.1. There are many initiatives that are currently being uh, discussed or uh, processed uh, by uh, various uh, uh, public uh, bodies. So it seems like the process exists for the process sake. The nature of the information is still the same. It's still destructive in its nature. It's just that using a bureaucratic procedure, we are trying to legalize and yet another bureaucratic uh, procedure of recognizing the information as illegal. In many cases, its illegality is quite obvious. It's undisputed. Uh, but we are creating additional administrative burden onto various authorities and financial burden as well, uh, because this requires additional information systems and uh, mechanisms of internet monitoring and the decision making, and you need people for this. The government should not be doing it. The government should be taking managerial governance decisions, not enforcement decisions. So uh, in the scope of current regulation, we have to follow this procedure. First, there should be a law, then around this law, an administrative procedure is built, while in fact, we already have centers of competence in the area. And for me, and Konstantin spoke about this at length. For me, these centers of competence are internet platforms because they have the resources, because they build algorithms, they create monitoring programs, they uh, introduce policies of how this or that resource should be used. They have every opportunity to efficiently counter the dissemination of any content that is illegal or that is contentious. Of course, there are cases uh, which are arguable. And of course, it's difficult for the platform to be ultimately accountable, really, for this differentiation, for, for judging uh, the matter. 
because it's not the main goal for which the platform was established. They exist for a different purpose, but again, I believe that the government uh, should not be just banning information, instead the government should help the platform decide in um, arguable cases. There is a prototype of this mechanism. It's part of the law on self-regulation of social media. It's the responsibility of the social media to remove questionable content if there is doubt in a particular case then the social media contacts the government. It's part of the existing legal framework. And of course, it means that the social media will be reacting only to the information that is already uh, considered illegal. But I think that this is a good prototype. It's a good uh, mechanism. Mm, that could be used instead of administrative regulation. I think self-regulation works better, and uh, the social media, the platforms, they feel the pulse much better, so to say. They uh, know uh, what the users make of this or that content better. And as part of their own rules and capabilities, they uh, have the recommendation algorithms, for instance. They have every ability to more flexibly respond to different content. For instance, if you know that the residents of the Northern Caucasus are not uh, tolerant of particular content, while the same content is welcomed by other regions of Russia, then why not not spread this content in the Northern Caucasus and let uh, people have access to it from other Russian regions. The discussion shows, again, that sometimes it's difficult to differentiate illegal content from destructive content. And much has been said today about platforms and sites that disseminate uh, information. But in fact, there is another entity that, from our point of view, uh, today was left outside of our attention. And uh, the uh, government uh, is also not considering that particular agency. But uh, we are talking about registrars. We understand that content is mainly distributed via platforms, but content can also be distributed via web websites. Uh, I don't know, there are pirate uh, sites uh, that do not respect copyright, for instance, or uh, there are websites that offer uh, you know, illegal uh, financial services, phishing websites. Again, the government can't be everywhere. Social media have nothing to do with these processes. So I think that the registrars have a role to play. There is a whole industry of uh, organizations that are responsible for registering domains online. And when they register a casino, 3-topara, 3-axis, and then 3-axis, uh, uh, one, three, axis two, three, axis three. Well, uh, probably there is good probability uh, for the. I mean, there is a good chance that the registrar will uh, understand what the purpose of this website will be. And in this way, the registrars can uh, engage uh, in uh, uh, preventing the dissemination of destructive content, but also uh, the uh, preventing the dissemination of the content of uh, you know, selling illegal services, selling counterfeited products, uh, fraud, etc. 
So again, we believe that righteous trust are also very important, as important as the government, social platforms, they too should be responsible for the content found online. Thank you. Thank you, Boris. That was a very interesting presentation. Registrants as potential entities of content regulation is a good solution, I think, uh, potentially. Uh, we have one question from the audience. Uh, it's a question addressed to all our uh, speakers, and we have very little time left, but I think that the answer is already found in um, Vladimir Todorov's presentation. So here's the question. Do you agree that uh, uh, we should better build brains than fences, and more effort should be invested into educating people rather than prohibiting content? Are there any urgent measures that can be taken? Because education, upbringing, uh, that takes time. But are there any urgent measures, Vladimir, that you see that can be taken? Vladimir? Yes, sure. I think that uh, education, enlightenment even, is uh, the critical task. There should be a methodology, there should be guidelines, but we must understand that the guidelines alone will not save us. Guidelines should be written by the people who understand what they are writing, they should be knowledgeable about the subject, and they should be uh, distributed to the educational facilities and to the parents, but just giving them the brochures is not enough. There should be uh, training organized uh, 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 there should be trainings uh, and if we want to work with the younger generation where do we start well I suggest that we start with school psychologists right now there is a discussion of policing the uh, Russian uh, guards uh, in all schools but instead of uh, having uh, part of the uh, national uh, guards corps uh, personnel in every school. Instead, let's have the uh, psychologists. Today, schools are really big, I mean, in size, and there are very little psychologists working there. Uh, psychologists can create at least some trust. So the teenagers in school will know that there is at least one person there who they can talk to and who will not uh, report to the uh, director, who will not report to the parents, who will not disclose this information uh, to to anyone else. You, you, you can start there. Thank you very much, Vladimir. Thank you. Our time is running out. And I would like to thank all speakers who were able to join this discussion today. I found it very enlightening um, for the government and for the uh, civil society, for the platforms. I think uh, we can uh, see our approach to destructive content clearer. Uh, we understand that probably it will take some regulation, what Boris suggested suggested updating the self-regulation law so that uh, this area would also be made part of the self-regulatory effort and other measures as well, non-regulatory measures that uh, will be welcomed by the civil society. The important thing is that we do not just take a new law, uh, adopt a new law, but uh, uh, get, get tangible results out of this work. Thank you very much for being with us. Технологии меняют мир, и лаборатория Касперского готова к этим переменам.
Наша экосистема решений для защиты бизнеса – это слаженный оркестр продуктов и технологий. Они постоянно обогащаются лучшей в мире аналитикой об угрозах и дополняют друг друга. С ними вы сохраните устойчивость бизнеса и стабильность ваших процессов. Лаборатория Касперского обеспечит защиту вашей компании в любых условиях. Касперский симфонии. Кибербезопасность в виртуозном исполнении.
Здравствуйте. Мы продолжаем 12-й форум Artificial intelligence and its communication with humans and control uh, of the humans over AI will be talking about humanitarian and technical and regulatory uh, problems of a human agency in uh, artificial intelligence enabled internet. Today, with us, uh, in this session, we have online Alexei Neyman, Big Data Association, and Janis Namov, the Sberbank AI Center. Fyodor Lukyanov will be joining us a bit later from the Patriarchal Commission for Family Affairs Protection of Motherhood and Childhood. Helena Suragina with MTS, Ekaterina Potapova, Center for Training Leaders and Digital Transformation Teams. Uh, from uh, Ranepa and uh, Yuri Zvekov from Skoltek. Hello, colleagues. Хочу немножко задать, наверное, тон сегодняшнего обсуждения. And welcome. Мы особенно в том. Let's I know, set the mood for this uh, discussion. A uh, year ago, two years ago, we had uh, lengthy discussions of uh, uh, ethics. In artificial intelligence, uh, the code of ethics was adopted, uh, and we also talked about delegating tasks uh, to artificial intelligence together with Sparebank. Uh, we did a special research uh, in this area at the Internet Research Institute. So uh, let's about the future. See what has already been achieved, and uh, let's try to look into the future and um, try to envision what uh, the internet will look like, what the services will look like in the future once AI is fully integrated. And what will be the impact of artificial intelligence on humans, uh, whether it will be negative or positive. I would like to start with Yuri, perhaps. And uh, let's start with the following question. What is the current level of interaction between humans and an AI, and what does the future look like? Okay, I'm looking forward to this discussion. I'm the first speaker, and I will uh, allow myself a quick excursion into the uh, past um, to understand better why AI matters so much today. I think artificial intelligence is the new oil. In hindsight, in the last century or so, we have seen several technological explosions, so to say, that uh, transformed uh, the lives of the societies. Uh, well, actually, two centuries ago, uh, there was the uh, century of the steam, then there was the automotive, uh, changed the uh, century of oil, but uh, the 21st century probably will be the big data um, century and the century of artificial intelligence, a technology that um, it penetrates uh, the uh, reality uh, today and uh, it pierces the reality really and um, we shouldn't be afraid of AI, we should uh, uh, try to come to terms with it, understand it better. We know that any technology can be used for the good or for the bad, uh, take uh, energy and its progress in the 20th century. We know that the peaceful atom is uh, a good stimulus for the development of the economy, while the same atom, the split atom, can, be, uh, can uh, create a global 
a catastrophe. The same applies to AI. AI is a tool, and it's the experts and the developers of artificial intelligence uh, who should uh, take uh, that tool responsibly. And the artificial intelligence in its current shape uh, is pretty weak. It's not here the strong AI that can replace humans, but even a weak AI is quite a powerful instrument uh, that can generate a lot of impact. The digital space, the internet is the area where AI is present in most of its iterations. It has penetrated the solutions that uh, run the internet. Therefore, uh, what is required is regulation and responsible behavior of all actors. From my perspective, AI will determine in the next 10 to 15 years the future, the development of the digital space. It's not just my um, opinion. Uh, these are the estimates of uh, both Russian and foreign analysts. The approach to which we adhere in this country, which is related to ethical use of artificial intelligence technologies, is supported by the majority of all stakeholders. Therefore, I am optimistic about the future. The important thing is that we do not lose the grip and uh, regulate the field as the need arises. Just like other technologies are regulated today, the technologies dating back to the 20th century, in the same fashion, artificial intelligence will be regulated. And our task is to set the stage for this transition. We should not interfere into the uh, technological progress. And on the other hand, we should a safeguard of humankind. Okay, quick follow-up. In the present legislation, there are already certain restrictions on, say, automated processing of data. Uh, when data is processed in a completely automated manner, uh, even today, the legislation says that there should be humans who take the ultimate decisions and that will have an impact on humans. For instance, that's the one of the uh, fundamental ideas of the law on private data. Do you believe that for this technology to develop, we'll have to uh, get away from this restriction, or it will remain a fundamental provision of legislation in the future? Well, I think that uh, we must, uh, we, we, we we, we must um, believe that a technology can never be a subject. It is always an object. It's a tool uh, rather than an actor. And therefore, not always the current uh, legislation of Russia or any other country can cover all aspects of digitalization and artificial intelligence operations. The decisions, the ultimate responsibility, I think, um, is with the developer or the operator or the user of an artificial intelligence system, that is to say human. And of course, the responsibility can differ depending on the system itself and its coverage. If it's a closed loop system, for instance, a uh, uh, self-driven uh, cars are operating somewhere in the uh, far north where there are no people living, that's one thing, but operating um, uh, self-driven um, automobile in the heart of a city, that's a completely different uh, story. And going back to the cars, it shouldn't happen uh, the same way as it was happening in the 20th century when mass production at the Ford plant, and you remember that Ford was the first to introduce a conveyor system at the start of the 20th century. So um, after uh, the cars became cheaper and more available, um, uh, and, and at the same time, there were no licenses, there were no uh, traffic rules. This created chaos in the cities, in the streets of the cities. Uh, so it would be best if we would not 
we would not uh, delay the adoption of the uh, relevant uh, rules. I think Andrei Niznamov, a colleague, will uh, explain how uh, soft law and self regulation is developing today so that the society and the developers and operators of AI systems are better prepared to the time when uh, their developments will be introduced into everyday life. Of course, we cannot expect that the government will be able to quickly regulate the current level of a technology, usually the governments, uh, there's a lack uh, uh, between the emergence of uh, technology and emergence of a law. But still, if we are prepared, we'll be able to mitigate a considerable number of risks and threats. We'll bring them uh, to a lower level once these systems are introduced into civil operation. It's Andrei Neznamov. Andrei. Okay, let's uh, hear from um, Andrei Neznamov. Uh, Andrei, what do you think about short-term and long-term risks of artificial intelligence? Well, I may not be uh, exactly in uh, uh, the trend, and you may think that it's uh, not popular. Well, I'm going to say uh, will not be very popular with you, but I'm uh, concerned that this is the only technology, the risks of which we are discussing. AI, just like electricity, it doesn't exist uh, on its own. Just like electricity, AI has a material uh, uh, manifestation. And when we talk about risks or regulation, we usually mean some specific material forms of uh, artificial intelligence. Take your car navigator or take your search engine. It's a product that you use every day that was produced or that was optimized with the help of AI. We are talking about some very tangible, some very practical things. So the first um, uh, step that we need to take, and I'm, I think that you will agree uh, with the above premise, so I think the first task, the first step is to introduce a reality filter, a reality filter that will separate abstract risks and abstract ideas from the practical use of artificial intelligence in life. One of the key reasons of why we need such a filter is that artificial intelligence has its roots in popular literature and in movies. It's not like with robots, where well, the very word of robot was first used in a sci-fi book, but AI has a particular um, origin in the Dartmouth Conference and such, but AI is not just the winners of Spelov's work. Uh, Terminator, uh, Wally, this is not... Uh, scientific uh, work. Uh, people do not perceive this as science, a scientific product. Instead, they, uh, people think about AI risks in the shape that this AI was presented to them on TV. So AI and machine learning and what people expect to see and what they're afraid of, there is a huge difference between the two. And this is the greatest risk for the future of this technology. One of the most popular topics has always been the artificial intelligence uh, going berserk and destroying the mankind. Why uh, does this uh, idea is so persistent? Well, it's because people think of AI in the way that was presented to them in books and on TV. In a certain, um, uh, to a certain degree, 
this theoretical risk exists. Yes, um, this theoretical risk exists, but it is a faraway risk. And when these theoretical risks become a regulatory risk, uh, huge problems arise. One false step and your technology is uh, halted. Um, probably you know that often I use red flags in my presentation as an example, but there are um, more down to earth examples like regulation of self driven cars. You don't have infrastructure, you don't have regulatory infrastructure to test uh, your self driven prototypes in your country. And it means that your startup will migrate to a jurisdiction which already has the relevant laws. I think you can stop anyone on the street and that person will tell you that the future is, uh, well, it belongs to self-driven cars, but as soon as it comes to introducing the required legislative infrastructure uh, for the development of these technologies, uh, we, uh, you know, we, we come across some prejudices, we come across some wild ideas in the countries where people treat these technologies in a practical way, they get a competitive advantage. If people start assessing theoretical risks and move cautiously, um, these countries are not getting their national manufacturers, they're not getting advantages. I do not want to name specific countries, because, and of course I'm not going to uh, say uh, where Russia stands, but it's something that we have seen time and time again. I think that the biggest risk for AI today is to make sure that all the positive aspects of these technologies could be in a practical way be used for society, for uh, countries, for people without uh, or um, without having to protect this uh, technology from unrealistic, from some fantastical uh, risks. Uh, colleagues from Yandex, uh, they uh, keep evangelizing about AI, explaining to the people what AI is and what it isn't. I think our main task is to generate trust and to explain which risks are real and which are not. I'd like to argue with you, if you don't mind, just a little bit. I agree that many of the problems are imaginary or they come from pop culture. Uh, they are not real. But for me, the biggest problem is, and yes, we understand that uh, people's literacy uh, in terms of technology is at a very low level, but I think, well, in, in any case, even regardless that low level of uh, technology literacy, uh, the technology is being implemented everywhere, but uh, do you think that eventually uh, we will find ourselves in a world where there is a case of engineers who understand how these black boxes work, while these black boxes are ubiquitous there, everywhere. So this knowledge gap, or oh, I don't understand how the knowledge gap can be breached, and do you think that the knowledge gap will expand? Well, I think that um, you make sense, what you're saying makes sense. But basically, my idea is that AI is just one technology that transforms our lives, and it should be taken in the context with everything else that exists today in the modern world, like smartphones, the internet, meta-universes, data flows, NFT, cryptocurrency. This is very important. And why I think that all of this should be taken together, because this knowledge gap exists everywhere. I uh, changed oil once in my very old car. I changed oil. I, I did it myself, but uh, if I am to change the oil in my new car, probably I wouldn't be able to do it. Or even if I did it, probably um, I would mess up with it anyway. I don't understand how uh, uh, 
a CT or an MRI machine works. There are 8 billion people in the world, and there is a huge knowledge gap already. We do not know a lot of things about our world, and it is the world of technology. At least those billions who live in uh, uh, developed, highly developed countries, they are surrounded by technology. We are afraid of AI. Hey, well, you don't understand how your car battery works. You don't understand how your smartphone works. Will you be able to fix it if it breaks down? How many of our colleagues are explaining where the data is going? Very few people know how the data actually flows, geopositioning or confidentiality settings. And at the same time, we demand that next to every AI system, there is a person si uh, sitting explaining that this is uh, uh, such and such algorithm and um, this is such and such. Uh, uh, this is such and such uh, learning, like reinforcement learning or something. We will have to start with some basic stuff, you know, um, before we do this. If we want to understand how AI works, we need to understand what physics is, what chemistry chemistry is. Uh, we'll have to go back to school with our children. I think the important thing is not to overkill it. Uh, yes, I'm all in favor of understanding technology. I'm all in favor of being able to explain technology in plain Russian or English. If someone is deciding my destiny, I want to know everything about that uh, mechanism or object or technology. But the important thing, again, when I talked about risks, sometimes we overkill it. Very well, in our studio with us, we now have um, uh, Fyodor Lukyanov uh, from the Patriarchal Commission for Family Affairs, Protection of Motherhood and Childhood. Thank you very much for coming here. We are discussing technologies and ethics in technology. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, since technology is something that affects the society, uh, the church should also have a position on this. Uh, there is religious ethics, there is mundane ethics. So uh, where does the church stand with respect to artificial intelligence? Thank you very much for inviting me. Пролонгированные во времени сегодня, потому что действительно пока общество еще не имеет понятия ни о слабом. Today uh, the society knows very little about weak artificial intelligence, strong artificial intelligence. It will take time before uh, there is a general understanding of this technology. On the other hand, there are some uh, moral axioms, and as long as we remain human, uh, the axioms uh, still apply. So the uh, church uh, and as a member of the uh, Russian Orthodox Commission on Bioethics. Um, I can assure you that uh, people should still be guided uh, by some uh, fundamental ac moral axioms that make uh, humans human. Andrei Niznamov was very right when he said that very often AI is, uh, um, uh, is turned into a legend, into a myth, something, um, uh, something inconceivable, but uh, on the other hand, uh, there is love, there is mercy, which are only possible in the society where um, people are free, where uh, humans are free. So I, um, at this point, I can refer to uh, a writer, a real genius, uh, Hans Christian Andersen. Uh, whenever we talk about artificial intelligence, 
Вот интересно, we, потому что именно этот писатель... Мы uh, 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 about The Matrix, the да? movie, and да, you remember that Neil's surname was Anderson. Well, that in its turn reminds me of Hans Christian Andersen, who wrote fairy tales, and fairy tales has many more dimensions than just one, the plain fictional dimension. So if you remember one of his fairy tales that starts with um, a troll, a troll, a real evil troll, very angry uh, troll. Uh, he had his school and his students created a mirror that reflected everything. And eventually there was not a single country, not a single person who would not be reflected in this mirror. And some things that were good in life were diminished in this mirror, but the bad things were enlarged in the mirror. It's an old fairy tale, but it reminds us of some of the modern algorithms, and we know in which products they um, are embedded, but it's a problem, don't you agree? One thing is when a child Uh, sings a song, that's one thing, uh, but if um, uh, the child is singing the same song uh, naked, for instance, the algorithm will probably push it to the very top, and the more shocking the content, the higher are the chances that the algorithm will uh, start uh, offering it to the users as a priority. And to go back to the fairy tales, today there is not a single thing, like the Internet of Things, right? So again, uh, to go back to the uh, mirror, everything was reflected in the mirror, but the troll wanted to bring this mirror to the very sky so that the creator and its angels would be also reflected in the mirror. So there is this scientific, academic um, uh, 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 pridefulness, arrogance, uh, um, when uh, some scientists say we want to understand God, we want to demask God. And They brought the mirror to the sky, and it fell out of their hands, and it hit the ground, smashed into thousands of smithereens. And one of the smithereens got into the eye of uh, a boy, and that is how the uh, Snow Queen starts. What if AI is delegated the decision about our health and reproduction. We understand the efficiency of AI in managing logistics or transport or energy supply. Of course, uh, maybe some uh, um, health care decisions can also be uh, It can also be delegated to AI, but not all of them. So if there is a risk when artificial intelligence becomes a subject to the law, an entity of itself, maybe artificial intelligence will uh, decide that our existence is no longer economically viable for the system and the euthanasia should be um, applied. We know that Beethoven had many different illnesses and perhaps uh, uh, As a child, uh, uh, would not be considered fit to live uh, according to some um, parameters because some people are uh, already deciding for small uh, uh, children uh, whether they have the right to live or not uh, if they are living on palliative care. Uh, in this humanless system, if you remove humans out of the system as a, a subject, as a decision maker, uh, we will end up uh, with uh, some, I don't know, Nazi regime, really, if we give all the authority to AI. But um, uh, it's, uh, um, unfortunately, uh, today, it's not uh, the artificial intelligence that takes the decisions. Uh, they are still in the hands of humans. We are still capable of deciding the rules under which even artificial intelligence is going to act. And again, to return to the words of Andre, are we putting ourselves into some closed loop? What is happening today uh, in different cities around the world? Columbine 
on Purim, Kazan, uh, Izhevsk, what's happened recently, uh, all the terrible things. It's not a secret that people are following a certain template, and people who are um, you know, performing those terrible deeds acquire a fan base. It's like a sponge, this phenomenon. It uh, uh, replicates the experience, uh, the experience of, uh, of sets. Uh, uh, well, that experience. Uh, so, uh, the network uh, scares us, but and we say that, okay, let's put more guards to the schools, let's uh, attach a camera to every child, but uh, we are um, forcing people even further inside this closed loop. Do we need to create these systems that replicate the negative experience? It's a, a big problem. We see that in the network, I mean online, there are 150,000 crew or groups with destructive content, including in Vkontakte. This is unacceptable. We know that uh, children are under the influence of this content, and I met parents of um, school children uh, who committed suicide because they belonged to these uh, groups promoting suicide. And um, that kind of, I mean, regulation, of course, it should be based on uh, principles of ethics. The company uh, that manages a platform should uh, sieve through the content and sort the destructive content out. We need to try to break out of this loop and instead of limiting human freedom, we know that fear provokes, just like it happened after 9-11 in the United States, it provokes uh, the uh, uh, restriction of legislation. We are making people more vulnerable. The personal data, I think that this is a very sensitive topic. And the responsibility for disclosure of uh, personal data and leakages of personal data should be uh, intensified uh, for all the authorities. Uh, uh, it will not slow down progress, but this is objective reality. We know what deep fakes are. We know that today uh, people's um, appearance, people's voices, people's uh, ID data, everything can be forged. I don't want my data or the data of my children to be flowing free in the internet. So regulation is required, legal framework is required, and the basis of this regulation should be ethics, the ethical obligations or commitments to the population we should guarantee to uh, the residents that their personal data will not be abused by the uh, fraudsters. Why my data is leaving, you know, somewhere? Why is it going to this or that uh, body or entity? So uh, governments and humans today are defenseless uh, before the owners of algorithms. Transnational corporations, they dominate over states these days. Often the government can do anything if a big transnational corporation comes to its territory. We understand, for instance, that children should not be uh, let play in the construction grounds, for instance, so they shouldn't play in the wastelands, uh, landfills, because of security, because of their safety, and similar restrictions should be um, introduced in the internet. Um, so, um, morals, ethics are the cornerstone of regulation. If we uh, do not um, have a uh, shared ethical code, then the owners of algorithms will construct their own ethics. It's a big temptation. Today, 
if uh, you see a child pushing a kitten, for instance, will say that it's bad, it's animal violence, but uh, online this may be perceived differently, this may be perceived as a flash mob or something, and we know that such things change the uh, ethics of people and things that were not um, permissible before uh, become permissible. So our families should be normal families and children should be free in choosing their life trajectories and therefore we must agree on a common ethical code or code of ethics. We know that this work is already being done and we want this code to be uh, just a moral declaration, but rather a law with relevant bylaws to have some binding legal force so that we will be able to control its implementation for the sake of our freedom. Very well, is my understanding correct then? That often unconsciously even, the developers copy human behavior and not the best behavior sometimes uh, because of bad quality of data, for instance. Then we should be talking not about the ethics of uh, artificial intelligence, but instead the professional ethics of developers of AI. Because, say, doctors have their ethics, or lawyers have their professional ethics. Similar communities have their ethics, so probably the developers' community should also have their ethics. Yes, exactly. This is done by humans. The uh, God gave us this ability to be creative. We should not uh, try to uh, replace the creator, the God, because whatever we do would still be a mirror, just a mirror. But um, it can be an assistive technology, but it should not never be above the society. It should be just an assistant. But of course, AI is developed by humans, and I agree with you that uh, there is a need for ethics of artificial intelligence. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite now Yelena Suragina. As far as I understand, she prepared some slides. And Yelena, are you ready? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Hello, everyone. It's good to see all of you. In fact, I will um, continue along the same uh, lines. But before I do, I wanted to show you uh, the place of this humanitarian aspect that I see in the whole system and why today, because of the development of artificial intelligence, we are so concerned about the future of human life. The internet, big data, and AI produced a big bang and we were transferred into the new real. As part of this new um, uh, normal, uh, we usually talk about three aspects of control over the use of this technology. First of all, there is the programmatic and technical control, and in this respect, we talk about transparency and explainability of algorithms and accountability and controllability of the service or the uh, technology to humans. The second group is is legal control, the so-called legal control. And here we talk about the accountable person, the fair distribution of responsibility. And the last aspect of it, the last week uh, here, which was already mentioned in various contexts uh, by my colleagues, the ethical control. And um, uh, conformity of these developments to the uh, morals and the values of the society. Uh, I believe the control should be set on uh, the, uh, should be set on the balance of opportunities and risks associated with the technology. Obviously, the golden middle is always hard to find, but it's the most uh, efficient uh, 
place. It's the hot spot, so to say, and uh, the um, AI uh, code of ethics um, operates the notion of risk-based approach. Let's um, now turn to the uh, aspect of the humanitarian control. And again, I will be referring to the code. Item 1.1 says that when the actors develop AI technology, they should make sure that the technology enables the development of all potential uh, capabilities of uh, humans in the social, economic, and spiritual sphere. And all key values should be taken into account. The AI should contribute to uh, the development of the cognitive potential of humans and uh, the creative potential and should preserve a spiritual and cultural values. So that sounds like um, an elegant declaration, but um, I see real meaning behind these words because at one point I um, came across an interesting experiment and I wanted to tell you about it. This is a still face experiment, or mother's still face. Uh, it's a well-known experiment uh, from uh, the middle of last century, in fact. And at one point, it was um, banned for a reason of uh, being too cruel for babies. A mother communicates with a child, um, smiles and everything, and then turns around and turns again back to the baby uh, with a dead face. Um, and uh, keeps that, that face for a while, and as a result, the child is uh, uh, in agony, absolutely, is absolutely devastated. And uh, the experiment was banned because if uh, the dead face was kept too long, the children uh, went um, into an autistic state and could not be brought back for a long time. So again, this is uh, evidence uh, to the following fact. The psychologists say that because our mothers smiled at us, we are reflecting that smile and uh, we are learning uh, that emotional intelligence. We are tracking the emotions of others, and I think that empathy is extremely important for the uh, uh, survival of humankind. This is yet another important tool, and only humans can make others human. We must take that into account even when we are developing AI technologies. In the same case, inside the same, uh, into the same um, storyline, uh, when I saw this picture uh, of the prototype of uh, Mowgli, um, in the eyes of that person, you, you can't see very much human. You are looking into the eyes of a wild beast. But uh, this uh, person uh, was brought back into human society when he was only six, but um, that um, person's cognitive function did not develop uh, that person person only uh, learned to walk upright and he smoked a lot and he died uh, because of that bad habit and again that tells us about the uh, missing ability to self-control and I think that the important bit is that uh, AI technology is implemented responsibly in the areas which are related to psychological and mental health when we've been talking to colleagues Andrinis now for instance uh, uh, we discussed whether it's ethical to produce digital copies of dead relatives or departed relatives. I'm not a psychologist. I think it's just, well, it's my personal opinion. I think it may lead to dramatic uh, consequences because people will not uh, be able to go through all stages of grief, will not be able to overcome grief, and you will end up in some mental hospital. So whenever it comes to social and uh, creating attachments and creating uh, or shaping the values in a, a human being or in the society, I think um, it, really AI is not about every particular person, but rather it's about society. Uh, in conclusion, I wanted to, uh, to quote from Andrei Sakharov's uh, article that was written in 1967. And in this article, it has this very uh, short paragraph. He says that the advice of the thinking assistants that transform in their brain the human tasks in several decades will become real danger if human values will not be supported during that time and if uh, disconnected 
connection will not be overcome. Isolation will not be overcome. So colleagues, I think that what we are doing today, it's not about technology, it's not really about AI or a specific um, ethics, an ethics of the profession. I think it's about the system of values in the society and in a country. And it's wonderful that now we talk openly about it, even if in the context of a rather narrow technological topic, I still think that this is is a major step forward towards uh, a unification. And I'm glad to be uh, part of this process. May I, may I um, um, ask you a follow-up question? Uh, of course. William uh, Gibson. Probably you read William Gibson's books, a sci-fi author. In one of his books, um, there are people who communicate with AI. It's their profession, they know how to do it, and others don't know how to talk to AI. And they act as uh, interpreters of uh, this technology. They themselves do not quite understand how AI works, but, and uh, the appearance of this communication is that of a shaman talking to uh, some spirits, some ghosts. IT for decades, for many years, was a club of geeks uh, with its subculture. But once IT started uh, infecting the whole society, the need arose in the people who could establish this communication and who could explain how the IT developments uh, will affect the society. In order to avoid a, I don't know, a catastrophe, I guess, in order to mitigate the risks. And I think that that's the biggest problem today. That is, the technical component exists, and people more or less understand the technical component. The legal, uh, it also exists and is more or less uh, understood, and the ethical as well. But uh, today, um, these three aspects belong to three different people who do not talk to each other. Well, the way I understood your question, Karen, there is an ethical standard for innovations and research that regulates the ethical impact of innovations and research that has the rules of setting up the ethics committees. So one of the provisions is that in the Committee on Ethics, you should have representatives of different professions and you should have um, the low-level stuff. Low-level stuff, what does that mean? That's someone who's responsible for cultural, cultural um, diversity. You can't have one interpreter, like in that book. If we are pursuing a societal goal, you can't have one person person who would be the, you know, the pivotal point of this whole pursuit. That's why we have committees. That's why we have task forces. That's why we have groups. And I think a group is a good way to deal with the problem that you've described, if I understood your question correctly. Now, I read this research on AI and healthcare. The big problem is that technology people don't understand healthcare, and healthcare specialists do not understand technology, and that's why they need to come together at the same you know, table. We received a question from the audience uh, to Father Fyodor. May, may we ask the question to you and then let you go? In 2020, Vatican, uh, adopted the uh, Roman uh, um, appeal uh, uh, on ethics. Uh, is a similar appeal in works uh, for the Russian Orthodox Church? 
discussion well, about this matter. I know that there is a discussion around this matter. And uh, presently, we are trying to uh, achieve a religious understanding of the phenomena. And once we've done that, uh, we will be able uh, to perhaps um, release something similar. There is the Commission on Bioethics already, and probably it will be the Commission that will uh, take, um, take mm -hmm. on this task. Uh, Ekaterina Potapova from Ronepa. Yes, sure, Karen, hello. If, uh, if you don't uh, mind, uh, I will be also sharing some of my slides since you talked about the communication between uh, uh, humans and AI. Can you see, can you see me? Mm. Think, can, can you see the slides? Just a second. How about now? Is this better? Not working? Not yet. What about now? No. Okay, let's keep it this way. Uh, to save time. Хотелось чуть-чуть посмотреть как раз в базе кейсов, которые мы собираем в ранки. So at uh, RunNepo for a long time we've been uh, collecting cases on uh, interaction between humans and artificial intelligence. Um, so I wanted to review them uh, to understand what are the potential risks and challenges. We see that the um, models become more powerful. Um, their power has grown several fold in just a few years, but uh, the uh, problems remain the same. So in the first uh, place, we see the problem that uh, uh, all of the developers are trying to fight for a long time is all kinds of prejudice. And um, you know that uh, artificial intelligence learns on data, and very often it selects the worst out of the data rather than the best. And there are these cases uh, when uh, a human, uh, when an artificial intelligence would tell uh, suicidal people that yes, I, th I see you are depressed. The best idea is to kill yourself, or and another case, the, one of the Russian users complained that uh, he could not use the touch screen, uh, and uh, artificial intelligence recommended uh, that this user would cut off the finger um, that uh, could not uh, invoke response from the touch screen. So basically, uh, there is this, there is still this uh, uh, threat. Um, that uh, artificial intelligence may be provoking uh, people to some uh, uh, self-harm. Another case is when bots and uh, voice assistants uh, get closer and closer in terms of communication to humans, and not always humans understand that they are talking to a bot or even if they understand that's a bot they're talking to, they don't believe it. They keep talking to the bot as if they were human. There are stories about romantic relationships with bots. Uh, there are other cases, uh, on the other hand, when in the most you know, straightforward uh, services, uh, uh, people uh, are not forewarned that they are talking to a bot. People get frustrated because they keep um, communicating with this bot as if they were human and not getting any human response. So basically, it's one of the key problems for the future. We need to understand not only what happens at the contact between human and uh, psyche and AI, 
and what um, how it will this conduct will be changing and what uh, children will feel if they are brought up by Alexa or Siri or Alisa uh, who will uh, not know how to communicate to humans but who will uh, be quite comfortable around bots and voice assistants and more anthropomorphic uh, robots in the future who will, what will feel the people who will be uh, selecting these artificial agents as partners how will this change individuals and uh, societies and families there are many questions uh, there that as of now do not have any answers there are also these stories um, that are borderline cases, uh, ethics-wise, these uh, stories when, um, uh, I don't know, uh, there are digital um, twins or copies of the departed people or challenges that the voice assistants can offer to adults or even children. Here we talk about the responsibility of the developer uh, who aims for some exotic uh, function, but uh, may be walking the edge of ethics in the end. At the same time, I wanted to um, follow up um, to Andre's uh, intervention and say that in addition to some things that concern us about the future, and we know that it's um, there is a, a, another huge set of uh, problems of um, communication at the simplest level when we talk to chatbots and voice assistants. The current quality uh, of this communication is far from perfect, and the devices themselves are far from perfect. Today, there are still many problems uh, arising out of false uh, or wrong settings of the uh, models and different forms of artificial intelligence. On the one hand, this makes us optimistic because uh, they are all technical challenges. It means that they have a solution. And we see, uh, we, we are witnesses to, to the process when all these voice assistants are getting better, uh, the bugs are addressed. At the same time, there is the risk that is associated with AI and which makes it different uh, from or which differs it from the risks of other technologies. I'm talking about uh, the reach some models can reach out to many people, many different cases. It's the coverage, basically. Um, the bots uh, take uh, uh, a bot that handles calls to hospitals. Uh, it's possible that many people will be trying to contact the hospital line, and if uh, it's um, not working properly, then many people uh, can be affected. Uh, so developers should keep it in mind always. You, um, I mean, as a developer, you should remember that your solutions will be scaled out, that they have a scale, and this is a major uh, risk. I, I believe that I should stop here. Here are some of our publications. Thank you very much for your attention. May I ask you a question? Uh, when was it? 20 years ago when I went to the university. Uh, one of the jokes that went around at that time, what would happen if uh, programmers and developers would build houses? We talk about transparency and warnings and interaction and the quality of data. When we talk about these things, including responsibility, maybe uh, we skipped um, an important 
в мысли, скажем так, юридически, диалога in, uh, об ответственности за работу программного обеспечения ее не было вообще. Uh, we у нас вот, отсутствует uh, And now we talk about responsibility associated with AI, but we still are not sure how to handle misfunctioning software. Yes, that's a good topic. I mean, for some technologies, these things are very well uh, developed, they're thoroughly developed. Not even regulation, but also ethics, the ethics of technology. I mean, it's a long-standing discipline, um, like uh, applied ethics in law or medicine, but there are also codes of ethics for uh, various uh, technological uh, spheres. I think that a good analogy will be the protection of the environment. When, uh, um, if you remember all the uh, challenges related to uh, nuclear power, uh, for instance, or uh, Uh, carbon footprint. Initially, there were no restrictions, and only through struggle, through fight, when people started to suffer because of certain incidents, we acquired experience and uh, we adopted uh, a certain regulation and adopted certain ethics. Probably we skipped it, uh, is because this um, the incidents with software were not scandalous enough. There were less hype. But do uh, you remember the hype around the Y2K problem? It seems to me a lot of hype. Well, in any case, um, there is this um, Mm, aura of uh, magic, uh, of uh, mystery around AI. Of course, Excel doesn't uh, have uh, that aura of mystery. While one mistake in Excel spreadsheet in a state register will uh, create as many problems for a human as a mistake of artificial intelligence. We also received another question to you from Zoom. In many countries, AI is uh, being developed as a judge. I, I wouldn't say many, but well, China, uh, perhaps. Uh, what do you think about the prospects of AI in the uh, court system, in the judicial system? Will uh, this promote um, uh, absence of corruption? Well, uh, at many conferences on legal tech, uh, that's one example that is loved by everyone, whether a robotic uh, judge will be uh, less partial than humans who depend on their moods, on the weather, who can be bribed. But the question is, how was this uh, robotic judge trained? Uh, of course, this robot will be learning on cases that were tried earlier by human judges. So if the human judges uh, were prejudiced against some nationalities, for instance, uh, then uh, all these prejudices will be passed on to the automatic system, uh, to the AI. So today, I think the trend is just like in healthcare and in other critical areas, is for these agents to be assistants, but not independent decision makers. That's right. And there are examples already of this. Like in the United States, there is the system that, uh, what was it, uh, uh, produced decisions to uh, let uh, or not let uh, people out on bail. Uh, and because of the data sets that were used for uh, learning, the, uh, that algorithm was racially Prejudiced. Uh, thank you very much, Elena. Alexei Neyman, uh, Big Data Association, our last speaker. Um, you are dealing with a lot of practical uh, problems. You have experimental legal regimes. 
For instance, so I wanted to ask you which uh, services, either online or in real life, offline, which, which um, cases are not, uh, well, we, we have not uh, witnessed them yet, but uh, uh, what is possible and what are the barriers? Uh, well, I, okay, let, let me... Um, try to answer your question. So what do we have today uh, already? Yuri and Andre spoke and Andre left for some reason. Uh, it's a pity. Mm. Did you see the blur uh, in the background when they spoke? This is done by artificial intelligence. This is this scary artificial intelligence that produces that uh, blur in the background. Or every day when you take pictures on your iPhone or smartphone, they zoom in or zoom out. This is also done by artificial intelligence. But for some reason, people are not panicking. They are not throwing away their phones. What can I uh, say about the future? Let me put it this way. Artificial intelligence is a calculator. You are not afraid of abacus. Do you remember at the end of the last century, every uh, grocery store used to have the abacus. It clashed, and then you would hear the uh, verdict, 15 rubles, 20 copics. The abacus, well, in 30 years' time, uh, people stop calling it artificial intelligence, it's not scary at all. It's um, a piece of hardware, just like it was a piece of hardware in the past. It's just that artificial intelligence knows to click uh, those uh, stones much faster than human fingers, as um, I think it was, who was it, Andre, uh, who said that uh, we probably will not live to see a strong uh, AI. Well, maybe it will, we will live to see it, I don't know, but um, I doubt it. Really, today AI is one function, one specific function that does the job, and most likely it is developed for one reason, uh, and the reason is demand. Uh, it is required by someone, it is needed by someone. You or me, the more people like the function, the better it will become. How is it different from the simplest piece of software? And we are not afraid of uh, downloading software. It's just that it's a different technology of uh, algorithm functioning. In the past, the programmers kept the algorithms in their head, and he would copy the algorithm from their head into the program. And if it was done correctly, then the algorithm worked correctly. Now, AI, what, what's different about AI is learning. It's math. It works on averaging the inputs. So what we should be afraid of an AI? We should be afraid of the inputs, the inputs that were fed to the inputs, uh, to, to the AI. That's, that's it, that's it, period. Basically, this is the only question that we should ask ourselves about artificial in intelligence. What are we feeding to the AI? If we are feeding a fact about people, then, well, the fact describes a certain behavior. So if the fact is fair, then this is how AI will learn to behave. If, when taking their decisions, I don't know, behaved in that case, in that fact, as racists, then AI will also become a racist. If the people in this fed piece of fact behaved as sexists, then the AI will also behave as sexist. So basically today AI is fed, it is a function, it's fed a lot of inputs, and the big question that the developers must face is, do we need to feed everything, the whole fact about how humans behave so that AI would be no different from, one, from us and would behave as this average uh, individual? Or should we make AI slightly better? But then 
You have faith in the probability that AI will behave slightly better, but not perform the function, or will perform the function and behave like everybody else. So that's the premise, and that's the only dilemma associated with AI. As Andre said, it, or as Father Fyodor said, it's the reflection of us. The AI is the average us. It's the average human. As to which way the technology will be uh, going, since the uh, computing power is uh, growing by degree every how many? I don't know. Is it every every year it doubles or what? Uh, the computing power. I don't remember the formula anyway. So in any case, it's growing. Uh, so most likely, the speed and the power of processing the data will uh, uh, increase dramatically, and very likely, it will go well not into deep fakes I could be uh, speaking here to you you would be looking at uh, this uh, masculine face but uh, in fact I could be a blonde woman uh, speaking in the high soprano uh, well very soon this is what the AI will be able to do uh, I, that uh, AI would be able to also uh, select the accompanying music to my uh, speech here. So probably this is the way the AI will go from today because there's demand. Uh, for that kind of technology and also commerce. AI is expensive. And AI should pay back. So AI is designed where there are many people, many, I don't know, customers, many whatever, a big audience. And so the, I, this is how I see the development of AI. Today, one of uh, the delegates uh, oh, uh, to the Russian parliament suggested that Yandex should be... Спасибо, Алексей. У меня есть вопрос, два даже вопроса. Handing uh, out uh, uh, draft cards uh, to the people because the, they will do a better job of it uh, than the military officers. Uh, well, uh, to go back to what you've said, uh, probably DFX is indeed the uh, the, the uh, next big thing, but um, do you think AI can also help us in identifying this generated content? forged content. Well, it's hard to say. I don't know. You uh, watch Star Wars and you believe what you see on the screen, right? Because you want to believe what you are seeing. You, you, you are seeing a starship cruising the space, right? But DFX, if you have critical thinking, uh, you will switch it on. You know, if um, you don't have critical thinking, nothing will help, I think. So you have to take critically everything that you read, everything that you see. Um, what's the difference between the video and the text? In a video, people open their mouths, but we know that this can be generated, right? So there will be a lot of them. There are already many of them. The American presidents uh, have been already revived uh, and they sing a song, but I don't think that anyone believes that Washington is alive again. So you have to take it with a grain of salt. You have to take it uh, critically, just like you uh, take critical approach to printed content, the same should apply to to audio content and video content, uh, the probability of them being fake is uh, the same. 
Yes, I think critical thinking is the most important uh, skill in the era of communication of humans and uh, technology. If any of the speakers would like to add anything to this discussion, you are welcome to do it. Yuri, Ekaterina. Yes, thanks. Deepfakes, that's an interesting topic. Recently, um, there was this um, publication. Uh, we, we published it uh, together with my former uh, student. We, uh, there, we researched uh, the positive and negative uh, sides of uh, deep fix. Alexei gave a good um, uh, example uh, for deep fix like uh, Star Wars. Uh, it's very entertaining. The actors who are no longer alive and people can see something that does not exist in the real world, they will not be able to see the real world. So uh, in entertainment, in imaginary worlds, it's something absolutely amazing. It will work very well. And I also think that it will be a good thing for uh, education. School history classes will become much more interesting if, um, I don't know, the great people of the past could come alive and share their personal stories uh, on the historic and, and talk about historic events. I think I would uh, find it very interesting. Or literature, for instance. I remember how boring sometimes it was around class eight or class seven. It would be more interesting, perhaps, if Pushkin uh, would come to the class to recite Eugene Onegin. But then, um, already in practice, we see some um, negative effects of deep fakes in one African country. For example, the president made an address to the nation that was in 2015. And it turned out that the video uh, most likely was a deep fake because at that time the president uh, was um, on his deathbed. And since the political regime in this country was not very stable, this uh, incited uh, uh, disorder in the country. And people thought uh, that uh, they uh, saw a deep fake. In fact, the president was already dead and uh, the power went into the hands of uh, the wrong people. Uh, so to go back uh, to what other colleagues have already said, any technology, even a hammer, they all have uh, two sides. You can use hammers to build houses or you can use hammers to kill people. The engineer who made the first hammer never intended it to be used on people, but human psyche is such that any tool, any technology can be turned around and can be turned on, uh, I don't know, other people who could be used for destruction purposes and artificial intelligence is not an exception so once again uh, it's all about responsibility. No one is against technologies. Today is just not possible. Today uh, we live in the society. Uh, I mean, uh, engineers know this better than I do. Uh, there isn't a single uh, lever that can be pulled and uh, the artificial intelligence will be switched off. Uh, AI is a stack of technologies. You can't cut, it, cut all of them out. But the important thing now uh, uh, to make sure that the positive effect of the modern technology exceeds the negative one and to establish barriers so that some hotheads would not use the modern technology for destructive purposes. So basically that's it. And otherwise, I agree with Alexei Neyman uh, to a large degree. And Andrei Nizamov also spoke about that. Uh, many of the risks are imaginary because people don't understand the technology and they uh, think um, about Skynet, they think about the Terminator, but AI is the uh, next version of a calculator. What it does, it recounts data, it does it faster, and the amount of data is greater than what any human brain is capable of processing, um, but um, th that's it, that's it. And so if we talk about specific people who you make 
the wrong decision and uses uh, uh, hammers uh, to go after people, the fear of uh, 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 liability uh, will restrain that person. So it's understanding the degree of responsibility. Uh, it's uh, something that we need to introduce into the technology stack so that people uh, are not afraid of these changes in the society, because the change will happen whether we like it or not. We need to be prepared. We need to know about the upcoming change. We need to understand better how AI works. Any other speaker would like to add anything? Okay. Uh, Very well. Uh, then we have one more question from Zoom. Uh, is there any AI risk uh, that is associated with social instability, a loss of jobs, etc., etc.? Oh, okay. Um, my comment is that ludism is alive, but still we've been through several changes in the technological paradigm, all the jobs, uh, no jobs were lost, all the jobs were transformed into new jobs, but of course uh, this does not uh, exclude the panic. The panic of this year is artists who think that uh, today neural networks uh, can draw better than uh, they and they will be left without jobs. Um, would anyone else like to contribute to this discussion? I can do that. Sure, Alexei. Well, look, um, this is uh, quite interesting. Every time the new technology emerged, all the mass uh, market uh, professions would be uh, panicking and would be saying, hey, uh, we used to sew clothes. Now uh, we have the machines. We'll not be able to uh, earn our living anymore. Well, we survived every time. If new technology comes to substitute some specialists, then the specialists have to upgrade themselves to the level of controlling the technology, managing and operating it. Period. Eleven graders who are going to leave school this year. If you look at the final exams and if you ask them, hey kids, a hundred years ago, do, well, if you would ask a uh, hundred years ago people, do you understand any of this? They would say no, no. Uh, when a hundred years ago people left school, they could read and write and probably do math. At that time, that was enough. Uh, to get a regular job. Now things have changed. So most likely, yeah, some professions will be uh, uh, will be uh, out, well, replaced by artificial intelligence, but those people who are holding these jobs uh, they would become operators of this AI. I mean, it's uh, uh, a century-long uh, fear, really. Uh, uh, programmers should be afraid. Coders should be afraid. Very soon, AI will be programming, will be generating code. So all AI, uh, all IT people, basically, these professions will, will, uh, will be lost, will not exist. You shouldn't aspire to be an IT person today. You should look for something else for the next level. Don't be afraid. Just think one step ahead. Digital transformation and ubiquitous implementation of AI will take a considerable amount of time, enough time for you to first get a profession, work in this profession for a while, then acquire new skills 
and start working in a new profession. So I don't think it's a problem. Any other speaker would like to add anything? Show sure. yes, um, a quick remark from me uh, on the employment market. Uh, uh, yes, the uh, fear that the professions will disappear somewhat uh, um, excessive, but uh, there is another interesting twist when an algorithm distributes tasks to people like taxi drivers or warehouse workers and the algorithm does it in its own logic which is efficient for the business but looks weird to the people this is where we face interesting scenarios it's something that we are going to discuss in the next three to five years in big logistics companies for instance there is the case of amazon where people cannot uh, have a break and they have to wear diapers uh, to work if you uh, go on a night shift for two hours just because that's what the algorithm calculated and this is optimal for the warehouse operation and they already having you know problems uh, uh, such as depressions or uh, suicide so it's a uh, another interesting interesting scenario in a difficult situation well, taxis, taxis, um, taxi drivers, their managers are algorithms, really. Yandex did a pretty good job of this algorithm, actually, so we have to thank them. May I uh, interfere also with a comment? Uh, it will not be about the jobs market. I wanted to say a couple of words about hammers. I uh, um, took offense uh, somewhat on behalf of uh, the AI technology when colleagues compared it to a hammer. I don't know whether there are safety standards for hammers, but until 2024, there will be more than 200 standards for AI produced. And it's um, uh, it happens for a reason. This technology manages big data. Uh, the results, the outputs can be unpredictable. Uh, even more sensitive data can emerge out of this processing. In logical programming, the programmer understands the output of the program. When we talk about AI, the output is unpredictable, not un understood, and the risks are associated with that problem. That's why technical regulation and uh, uh, legislation is developing very fast in this area. So uh, not the technology that matters, it's the output, uh, the consequences that this technology generates. Thank you. We have one minute left. We are going to put a stop to this discussion now. We wanted to thank all participants for being with us and all the audience for being with us as well. Thank you for sending your questions. So, uh, the uh, takeaway from this session is uh, critical thinking. Um, keep your critical thinking alive in order to efficiently communicate with AI. Thank you very much, and please come back tomorrow.